Honourable Senators, the President. Almighty God, we humbly beseech thee to vouchsafe thy special blessing upon this parliament, and that thou wouldst be pleased to direct and prosper the work of thy servants to the advancement of thy glory and to the true welfare of the people of Australia. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I acknowledge the Ngunnawal and Gambri peoples, who are the traditional custodians of the Canberra area, and pay respect to the elders past and present of all Australia's Indigenous peoples. Are there any documents to be tabled by the clerk? clerk. Mr President, I table documents pursuant to statute as listed on today's order of business. Are there any proposals for committees to meet during the sittings of the Senate? Clark. Yes, Mr President. Committees have lodged proposals as shown at item three of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I call the oh sorry, is it someone seeking the call? No? I call the clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number 1, Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill, further consideration in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bills of 2020 and a related bill. The question is that the bills stand as agreed, as meant to be agreed to. Sorry, Senator Rice, you're seeking the call. I am. Thank you, um, the Chair. Look, I seek, I seek leave to move amendments four and five on sheet one zero seven eight together. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Senator Rice. Thanks, Chair. And look, I will just move these. I don't need to speak to them. They cover the same issues that we have covered at length yesterday about putting some more checks and balances in this bill, getting clarity, not having the same complete um, control and power that the minister would have. So, sort of setting in place some guidelines for how decisions are going to be made and setting in place a definition of foreign policy. But as I said, in the interests of time, I won't speak any more about them because I think we have canvassed the issues that, um, that they cover in a lot of detail yesterday. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rice. Senator Wong. Uh, just to enable the minister to give herself time to uh, take a seat in the chamber, can I just indicate that the opposition will be supporting Amendment 4 but voting against Amendment 5, and I'd ask that you put them separately on that basis. Thank you, Senator Wong. So I'll put um, the f number four first. So the question is that Amendment 4 on sheet 1078 be agreed to, uh, that the amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? No. Uh, believe the noes have it. Certainly, we can agree to that. Yes, thank you. So I'm now going to put the second part of that. So the question is that Amendment 5 on sheet 1078 that that amendment be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. Uh, I believe the noes have it. Senator Rice. The votes of the Greens in favour of that amendment could be recorded. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, we can do that. Thank you very much. And Senator Rice, you're seeking the call again? Yes, I am. Look, Thank I you. want to move um, Amendment 6 on sheet um, 1078. And this is to basically remove a clause from the bill. Um, on because at the moment the bill says that um, it, that the minister is not required to observe any requirements of procedural fairness in exercising a power or function or performing a function under this act and we think this is pretty unreasonable we think that it's basic legis legislation standards and in fact common law standards are that procedural fairness should be allowed when this bill went to the scrutiny of bills committee um, 
the scrutiny bill said the committee considers that the right to procedural fairness is a fundamental common law right, and it, it, it expects that any limitation on this right be comprehensively justified. Um, scrutiny of bills did not consider that the, def that the explanation in the explanatory memorandum was at all satisfactory as to why procedural fairness should be excluded. Um, wrote to the minister, um, and certainly on the further information that we've got back from the minister, there was. Okay. No, uh, no, the minister's not seeking. That's the call. right, not Please seeking the call. Continue. That's right. Um, Certainly, having, having seen that letter, um, there is not any further justification from my eyes as to why procedural fairness should be excluded. I mean, the right to procedural fairness basically is based on two things. It requires that decision makers aren't biased and do not appear to be biased, and that a person who may be adversely affected by a decision is given an ad adequate opportunity to put their case before the decision is made. I think these are two very, very basic requirements, and there is no reason in this legislation, no reason why procedural fairness should be excluded in this legislation. Thank you, Senator Rice. So the question is that Amendment 6 on sheet 1078, that the clause 58 standards printed. Oh, sorry, Minister. Thank you, um, Chair. In relation to, uh, to Senator Rice's amendment, and uh, just uh, quickly, uh, and. I understand uh, in the normal course of events uh, issues such as this in relation to procedural fairness are, uh, are raised, but this is a different form of legislation. The inclusion of procedural fairness would re require the disclosure to a, to a state or territory ent entity where there was a likelihood of an adverse decision of the specific foreign policy considerations for why the adverse decision was likely. Um, it is the view that it is not appropriate for sensitive decisions on foreign policy or foreign relations to be shared. It's a well-established principle that information relating to Australia's international foreign relations is not required to be released. And there are numerous examples of this. The Freedom of Information Act 1982, which exempts documents affecting national security, defence or international relations. The Archives Act of 1983 provides access may be refused if releasing the information would damage Australia's security, defence or international relations. Under the Criminal Code, there are offences for Commonwealth officers who cause harm to Australia's interests by communicating information that causes harm to Australia's interests, including information that harms or prejudices Australia's inter international relations. Public interest immunity considerations also include damage to Australia's international relations, particularly in instances where the information relates to exchanges between government officials. It does not, in our view, make sense, and it is damaging to Australia to reverse a long-standing principle in the context of this bill. If the sensitive foreign policy information were excluded from such disclosures, the opportunity for procedural fairness would not actually be meaningful. Uh, the exclusion of procedural fairness does not prevent state or territory entities from consulting DFAT in relation to arrangements or relevant, foreign policy consideration, or relevant policy considerations prior to a formal notification. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong? For the reasons previously outlined, Labor will be support. Uh, no, we're not. I thought, oh, this is the other way around. Support the amendment. It's a backwards <laughs> one. Senator Rice. Thank you. Um, thank you, Minister, for that response. I mean, do you have any legal advice that um, suggests that in this bill that requirements of procedural fairness would require disclosing sensitive information? Minister. Senator Rice, we don't comment on legal advice uh, in that nature, but uh, in this, in a discussion such as this, but. Uh, I've been clear, I think, throughout the debate in relation to the sensitivity of the sorts of matters that this bill goes to, uh, and uh, the examples that I have just provided, uh, I think, from the FOI Act, from uh, the um, Archives Act, from the Criminal Code, indeed, uh, go to the seriousness of these issues. Um, we are not talking about basic administrative decisions, Senator. We are talking about decisions in relation to foreign policy and foreign relations. Senator Rice. Thank you. But, Minister, do you have any legal advice? Because certainly my understanding in, in the sorts of legislation that you are talking about, and indeed in this legislation, you can have procedural fairness that does not require the disclosure of sensitive information. And certainly there was a um, discussion by this by the Australian Law Reform Commission that basically outlined that procedural fairness was still in place even where um, sensitive information did, was not disclosed. Minister. Chair, Senator, we have comprehensive legal advice on all aspects of the piece of legislation. 
So the question is that the motion is moved by Senator Rice, Amendment 6 on sheet 1078, that that clause 58 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? Aye. I believe the ayes have it. Aye. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. So the question is that Amendment 6 on sheet 1078. Uh, the question is that clause 58 stand as printed. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Davey as teller for the ayes and Senator Ciccone as teller for the noes.
order, there being 31 ayes and 29 noes, the matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Depu Deputy President. Um, I rise to seek leave to move amendments 1 to 4 on sheet 1120 and amendment 5 on sheet 1120 together. I know, um, Madam Deputy President, that they will be voted on separately, but I'd like to move them together if I uh, get the leave. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Um, thank you, Madam Deputy President. Um, this government has presided over the complete devastation of universities this year. Um, the, the complete devastation, absolutely. Uh, One billion dollars per year of fun core funding cuts, doubling of fees for many degrees, leaving international students completely abandoned during this time of crisis, that they have to line up outside food banks to put food in their stomach, uh, and not lifting a finger to stop thousands of uni jobs being cut, actually allowing that to happen right under their watch. So, what, you know, one day they want university autonomy and want to, want to wash their hands off any responsibility that they have for universities, and the next day they come in here wanting to crack, crack the whip on universities. So we side with the university sector who says that this bill and the inclusion of universities in this bill is going to be damaging to them. Because this bill has extraordinary scope. And it's seemingly, um, you know, it's kind of dressed up, but it is really up to the whim of the government of what they think the national interest is on a particular day, is how they're going to operate. And I have to say nothing that the minister said in response to the questions from Senator Wong or Senator Rice has convinced me that it should be otherwise. Um, the government, if this bill passes, basically can tear up any agreement between Australian universities and overseas organizations and governments, and those agreements could underpin vital research, something that the government doesn't like. Um, it doesn't have to be international interference, for instance, or you know, cultural issues or joint degrees, any of that. And, you know, this attitude of trust us, we don't know yet what we're going to do with universities, but trust us, well, I'm sorry, we don't really trust you. Um, and the Labour Party as well, I, I know that you have stood here over the past four days saying universities haven't been consulted, um, you know, Labour colleagues have kind of waxed lyrical about the importance of consulting and engaging with universities properly, so, you know, I would plead to you then to let's support this amendment, exclude the universities, uh, and once the government has consulted the universities, even if you want them included, then maybe think about that later. At this point, we just don't know what the government is going to do. Um, so I do commend this amendment to the Senate. Thank you, Senator Faruqi. Uh, Minister. Our oh, minister's giving the call to you. Thank you, Senator Hanson. Thank you very much. I have to respond to that. You know, sometimes I, I hear the Greens talk in this chamber and I sometimes wonder, are they really here to represent the Australian people or they're all the time talking about overseas countries or foreign students as they are in this case? I wonder if they have really taken the time to actually speak to the government with regards to this bill to understand why the universities have been included in this bill. Really, have you really followed up to actually get some understanding and what this, why it's in the bill? This is about national interest, our safety. And what we've found through the universities is that even students there are collaborating, working with the Chinese government in research programs. They're getting paid on top of their jobs with the university $150,000, up to $150,000. We don't know what they're doing. We have had, you know, we've built up our national security in this country on cyber attacks and everything like that. It is quite understandable to say that if any agreements are taken up by the university with other foreign countries, that we must know what those agreements are. Pure and simple. To actually drag in foreign students into this as about taking food out of their stomachs is a load of rubbish, as far as I'm concerned. Stick with what this is about the bill. And if you really care about this country, about national interests, then you stand up and you support this bill. So if universities are there, and I think it's quite sensible and feasible, we've spoken about private universities 
to be included in this, which I suggested to the government, that they send out a letter to them and invite them to be part of this, because a lot of people in the universities don't understand what the government knows or ASIO or the federal police understand what is going on, and it should be working with the Foreign Affairs Department. So I have no problem with it. Like I said, I wish that some members in the place, even on the Labor side, instead of whinging and complaining about legislation, how many of you have really taken time to sit down and talk to the government about their legislation and the impact it has here? Instead of all this whinging and complaining that goes on all the time, half the time you don't really know the full guts of the bill. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Uh, the government does not support uh, the Greens amendment uh, to remove universities from the bill. Of course, we acknowledge that universities are a major contributor to the Australian economy. They are a major exporter. They have world-class standing and, uh, in, and an increasing global posture, which is absolutely welcomed by the government. Uh, but uh, it is a complex and contested world, uh, Chair. And one of the things that uh, this bill seeks to do is to ensure that we are working together to ensure consistency in relation to foreign policy and foreign relations. Because Australian public universities are publicly funded institutions established by law with a fundamental role in international research and partnerships, because the status of Australian public universities and their international posture means their foreign arrangements do have the potential to impact Australia's foreign relations and foreign policy. It's also the case, though, uh, and the government has acknowledged this, that university arrangements present a lower degree of risk than state and territory arrangements with foreign national governments. And so, within the bill, they are designated as non-core arrangements. They're subject to fewer requirements and a lesser degree of scrutiny. As a consequence of that, we will work very closely through the task force and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade with universities to support their efficient and effective engagement uh, with the scheme. As I said out yesterday in my uh, uh, discussions uh, in the committee uh, stage then with uh, Senator Rice and Senator Wong in particular, uh, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade has consulted uh, over many um, meetings with uh, universities and representative university bodies. Uh, and uh, we will continue to work closely with them in the implementation of the bill, should it be passed. Thank you, Minister. Senator Wong. Uh, thank you, Deputy President. Um, uh, uh, well, we have worked through this, uh, both in the committee uh, and you would have seen from the amendments. Uh, whilst I understand uh, uh, the points and the political point that Senator Faruqi wishes to make, we do start from the base, the, the principle or from the proposition that universities' international engagement does have implica potential implications for Australia's foreign policy uh, and therefore should be subject to regulation. Uh, we have substantial concerns, which I have at length outlined, I think, yesterday, uh, about the government's uh, refusal uh, to engage, the minister's continued refusal to engage, and the fact that the UFIT task force uh, which uh, was doing work on this was bypassed. We also have concerns uh, about the regulatory gap, which has never been explained, whereby private universities such as Bond University will have a different, uh, will, will, will be excluded from the operation of the bill. However, those concerns do not lead us to the proposition uh, that the, the principle that universities should be subject to regulation in respect to foreign arrangements or be abrogated. So, for that reason, uh, we we will not be supporting the Greens amendment, as I've expressed to you uh, or to uh, publicly. Um, <coughs> I uh, also do note uh, that the government has accepted the need for a review of the operation of the bill, a narrowing of the definition of arrangements, and has provided a definition of institutional autonomy all of which were matters raised and dealt with through the Senate committee, which we participated in. So the question is that the amendments will start with the one on sheet uh, 1120, moved by Senator Faruqi, one to four, that those amendments be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Against? No. I believe the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that the motion, as moved by Senator Faruqi, on sheet 1120, uh, amendments 1 to 4. The question is that the amendments be agreed to. The ayes shall move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. I appoint Senator Seawitt as teller for the ayes and Senator Chikobi as teller for the noes. Order. There being nine ayes and 44 noes, the matter is resolved in the negative. Senator Faruqi moved uh, to her two amendments together, so I'm going to put the second part of that, which is uh, Amendment 5 on sheet 1120. And the question is that division, that division 6 of part 5 stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Against? I believe the ayes have it. The ayes have it. I think, Senator Faruqi, you're seeking the call. <laughs> Senator uh, Faruqi. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Um, I'd like to move Green's Amendment 1 on sheet 118. And I was hoping that I actually wouldn't have had to move this amendment because really universities should be excluded, but now that's not the case. Um, and uh, this amendment really is about at least making sure that the larger projects um, or um, you know, agreements are the ones that allow this broad scope that the government has to be um, looked at by the government. So this amendment actually has a threshold amount of $250,000 for the government to be able to, to do uh, what they want to do. Um, and like I said, sadly, in the absence of uh, universities still being excluded in this legislation, at least this will minimize some of the damage and the harm um, done to universities and the people who work there. So I commend the amendment to the, uh, to the Senate. Minister. Thank you, Chair. The government uh, opposes this amendment. Um, the, uh, the 
principles of this bill uh, and the, uh, the uh, motivation behind it are not related to the monetary value of uh, arrangements uh, such as this, and nor is the potential impact of the arrangements. Uh, it is our view that uh, including a monetary value to limit application of the scheme uh, could potentially allow circumvention of the scheme by breaking projects down into smaller amounts. Uh, for uh, precisely that reason, to, uh, to avoid its application uh, by um, uh, masking arrangements with monetary value in subsidiary arrangements, which are not within the scheme, uh, unless head arrangements are caught. I also think, from an administrative perspective, it may on occasion be difficult to ascertain the value of certain arrangements and create uncertainty in the bill's application. I don't think this amendment would uh, uh, go any way to assisting the implementation of the bill uh, at all. So the question is that um, the amendment be agreed to on sheet 1118, moved by Senator Faruqi. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the noes have it. No. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Dr Burles. The question is that amendment number on sheet 1118 moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left. And I appoint Senators, Senator Seawitt for the ayes and Senator Chisholm. Sorry, I wasn't sure who was it. Senator Chisholm for the noes. There being nine ayes and 42 noes, the matter is therefore resolved in the negative. I'll give everyone a moment to return to their seats. Now, Senator Wong. Thank you, um, Acting Chair. I move uh, opposition amendment one on sheet 115 revised, which relates to the port of Darwin lease. And this is the opportunity for those who have been complaining about the Port of Darwin to actually get some accountability uh, from this government about the 99-year lease, which they have steadfastly refused to be clear about. I would make this point. Even yesterday, uh, the minister was unable to give a, the chamber a clear answer about whether or not the Port of Darwin could be subject to this bill. The, this bill is, in effect, retrospective, so the minister can veto um, arrangements which have already been put in place prior to the legislation uh, being passed. Uh, when asked about the Port of Darwin, the minister first said that because it was uh, leased with a private entity, uh, it would be excluded, but then could not rule out the potential uh, for it to be included within the remit of the legislation on the basis that there was a subsidiary arrangement and therefore would be subject to the bill. Uh, so, What this amendment does is seek to require 
it would be to require the minister to provide a report. So we're not seeking to actually you know, take over the minister's role. We're seeking to ensure that there is the transparency around the Port of Darwin lease, uh, that a report be tabled in this chamber that goes to both uh, the uh, effect of the legislation on the bill, but, uh, on, the le on the lease, but as importantly, the effect of the lease on Australia's foreign policy objectives, which has been the subject of a number of contributions from senators around the chamber. So I commend the amendment. Senator Fiat Brandy Wells. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy uh, President. Over the years, I have been consistent in my strident criticisms of the decision to lease the Port of Darwin to Landbridge. How can one of our most strategic assets in Northern Australia be leased to a company with ties to the Communist Party uh, in um, Beijing? There have been long concerns about the decision uh, attributed to the surveillance and espionage capabilities presented by the port's close proximity to Australian and US defence facilities, as well as concerns about the strategic purpose of China's investment in the region as part of its maritime Silk Road. I know many Australians who have contacted me do not agree uh, respectfully with the Defence Minister's comments on 9 September that there are no security concerns regarding the Port of Darwin. How can this not be a matter of concern? Indeed, I have to say after the events of this week, I envisage that there will be renewed focus on the Port of Darwin uh, and it will become very much symbolic of our political fortitude to stand up to the bullying tactics of the CCP. Um, I think it's important uh, to highlight some of the aspects uh, that the decision um, of, on the Port of Darwin, and they remain perplexing to this day. And I know that after its win in August 2012, the CLP started exploring the privatisation of assets, including the port. There was a process that there were 33 investors, including Australian and European companies, that expressed an interest, including, land, uh, including Landbridge. Um, media reports indicated at the time that Landbridge was a subsidiary of the Shandong Landbridge Group, a private company, uh, and that its 2013 billionaire owner, uh, Yi Chung, was named by the Chinese government as one of the top 10 individuals caring about the development of national defence. Shandong was found to have extensive links to the CCP uh, and the PLA. Indeed, in an interview in Beijing in 2016, Mr Yi stated that the Darwin port investment fits his company strategy to expand its shipping and energy interests and serve China's foreign policy goal of one belt, one road. Now, in February 2015, 2015, the Northern Territory Assembly appointed the Port of Darwin Select Committee. That, that committee went through a process uh, uh, and, it, and the evidence from that committee also indicated that the federal government had advised the Northern Territory government that the port was better privatised uh, than continuing in government hands. Now, one of the key recommendations uh, in its April 2015 report was that an Australian entity control the lease and that there be FERB and defence consultations regarding the strategic and security risks of a potential international investor. Now, uh, on 14 Feb Feb uh, September, uh, FERB contacted Landbridge, indicating that the lease was outside the purview of FERB review because of a technicality uh, that uh, assets owned by state, territory and local governments were exempt from FERB scrutiny. To this day, that remains the case, although there are, uh, the exception has been modified to some extent, uh, but it still remains an issue, and I think that that's something that we should be looking at. But in any case, uh, on the 13th of October, Chief Minister Giles announced the 99-year lease valued at $506 million. Now, the lease process does raise some legitimate uh, questions as to why, given the lead time to this decision. Uh, more effort wasn't made by those uh, in key uh, federal positions uh, and those advising them to remove uh, the, federal, uh, the foreign investment exemption, given the national security implications of allowing such a critical asset to be handed over to an entity with such known uh, ties to the CCP and the PLA. Now, we do know that at the time the Abbott government was very keen to ensure that a free trade agreement was entered into uh, with uh, China, and indeed uh, 
the Chinese president uh, on the 17th of November addressed a joint sitting, and the day after the FTA was announced by uh, Trade Minister Rob, uh, $18 billion. And indeed, um, subsequent to that, uh, Rob did leave and became uh, a um, uh, he took on a job with Landbridge, $880,000. I will leave it at there, but those questions still remain open. Now, in its uh, report, after the uh, decision, the Senate Economics References Committee uh, examined a number of issues pertinent to the decision and, in particular, made recommendations regarding that exemption. Uh, Peter Jennings and others, uh, Neil James, also gave evidence they were very, very critical of the uh, decision and, indeed, uh, as Peter Jennings said, we would now have to be uh, have our national um, security interests balanced against the reality of operating out of a harbour run by a company whose website pro proclaims it is contributing its best to realise the great rejuvenation of the Chinese dream. Now, um, Neil James. There were at the time uh, different offers, and indeed um, an ABC report of 12 March 2019 goes back and looks at some of these offers. And the understanding was, uh, and um, uh, cited, and that report, that article reflects that whilst Landbridge was the highest, uh, was the uh, the best offer. Nevertheless. Um, uh, there were other, the second and third offers were very close there too. And so, as Neil James, if Landbridge's uh, said, if, ne if Landbridge's offer was the best offer, but it introduced a major element of strategic risk for the whole country, they should have had the common sense to realise that they take the second best offer or the third best offer and not have any strategic risk. Now, um, as I said, I have been consistent. Uh, on this issue, but also on my criticisms of predatory actions by totalitarian regimes and their state-owned uh, entities on, on various issues, in particular about the acquisition of strategic assets. I have advocated for a major overhaul of critical infrastructure uh, uh, legislation, including retaking the port of Darwin. And there is absolutely no doubt, uh, as the minister said, that were the lease of the port to be considered today, it would be subject to FERB rules. But I also believe um, that because the exemption has now been modified, uh, most likely it would be rejected by the Treasurer. However, um, I am disappointed that the foreign investment changes proposed by the Treasurer, which we will probably be debating uh, shortly in this place, will not allow a retrospective consideration of the port decision. So that possibility under FERB rules is not going to be possible. Now, regardless of why the lease was signed, uh, there are cogent national security imperatives as to why consideration should be given to breaking of the lease. Now, it's obvious from the Northern Territory submission to these bills um, that there is some contemplation uh, of a reacquisition. Um, however, I did put specific questions to Northern Territory Chief Minister Gunner, uh, which weren't uh, responded to, and they, ve they very much went to this issue. And it would have been useful to have uh, Mr Gunner give evidence or at least provide responses to those questions so that we could explore the very issues. Uh, and, and, and the only way that we're going to explore these issues is with information from the Northern Territory government. So I say to those opposite, a better course of action here would be to um, seek the cooperation of the Northern Territory government to provide. They have been reluctant in relation to releasing these documents. And I would urge those opposite that a better course of action, uh, rather than getting um, another report here, uh, as is requested, is to urge the Northern Territory government to release those documents so that we can make a comprehensive assessment. So therefore, I mean, the minister has answered in the committee stage to the questions that are the very questions that are raised in this amendment. This amendment also raises technical issues that it's not just uh, actions in the purview of the minister, the foreign minister, but it's actually action in the purview of other ministers, including the treasurer, that will be required to take action. And so there is, I believe, a technical problem uh, with this amendment. Now I won't, I won't repeat um, my 
concerns about this bill, which I outlined in the second reading speech. Suffice to say that I believe that this amendment will not lead to any report uh, I believe that would be useful. I think that it is a futile exercise because we already know the outcome, and the outcome is that there will not be a retaking of the Port of Darwin under this legislation. Now, um, as I have said, um, there are other opportunities, and I believe that uh, I have been advised that there are circumstances which may provide cause for the lease to be broken, uh, including a failure by the port operator to meet legislative requirements if the company were to become insolvent, failure to meet defence access requirements, and in the event that defence powers Mr. are exercised. Well, Minister. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair. The uh, government does not support uh, this amendment, and uh, we discussed it in uh, debate in the committee stage uh, for some uh, time yesterday. The government absolutely recognises that foreign investment must be in our national interest. Foreign investment is a vital source of funds to maintain and enhance Australia's infrastructure networks, our assets. The investment in critical infrastructure, however, must not be contrary to the national interest. I have can confirm to the Chamber again that the Port of Darwin arrangement was not covered by the foreign investment regime in 2015, but given the changes that have been made since 2015 by this government, similar leasing and acquisition proposals would now be, would now be covered and would require a formal FERB process going forward. The Prime Minister repeated in June of this year, during the announcement of the upcoming foreign investment reforms, the Darwin port was not sold with the approval or the authority of the Commonwealth. It was not. At that time, sales of assets by territory governments, state governments, did not require and did not call in the authority of the Foreign Investment Review Board or the Treasurer. As a result of that, I engaged with all the states and territories and had the rules changed, and that came into effect in March of 2016. Uh, as the Prime Minister has said, the um, lease decision was solely on the basis of the decision of the Northern Territory Government, and of course that decision could only be explained by the Northern Territory Government of the time. The, the issues in the system that that sale identified were addressed by our government, indeed by the Prime Minister when he was Treasurer. Uh, in March 2016, the then Treasurer added those additional safeguards to Australia's foreign investment framework. Working with the states and territories, the government amended the foreign, investment the foreign acquisitions and takeovers regulation so that the FERB uh, would assess the sale of critical state-owned infrastructure assets to private foreign investors. In addition, uh, Chair, in 2017, the government established the Critical Infrastructure Centre. The centre provides coordinated and comprehensive assessments of national security risks to critical infrastructure in the ports, water, electricity, gas and telecommunications sectors. The centre is also responsible for the administration of the Security of Critical Infrastructure Act 2018. That act also established a critical infrastructure asset register and ministerial last resort directions power to manage the risks to water, electricity, gas and port assets. These legislative measures must ensure that the government knows who owns and operates our most critical assets and is able to mitigate any identified national security risks. Of course, departments coordinate on this basis. They bring matters of concern to the attention of the Treasurer, uh, who then consults across government, including with my department and, where necessary, or with the Foreign Minister, with, uh, as necessary and appropriate, on the ramifications on the national security risks uh, coordinated, uh, identified. I'm sorry. The previous reforms that uh, have been made by the coalition government will both complement and will be added to by the comprehensive reforms to the Foreign Investment Review Framework introduced to Parliament by the government in October of this year. These are reforms which also address national security risks, including those related to critical infrastructure, and they strengthen the existing system, particularly as it relates to compliance by foreign investments. Uh, so I reassure the Senate, uh, assure the Senate that the government takes these issues very seriously. We will always act in the national interest, as clearly shown by the development of this foreign relations bill, which will necessarily address a separate but just as important gap in our overall system. Senator Fairbanty Wells. Thank you. Can I just ask, uh, Minister, as part of the stock take? that uh, you have indicated to the chamber, I would envisage that part of that stock take would include approaches to the state and territories, including the Northern Territory, which to this date has been reluctant to release any of those documents and release those documents publicly, and as I understand, release those documents to the Commonwealth itself. So as part of that stock take, would we envisage that 
um, without the cooperation of the states and territories, and in particular without the cooperation of the Northern Territory government, Labor government, uh, we, will ne we won't be able to be in a position to make uh, a comprehensive assessment uh, of what is the Port of Darwin issue. Minister. Uh, Senator, thank you for your question. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator, I'm not going to speculate, as I have not through this entire debate, uh, on specific examples and particular cases, because that is the purpose of the stock take. But we are working closely with the states and territories, including the Northern Territory, who were part of the consultations that I outlined in detail to the Chamber yesterday, uh, in relation to, uh, to these matters. Uh, once the bill sets out the requirements that states and territories are required to uh, respond to uh, in the stock take process, and the task force uh, is working with those uh, state and territory um, agencies, uh, then I would hope and expect that states and territories would constructively work with the Commonwealth to address these issues. So the question is that the amendment circulated on sheet 1115 revised by Senator Wong be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. Aye. The noes have it. Aye. The division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. So the question is that amendment as circulated on sheet 1115 revised and moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. The ayes will move to the right of the chair, the noes to the left, and I appoint Senator Urquhart for the ayes and Senator Davey for the noes. There being 28 ayes and 27 noes, the matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. That being the end of our amendments that I understand, the question now is that the bills as amended be agreed to. Those in favour, those in favour say aye. Those against no, the ayes have it. The question now is that the bills be reported. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The committee has considered the Australian Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020 and a related bill and agreed to them with amendments. Minister? Minister? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I move the report be adopted. Those in favour of the motion that the report be oh, sorry, Senator Wong. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I move the following amendment to the report from the Committee of the Whole. Uh, has this been circulated? It has, which I think has been circulated, but I'm happy to read it if the Chamber wishes me to do so. It simply relates to ensuring that the annual report um, which we have previously inserted into the legislation will be referred to the Foreign Affairs, Defence and Trade Legislation Committee for inquiry and report. Minister. Thank you, uh, Chair. Um, Senator Wong and I did um, speak about this uh, very, very briefly, uh, and I did that without the um, amendment in front of me, but it is a, an amendment of continuing effect. Um, I don't believe it's just consequential to the uh, resolution to the amendment that the Chamber agreed in relation to, uh, to the annual report, uh, and uh, in that case the government will oppose the amendment. Senator Wong. Well, this <laughs> thank you for um, you know, giving me notice of the fact sorry, that you sorry, are not Senator. going to agree with what we agreed previously at the table. And I just say yet again, here is a minister on a bill we agree Senator Wong. with. We need, you've I spoken. seek leave to make further statements. Leave statement. granted. Leave is granted. I mean, really, we, we have we have written to this minister. We have uh, invited them to negotiate on amendments. There has been silence as a result. She has not had the outcome in the chamber that she wanted. Uh, all for want of picking up the phone, and actually having a discussion. Now we have, uh, frankly, an absurd proposi proposition that a bill uh, which has been amended to include an annual report. Really, an uncontroversial amendment that would require that report to go to a committee that the government controls, a committee that the government controls, she's now going to oppose. I mean, you, you, you want to fight when you don't need to have one. Yeah, there's an annual report. Yeah, we can, we can send it to a references committee. It is a very responsible and sensible amendment to send it to a committee the government controls. 
Minister. Thank you, Chair. And uh, Senator Wong, you would be sadly mistaken well. if you thought that I was Minister. seeking a fight. Minister. I'm not seeking a fight. I am sick. Well, Senator Wong, we had an informal Please. discussion. And no, he just comes sorry, I'm sick leave to Wait, make is sure. Is leave granted? Leave's thank granted. you, thank you, Chair. Um, let me repeat, if Senator Wong thinks I'm seeking a fight, she's sadly mistaken, and she most certainly will know if I am. Uh, but I would say on this um, on this matter, on this matter, well, that, Senator, that's not my intention whatsoever. Uh, on this matter, Senator, I don't think this is um, merely a consequential amendment to the amendment that was agreed by the Chamber in relation to the annual report. I accept, of course, I accept that the, that is agreed by the Chamber and now forms part of the bill, Senator. There is no question in relation to that. But if uh, with the provision of the annual report, the chamber is then minded uh, to uh, to refer it to uh, a committee at the time. Then that will be a matter for the chamber. But this is an order of continuing effect, Senator. It's not a minor amendment, and the government doesn't support it. Senator Wong, uh, for, uh, two minutes statement, if I may, by leave. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Uh, of no more than two minutes. Um, just so we are clear, and coalition senators can be very clear, what we are now going to be have a division on. We are having a division because the minister is refusing to have an order which requires an annual report which has now been inserted into the bill to go to a committee that the government controls. So the, oh, Senator Rice, do, do you, you see? Okay. I need to speak, no, to speak okay. to the motion. Look, and the Greens, the Greens will be supporting this, supporting this motion for having this report and a, a, a continuing effect, reporting um, what has occurred under this legislation having, having been in place. It is a tiny measure that we have been able to get through this chamber to provide some level of accountability for this bill. It is a tiny measure, which is why we will support it. But Overall, in terms of the bill overall, look, the Greens' position is you know, we know that issues of foreign interference are serious. We know that it is far preferable if we could have the Commonwealth, the states, the territories, universities, local governments actually working collaboratively, coherently together to make sure that their interactions with foreign governments, foreign universities are in the national interests. And the Greens would have supported reasonable legislation that aimed to do that, legislation that was developed collaboratively, cooperatively, with input from the states and territories and the universities and local governments before the legislation was put into this place. But we cannot support this legislation. As I said, this motion is to have an annual report on the legislation, but other than that, this legislation gives unbridled power to the foreign minister, without, as I said, hasn't been developed in consultation with affected parties. It hasn't got definitions in it. There are no guidelines as to how decisions are going to be made as to whether to override decisions that sovereign governments have made with foreign entities. There are no reasons for decisions that have to be made, that have to be issued to people who are going to be affected, who have had their decisions over overrided. There is retrospectivity. So states and territories, universities, they can enter into arrangements and at some stage in the future, because foreign policy is deemed to have changed, then suddenly their arrangements can be overridden. There is no procedural fairness, as we discussed earlier on today. It has all been just trust us, that everything will be fine, just trust us. Well, frankly, Minister, and frankly, this government, we do not trust you. And you have got form in not being able to be trusted in actually working collaboratively, cooperatively and working genuinely with everyone to be making sure that things are occurring in the national interest and in the, national, and in the interest of all Australians, not just your vested interests, not just the people that you happen to get on with. So, look, the Greens overall, as I said, we would have supported legislation that went to the, the issue, the serious issue that we are facing. But overall, we are supporting this amendment as one tiny measure. But overall, we cannot support this legislation. Minister, thank you uh, very Minister, much. Did you seek leave? I seek leave to make a short is, statement. Is leave, of... leave is not granted. So the question is that the amendment moved by Senator Wong to the report from committee of the whole be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. The noes have it. 
The ayes have it. Divisions required. Court ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. <clears throat> the question is that the amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole moved by Senator Wong be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Sorry, sorry, those in favour move to the right of the chair, those against to the left. And I appoint Senator McCarthy for the ayes and Senator McGrath for the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 31, noes 27. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. And the question now is that the report from the Committee of the Whole as amended be adopted. All those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. Minister. Third, third ready. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the bill be read a third time. Those in favour of the bill being. Senator Wong. Thank you. I understand that the government made a mistake on an earlier division, and I understand I was just giving you time to get briefed because I'd been briefed by text message that the government is going to seek to recommit the vote. So as long as the procedure is followed and, and perhaps the manager or the minister can explain the opposition will in order in accordance with the usual conventions allow the vote to be recommitted. I understand that there was an error in the um, arrangements for the vote on um, amendment. 1115 and the government seeks to recommit the vote. Okay, so in that case the move of we we the, so we will move that motion that 1115 be agreed to. Those in favour say aye. Those against say no. The noes have it. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. So minister Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I move the bill be read a third time. The motion is that the bill be read a third time. All those in favour say aye. aye. Against say no. Aye. The ayes have it. No. Division required? Yes. Ring the bells for four minutes.
Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those eyes will move to the right of the chair, the nose to the left, and I appoint Senator McGrath for the eyes and Senator Seawert for the nose. The result of the division is eyes 41, noes 9. The matter is therefore resolved in the affirmative. I call the clerk. Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Bill 2020. Australia's Foreign Relations State and Territory Arrangements Consequential Amendments Bill 2020. Government Business Order of the Day number 2. Electoral Amendment Territory Representation Bill 2020, second reading debate. Would honour oh, Senator McCarthy? Shall I wait? Yes, yeah, would honourable mem members please leave the chamber quietly to, and <coughs> resume your seat? But of course, if you want to hear about the Northern Territory, please stay. Please stay, <laughs> because we've got some great news to talk about here. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. And uh, given uh, that we've had uh, a fairly hectic morning here uh, with previous bills, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to get to my feet on behalf of the people of the Northern Territory and speak about a bill of absolute importance in preserving the seats of Solomon and the seat of Lingiari for the people of the Northern Territory. That's what this bill is all about. My speech today is really to the people of the Northern Territory and also to the people on Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands. Thank you for your support in ensuring that we did not lose our voice in the Australian Parliament. In fact, our voices in the Australian Parliament. Many of you provided submissions to the uh, Joint Select Committee on Electoral Matters and spoke so passionately about the need for democratic fairness and the rights of territory and the Indian Ocean Territories to be heard in the House of Representatives. So this speech goes out to you to our First Nations communities, our organisations, to our ranger groups, to our farmers, 
to the cattle industry, to the mining industry, to the fish shows, amateur and commercial alike, to our health workers on the front line, whether you're working in our hospitals, in our clinics, in the remote and regional areas of the Northern Territory and the Indian Ocean Territories, this is about you. It's about your voice. It's about ensuring that the Australian Parliament never forgets the people of Lingiari and Solomon. I thank the Senate for this opportunity and I certainly thank colleagues on both sides, on all sides, who have stood very strongly in pursuing this, in particular in the House, Warren Snowden, the member for Lingiari, Luke Gosling, the member for Solomon, and Senator Sam McMahon. It is important that no matter our political ideologies and our parties, where we live, that we came together very strongly to say this must not happen where we lose a voice. You know, in 2022, it will be 100 years when the first member of the Northern Territory came into this parliament. Nearly 100 years. So nearly 100 years later, you wanted to keep it still at one? It really is a shame job that the Northern Territory has not progressed even more. Two is not enough. But for the purposes of this bill, we are enormously grateful that what seemed incredibly impossible at the beginning of this year is now becoming very real. I urge senators, all senators, to wholeheartedly support the passage of this legislation today. Because the people of the Northern Territory and the Cocos Killing Islands and Christmas Islands have many issues to battle. You know, whether it's the cashless debit card, whether it's the community development program, whether it's jobs in infrastructure, COVID-19, we want to know that we have voices in this parliament to represent us. This should never have been an issue. It should never have distracted us to the extent that it did. But boy, am I enormously grateful for those who stood by us to make sure we never gave up on this voice and these voices for the Northern Territory and the Indian Ocean Territories. So this Christmas it is hopefully an important gift that we can certainly come to and know that as we go into next year, because who knows what next year is going to look like, are we going to have an election next year? The big question, isn't it, for 2021? But the people of the Northern Territory and the Indian Ocean Territories want to make sure we have our voices ready to go. I'd like to just uh, acknowledge uh, uh, Madam, uh, Acting Madam Deputy Speaker, uh, just a couple of people. In particular, if we think about uh, the seat of Lingiari, and Lingiari, as uh, hopefully everyone does know, is, comes from the name of uh, Vincent Lingiari, the late uh, Gurindji elder who fought for land rights, and not just for the Northern Territory, but for all First Nations people right across Australia, and for our country, Australia, to treat uh, First Nations people with the dignity and respect that we have forever been calling for. And dignity and respect not only comes in the way we treat one another, but it is in the financial ways that we treat each other in the economic cycles that we treat each other, in the ability to be able to have homes, decent homes and houses, not 20 to a house, but families who can live comfortably in one home, knowing they have families in another home without feeling like they're overcrowded. That's the dignity and respect that Vincent Lingiari stood for. And his message lives on in his children and grandchildren. And it was his family that I drove out to got in my four-wheel drive, went out to Wave Hill, and I spoke to so many people, pastoralists, you know, all these communities, the road workers, uh, the families at Wave Hill, and said, listen, I really need your support here. 
We have to fight this. So when I got out to uh, Wave Hill and uh, the, the Gurindji mob got together and we sat down and we talked. So I went through and explained, well, this is the Senate. This is how many senators there are. Over here, this is the House. This is how many uh, members there are in the House. And this is us four, you know, Warren, Luke, Sam and I, four of us in these two houses of over 200 people. So when you sit down with people and explain, this is our voice, they looked at me and they said, what? And they want to take one of you away? They said, that's not right. We, sh we should have more than that. And I said, yeah, you're right. You're right, we should. But we definitely shouldn't be losing any. So the Gurindji got together and they wrote a letter. They wrote a letter to the Prime Minister. And I'm going to table the letter and, and just read a little bit of it because I think it's important to acknowledge what the uh, children and grandchildren of uh, Vincent Lingiari did on this particular occasion. Dear Prime Minister, we are the grandchildren of Vincent Lingiari. In 2000, we gave permission for the Australian Electoral Commission to use our grandfather's name for the electorate of Lingiari. We were proud to see the achievements of Vincent Lingiari and the Gurindji people recognised in this way. Now the Australian Electoral Commission has declared the Northern Territory will lose a seat in the federal parliament at the next election. Losing a seat will make our voices softer, not louder. Government talks about closing the gap and a First Nations voice yet in the Northern Territory, where almost 30 per cent of the population are Aboriginal. We are losing our voice. The fight for land rights began here on Gurindji country. Our grandfather, Vincent Lingiari, fought against power and privilege for the betterment of our people and for the betterment of all Australians. We'd love to welcome you, Prime Minister, to come and have a look. In fact, they've actually invited not only the Prime Minister, but probably most uh, senators and members at some point to come to Wave Hill and walk. I know Senator Penny Wong has spent time with me out there walking the walk, talking the talk of the importance of what the legacy of Vincent Lingiari is about. Power and privilege, the fight against power and privilege. And the Gurindji hold that flame so strongly, as they do here in this legislation before the Senate. So, Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm enormously proud that through the combined efforts of so many, we stand here to do the right thing, to make sure the voices of the people of the Northern Territory and the peoples of the Indian Ocean Territories grow louder in strength, not less. Yeah, Are you seeking leave to table the letter? Yes, I am. I'm seeking leave to table this letter from the uh, uh, Gurindji Corporation. Is leave granted? Leave's granted. Thank you, Senator. Senator Waters. Thanks very much, Acting Deputy President. And I rise on behalf of the Greens to speak to the Electoral Amendment Territory Representation Bill of 2020. Um, this is a really uh, exciting day, and we hope for these reforms to be passed today. So, with that in mind, I intend to keep my remarks nice and short because we're coming up against the motions hard marker at 11:45. Um, but I'm really pleased that we are here today. People will, will recall the history of this reform. The AEC, based on small population changes in the territory, um, ruled that there was to be only one lower house seat to cover the whole territory rather than the current two. And in a uh, very welcome display of uh, chamber unity, we saw both Senator McCarthy and Senator McMahon uh, sponsor a bill to fix that situation, to restore the right to two seats for the territory and to ensure that the voices of First Nations people wouldn't be further uh, downgraded in this system that has already uh, underdelivered so much. Um, it was uh, a little bit awkward because uh, the government, uh, I think, didn't actually want Senator McMahon to be collaborating, and, and uh, through um, 
discussions behind closed doors, that bill was withdrawn. But I'm really pleased that the government has now put its own version on the table. We don't actually mind whose name is on the front page. The important outcome is that now we will see that two houses in the lower house uh, will be restored for the Northern Territory and also for the ACT. Now, the way it will do that is slightly different to the original bill. Uh, it was a suggestion by Anthony Green to use a harmonic mean. Um, the end result is a strong one. It is at least two seats will be guaranteed with the possibility of more going forwards. So we, we strongly support this bill, and I want to particularly congratulate uh, the efforts of Senator McCarthy and Senator McMahon in pushing this issue, leading to this excellent outcome. Uh, just a few more comments to make. Uh, I think everybody understands that the seat of Lingiari, which Senator McCarthy has given us so beautifully the history of, um, is 40 per cent First Nations people. So what an affront to have potentially had that seat abolished. When we've got 27 per cent of the population of the Northern Territory of First Nations and 40 per cent of the seat of Lingiari, and when we already see uh, a, a system here that has so far been pretty deaf to the needs of First Nations people, uh, that would have just been uh, adding insult to injury. The other issue is, of course, the downgrading of regional and rural issues. In, a, in proposing to amalgamate it with an urban seat, the seat of Solomon, concentrated around Darwin, you would have seen those rural and regional issues again further diluted with an inevitable uh, focus on those urban issues at the expense of those rural and regional issues, which of course are 40 per cent First Nations voters. So um, we are thrilled to be supporting this bill today. Uh, this is a crucial time in our nation's history and our relationship with the First Peoples of this country remains a festering sore that we hear could and should be doing so much better on. Um, our newest Green Senator, uh, Lydia Thorpe, gave a very powerful first speech last night where she talked of these issues um, in a way that I hope made everyone feel proud and hopeful of the potential for these issues to be resolved. We need to work on treaties. We need to recognise sovereignty. We need a voice to parliament. We need truth-telling. We need justice. We need healing and we need reparations. To have abolished a seat that was 40 per cent First Nations was going in the absolute wrong direction, so the Greens are really pleased to support this bill today, which will see uh, the voices of First Nations people uh, maintained. We share Senator McCarthy's views that, in fact, they should be elevated, and we look forward to working on those issues going forwards. But thanks again to Senator McCarthy and Senator McMahon for the initial strong moves that has culminated in the, the government's bill today. And well done to the government for actually coming to the table. Thank you, Senator. Senator Soldier. Uh, thank you. I'm very pleased to support the Electoral Amendment Territory Representation Bill 2020. Pleased with this outcome not only as Assistant Minister responsible for electorate matters, electoral matters, but also uh, as Senator for the ACT, one of the jurisdictions that is affected by this bill. Uh, now, we know on sheer geography uh, concerns were raised, and it was pointed out that the new division of the Northern Territory would constitute uh, one sixth of Australia's total land mass, equal in size to the area of France, Spain, and Italy put together. Uh, if it were a country, it would be the 20th largest in the world. Notwithstanding the fact that geography is always an issue uh, when it comes to electorates, the real concern was that we have evolved a system that could be considered, uh, in some cases, unduly harsh, unfair and unrepresentative against that backdrop. In essence, a reduction of a relatively minor margin in voters can result in a massive reduction in representation for those areas. In the Northern Territory, dropping below the quota would result in representation being reduced by half. It also exaggerates uh, the differences between population per representative. For example, the Northern Territory with one representative would have a population 74,743 greater than other mainland divisions, 139,878 greater than a Tasmanian division and 100,529 more than a division in the ACT. As further illustration, adding one seat in Victoria reduces the average population per member from around 175,000 to 170,500, a difference of only about 4,500. By comparison, dropping one seat in the ACT changes the population per member 
from 143,186 to 214,780, a difference of 71,594. In the Northern Territory, dropping a seat creates a difference of over 123,000 votes. Uh, so these risks are not just hypothetical, of course uh, they are historical fact. In 2003, the Northern Territory's population fell uh, just 294 short of the required quota, yet it threatened to take their representation down to just one seat. This resulted in amendments to electoral legislation that took into account statistical errors in population estimates. The use of the margin of error calculation did indeed keep a second seat for the Northern Territory in 2004, but it is a solution built on the acceptance of statistical error as a legitimate tool for representation. And it does not address the issue of aligning as far as possible the number of voters per electorate as closely as possible between crowded city electorates and sprawling regional ones. The question then was how to create an electoral system that is fair and representative across the whole of our nation, but also reasonable and robust as a matter of electoral mathematics. Uh, there was the option of simply mandating a, a minimum number of seats, which was put to this parliament. Upon closer examination, that simplicity is also a flaw. While simple, it does not fully discharge our responsibility to deliver as far as possible the best principled basis for determining seats for representation. A politically mandated number could easily be seen as arbitrary and certainly not in the spirit of the founding of our nation nor the interests of finding a genuinely robust methodology. Now, this very point was raised during the 2004 debates when Warren Snowden warned that such a path could, and I quote, undermine the credibility of the Electoral Act and which could create a precedent for future governments to intervene in a very political and partisan way, unquote. It's a wise warning and it's worthy of serious consideration. It's also a two-edged sword. Mandating a minimum seat number, regardless of how low population actually falls, could result in the perverse outcome of an electorate being massively overrepresented. In either case, there are issues that need to be addressed. And that's why, after consultation with colleagues and submissions from stakeholders, another method was considered and is included in this bill. And this bill proposes the adoption of the harmonic mean or Dean method as a fairer, more robust and more reliable solution than others proposed so far. As Anthony Green advocated in his submission on this matter, the, uh, the adoption of the harmonic mean both protects the people of the territories and provides a legitimate principle-based solution going forward. It removes the harshness and in inequity of knife-edge differences in population, creating massive drops in representation. It removes the requirement of statistical errors to be included as a safety net to overcome more fundamental flaws in our electoral calculations. It is a system designed to keep the, per vote, the voter per member average in smaller population areas more closely aligned with the national average, something Anthony Green notes is not a property of the existing method. Not only am I pleased with the solution proposed as a legitimate, tested and supported solution for all Australians, it's also a sound result the Australian Capital Territory. Uh, though smaller in size, the ACT does face the same vagaries in terms of outcomes. Despite our population, the ACT was only granted a third seat based on the margin of error calculation. According to Anthony Green's submission, using the proposed harmonic mean would have given the ACT a third seat for 1993, 1998, 2001, 2004 and 2016 all applying the same rules that would apply to the Northern Territory. And it is this issue of equal treatment between the territories that has raised concerns both in the pursuit of electoral fairness but ensuring it is fair to the ACT as well as to the Northern Territory. And so as Senator for the ACT, I'm very pleased uh, with where we've gotten to. Uh, and I contrast this uh, with the proposal that was supported by uh, Labor representatives for the ACT. Uh, the bill uh, included in its title, Ensuring Fair Representation for the Northern Territory. Uh, it didn't give the same fairness to the ACT. Uh, after that bill was referred to committee, this issue became abundantly clear. The committee report notes, the private senator's bill would introduce a new minimum of two seats in the Northern Territory, but would keep the Australian Capital Territory uniquely on the lower one-seat floor. This would institute a two-tier arrangement for minimum territory representation, rather than modelling the section on the constitutional treatment of original states, whereby all original states are treated with parity. It would also be a departure from existing electoral arrangements. It further notes, 
By having separate minimum entitlement provisions treating each territory differently, the bill departs from this long-standing position, raising parity, equity and conceivably constitutional concerns. Not with, notwithstanding uh, whether this may give rise to legal issues, the committee considers that on principle alone there ought to be parity in the treatment of the two territories. And this is a sentiment with which I wholeheartedly agree. Clearly, uh, Labor, including Senator Gallagher as well as Andrew Lee, Alicia Payne and David Smith, all supported a solution which would have treated the ACT differently and at a significant relative disadvantage to the Northern Territory. Their proposal was far more favourable to the NT uh, as against the Australian Capital Territory. This disparity a guaranteed two seats for the Northern Territory uh, but only one for the ACT is not only unfair to the people of the ACT, it does raise constitutional issues of treating voters differently in different jurisdictions. Uh, and, and, and as I said, uh, the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters uh, made this point uh, in a very sound way. Uh, lastly, uh, I would note that the bill today removes the margin of error rule as it is applied to the ACT in the Northern Territory. This rule was arguably only a fix for a specific fault at the time. With better systems, those reasons no longer apply. Far more importantly, uh, the system proposed does not need a second safety net and certainly not one based on codifying margin of error as a permanent part of our electoral system. As I have said and welcomed, our electoral systems are vital to our democracy and faith in that system from the public is dependent on the good faith of negotiations undertaken uh, by this parliament. I believe the bill today is a demonstration of that commitment and that good uh, as Assistant Minister for Electoral Matters, I applaud the hard work and rigour that colleagues and commentators have brought to this discussion. As a local representative for the ACT, I'm very pleased to champion and deliver a system that gives fair representations to both territories, the ACT and the Northern Territory. And as a parliamentarian, I welcome a system of fair representation for all Australians, whether here in the seat of government in the ACT or in the heart of our country in the Northern Territory. I thank everyone who contributed to the development of the bill and I commend it to the Senate. Thank you, Senator. Senator Farrell. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting uh, Deputy President. Uh, Labor welcomes uh, this legislation, which will ensure that the Northern Territory retains two seats in the House of Representatives. Of course, this bill is in response to Labor's original bill, introduced by Senator uh, Malandiri McCarthy earlier this year, which was a, I was a, a proud uh, co-sponsor of. Since the in introduction of uh, our bill in June, my Labor colleagues in the Northern Territory, Luke Gosling, uh, Warren Snowden and Senator McCarthy, have fought to ensure that the voice of Territorians is not diminished by having the Territory reduced to one enormous electorate. This bill is the outcome of a sustained campaign. Uh, we were able to secure the support of uh, the CLP Senator McMahon, the Greens, the Crossbench, the Northern Territory Government and the Northern Territory Opposition and even the National Party to ensure that the government was forced to deal with this issue. I'd like to thank all of my Senate colleagues and those in the other place for their support of this bill. I'd also like to thank uh, the Northern Territory Chief Minister Michael Gunner the ALP National uh, Secretary Paul Erickson and ALP uh, NT Secretary Anthony Burton for all their hard work and commitment to security, securing the Territory's representation. And I extend my thanks and appreciation to the Labor members of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, uh, Senator Carol Brown, Milton Dick, uh, Senator Mario Smith and Kate Twaits uh, for the time and effort that they put in uh, on this committee of inquiry into this bill. Um, <clears throat> there's no accounting for a community interest, what the people in remote and regional communities need uh, now <clears throat> uh, and how different it is from what the people of Darwin and Palmerston need. There is no accounting for demography. The First Nations Australians made up about 30 per cent of the Territory's population. And there's only one thing that the AEC, AEC can look at, at, um, at it and that's a population, and on those figures the Northern Territory fell short of retaining its two seats by around 4,000 people. Labor couldn't stand by and let the Territory representation diminish. Uh, the government uh, wasn't acting to save the Northern Territory's second seat, so we in Labor introduced our own piece of legislation. Um, <clears throat> the bill that the government uh, introduced uh, uh, isn't exactly what Labor would have done, uh, but it uh, it does fix the problem. 
and instead of enacting uh, J. Scum's third recommendation, which is to change the method by which both territories are entitled uh, to determination, uh, it's a method that we didn't advocate, but it does, uh, it does the job of fixing the issue. Um, the bill also uh, sets aside, <coughs> many others have spoken about the various details of the bill, so I won't uh, go over that uh, again, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, the bill also sets aside the AEC's most recent uh, in, uh, determination in relation to the Northern Territory and the determination made in 2017, which allocated two seats to the Northern Territory, will apply. I met with the Electoral Commissioner earlier this week and he confirmed to me that the current boundaries of Solomon and Lingiari will continue and there will be no requirement for a further redistribution. My first visit to the Northern Territory was some 44 years ago, Madam Acting De Deputy President, to help Darwin rebuild after the cyclone, and I've made countless trips there ever since. Uh, working with my uh, Labor colleagues in the Northern Territory to help secure this important change has been uh, an honour, and particularly working with uh, Senator McCarthy on this issue, uh, and there is passion and dedication <coughs> uh, that's been the driving force uh, behind this campaign. Labor has always been committed to ensuring all Territorians continue to have fair representation in our federal parliament, and we are glad that the government has come on board. And I thank the former minister, Minister Cormann, and um, Minister Birmingham for the respectful way in which they have handled this issue. This is a win for democracy, and we are all pleased to support this bill. Senator McMahon. Um, thank you, Mr President. Um, I rise to, to speak on this historic and important piece of legislation. Uh, historic and important not just to the Northern Territory, although that is obviously where my passion lies, um, but also to the ACT, because in this bill we have included not just the Northern Territory, but our other territory uh, right here in our nation's, uh, around our nation's capital. Um, so why, why is this important? To Territorians. Um, you know, around the rest of Australia, if you suggested to a lot of people that you should take away a politician or two, they would probably say that that's a good thing. Um, not so in the Territory. We, uh, we obviously, as a Territory, only have two Senators and we have two lower house. So four representatives to the Federal Parliament um, for the whole of the Territory. So Territorians um, are very well aware of their need for federal representation. They're very well aware of the role that the, um, the federal government plays. Uh, they're well aware that Labor in the Northern Territory has sent us broke and that if we were in fact a company, we would be bankrupt. So they're well aware of the need for the federal government to provide for the programs and the services and the infrastructure that Territorians need. If we look just at the geography of the Northern Territory, almost 1.4 million square kilometres. It's absolutely huge. And as has been said by uh, my colleagues, it also includes um, Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands. Um, now, to get to these islands, one must actually travel via, this is pre-COVID as well, this has not been affected by COVID, before COVID, you had to either travel via Perth or via Malaysia to get there. So imagine uh, too many other jurisdictions in the world where you, you not only have to leave your state or territory to get to another part of your state or territory, but uh, you, you actually have to travel through another country to get to a part of your state or territory. It's, uh, it's quite unique and um, quite amazing. And I know the people of, of Christmas and Cocos Island uh, value their federal representation. And they, feeling so isolated as they are sitting out there in the middle of the, uh, the ocean, uh, realise that with less representation, um, they're hardly ever going to see anybody ever. And for a group of people that are fairly marginalised and very isolated, um, you can imagine that, that that is not something that they would welcome. As for the rest of the Territory, almost 1.4 million square kilometres and uh, very, very difficult to get around. We have very few roads. Most of the roads that we do have 
um, uh, can be cut off for sometimes large parts of the year. Uh, a lot of them are, are fairly poor and uh, not very easily passed. Uh, a lot of the territory you can't even get to by road for, um, for large parts or sometimes even all of the year. Um, you know, we, have, we have quite a few islands as well, such as uh, Groot Island, Croker Island, Melville Island, Bathurst Island, accessible only via barge or air, and again, uh, difficult and time-consuming to get around. So you can imagine taking one of four representatives out of that mix is going to mean that, that these people are not going to be able to, uh, to see, speak to or show a federal representative um, their part of the world and their issues uh, hardly ever, which would um, be quite a negative thing for, again, people that are, are often the most disadvantaged, um, marginalised people in our country. Um, we have the two electorates, Solomon and Lingiari. Very, very diff different. Solomon is basically Darwin. Darwin is a, um, a reasonably modern, cosmopolitan, urbanised city these days. Um, and then you have Lingiari, which is all of the rest, basically almost all of that 1.4 million square kilometres. Lingiari is uh, approximately 40 per cent indigenous. Um, again, some of the most isolated, um, disadvantaged, marginalised people in the world. Having only one federal representative to serve them um, would be quite unfair and, uh, quite frankly, disastrous for the Northern Territory. Um, also, you look at the socio-economics. I know there's both ends of the spectrum in, in every state and territory, but certainly, I mean, the territory, it certainly typified to me how, how much that is so in the territory. Just last week, Mr President, I was sitting in a building in Darwin with lovely 360 degree views all around the harbour and all around the city with three of the richest people in the Northern Territory. And we're talking, we're talking billions, not millions. We're not, uh, you know, ter ter typically when you think of uh, someone who's wealthy in the Territory, it's someone who can, you know, buy a, buy a round without taking out a bank loan. But, um, that was not the case with these people. These were, um, you know, we had billions of dollars uh, assembled in that room. And uh, the, the very next day, Mr. President, the very next day, I was sitting in the dirt north of Tennant Creek with a group of traditional owners. Uh, we say traditional owners, but you know they they don't have the the, the money, the the land, the the businesses, or the education. Uh, that the three men I was with the day before do, and that's that's very very typical of the territory. We tend to get very extremes and and lots of people at those extremes. You know those traditional owners that were sitting there in the dirt, who were getting their, their part of their traditional land handed back to them, um, 600 square kilometres. Um, it's not a lot, particularly in that part of the country. In that part of the country, 600 square kilometres would probably run. 10 head of cattle, um, so it, it's not a lot. Um, but they were happy that it was getting handed back to them. But sitting there in the dirt with uh, severely marginalised, um, disadvantaged people compared to the big end of town. So um, whilst there's extremes in all jurisdictions, certainly in the territory that, that is emphasised and we certainly have a lot of our population at the lower extreme rather than the top extreme. Um, and these people value their representation. They really do. People on remote Indigenous communities think it is a great honour and are very happy when a federal representative of whatever persuasion um, comes to see them. They, they really do appreciate it. They put time aside and they want to talk to you about their issues. So I certainly uh, I thank Senator James McGrath, Chair of the Joint Standing Committee on Electoral Matters, for the work that he and the committee did on this inquiry and, uh, and the report from that that was handed up to the Senate this week, which did recommend 
uh, a couple of different methods by which we might maintain representation. Um, and I'm, I'm very pleased that this bill uh, recommend, or, or enshrines in law um, using the harmonic mean, uh, otherwise referred to as Dean's method, for uh, determining representation, as that will not only guarantee that the NT retains its two seats currently, but it will also make it easier, as our population grows, for us to move from two up to three. Um, so I think this is an, an excellent uh, resolution. I'm very, very proud to be part of the government that has put this bill forward, and I thank all my colleagues, um, and I thank um, Senator Cormann for the work that he did on it, and uh, for Senator Birmingham for taking over and, and carrying on that work and presenting us with a very, very good piece of legislation. I, um, I acknowledge uh, Senators Farrell and, and McCarthy for uh, their support and, uh, and, and their working with me and their faith in me and the government to deliver on this. And um, I, with great pride and on behalf of all Territorians, commend this legislation to the Senate. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President, and, uh, and can I, uh, I thank senators who have contributed to this debate. Uh, particularly, thank uh, you, Senator McMahon, for uh, for your uh, advocacy and thoughtful engagement. But also, indeed, acknowledge Senator McCarthy, uh, and Senator Farrell, uh, and also Senator Sasselja, noting the uh, the broader territory implications and uh, uh, in uh, in the um, uh, engagement through. Uh, the debate and also the construction of this legislation. I also thank JSKIM for their thoughtful work and engagement through this. Um, I shall let the details of the bill stand, noting the, uh, the time, uh, aside from uh, to, uh, to note that many other members of the parliament have followed this matter closely, uh, conscious of, uh, of ensuring a principled approach in relation to, uh, to how such matters are handled uh, and that the use of uh, a harmonic mean calculation for allocating seats to the territories uh, addresses the types of concerns that had been raised in relation to territory representation, uh, but does so uh, in a means that, uh, that maintains a uh, principle around the application of uh, electoral redistributions, uh, ensures that this parliament uh, is not in and of itself uh, overreaching in the construction uh, of the House of Representatives, uh, but is ensuring that there is a methodology uh, that is applied uh, according to the principles consistent with the way the House of Representatives is intended uh, to be constructed uh, in terms of determining numerical representation uh, of those seats. And we do welcome the fact that uh, the result of that and the decisions made in this legislation uh, will ensure uh, that the Territory continues uh, at the next election uh, and, based on projections beyond, uh, to have two representatives in the House of Representatives uh, and, in doing so, does not find itself in a situation of having uh, the single largest uh, electorate, uh, potentially, when you combine population and geography and all of the challenges that that would come uh, with effective representation in this place. Uh, can I also uh, note that there has been conjecture in parliamentary committee hearings about the future status of the Australian Electoral Officer for the Northern Territory, and I take this opportunity to put those concerns to rest. The bill recognises that the Australian Electoral Officer in the NT is always to be a member of the redistribution committee for any redistributions in that territory uh, and for the record that the process to permanently refill uh, the AEO position for the NT will begin before the end of 2020. In conclusion, can I just remind everyone it's important we remain committed to improving electoral legislation in a non-partisan manner which promotes public confidence and ensures strong representation for Australia's territories. And we've seen elsewhere in the world in recent times uh, the challenges that can come uh, when, uh, when politicians uh, degrade public confidence or undermine public confidence in electoral systems. It's incumbent on all of us to make sure that it is upheld at the highest possible levels. I commend the bill to the Senate. The question is the bill be read a second time. Oh, those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now, there being no amendment circulated. Oh, the clerk, I always miss that bit. Bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 in relation to the representation of the territories in the House of Representatives and for related purposes. Now, there are no amendments being circulated, so unless anyone requests a committee stage, I will call the Minister for the third reading. Minister. Thank you, Mr. President. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk.
a bill for an act to amend the Commonwealth Electoral Act 1918 in relation to the representation of the territories in the House of Representatives and for related purposes. A couple of minutes. We have a couple of minutes, Senator Thorpe. If you'd like to utilise it to continue your debate, I'll get called the clerk to call on the business. The business ordered the day number three, native type amendment, infrastructure and public facilities bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, President. I rise to continue my speech on the Native Title Infrastructure Bill. The Greens will be moving amendments to this bill instead of extending the operation of Section 24JAA by another 10 years, as the government has proposed. We are proposing to extend it by only one more year instead. In our view, the minister has not made the case for why a 10-year extension is required. Remember that this isn't just about building public homes, but the government could also build police stations in communities that are already over-targeted by, poli by police and apparently do this for their benefit. I know from personal experience that for our people, having police as first responders is often not helpful, but harmful and sometimes lethal. If the government has serious, was serious about negotiating with traditional owners, or even just negotiating in good faith, it would be properly funded prescribed bodies corporate. They would also be properly funding native title claimants to properly negotiate on an equal footing with the government, as well as funding them to develop community-led land use plans over their country. And most importantly, they would be bending over backwards, just like they do for their big corporate mates, to protect our heritage. Because every time the Minerals Council comes knocking on these doors, the government gets themselves tied up in knots and do whatever they want. If only they Order. To Thank you for your flexibility, Senator Thorpe. You will be in continuation when debate resumes again. Uh, we will now move on, and I will call on the clerk to call on petitions. Mr President, a petition has been lodged as noted on the dynamic red. The terms of the petition will be incorporated in Hansard. Are there any notices of motion to be given for another day? Senator Fear of Auntie Wells. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, pursuant to notice given yesterday, I withdraw business of the Senate notice of motion number one, standing in my name for 7 December 2020, proposing the disallowance of the coronavirus economic response package, deferral of sunsetting income management and cashless welfare arrangements determination 2020, much to the delight of Senator Rustin. Uh, and business of the Senate notice of motion number three, standing in my name for 12 sitting days after today, proposing the disallowance of the Continents AIDS Payment Scheme 2020. Thank you, Senator Fairvanti Wells. Are there any other notices of motion? There being none, I'll move on to the report of the Selection of Bills Committee. Senator Smith. Thank you, Mr President. I present the 11th report of 2020 of the Selection of Bills Committee and seek leave to have the report incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. I move that the report be adopted. Thank you, Senator Smith. Senator Dunningham. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I move the following amendment. At the end of the motion, add, accept that the surveillance legislation amendment identity, uh, identify and disrupt Bill 2020 not be referred to a committee. Okay, so Senator McKim. Uh, if I could just ask, President, are we still speaking to the um, uh, motion? Are we speaking to the motion now that Senator Dun yes, Dunham has yeah, moved? Yes, speaking to the amendment to that. Yes, his uh, amendment to the Selection of Bills Committee report. Okay, but uh, if this uh, Senate will make a decision on that, then I'll still be able to speak to the Selection of Bills report after that. You can speak to both now. Oh, okay, I'll, yeah. I'll do that then. Thank, yeah. thank you. I appreciate your guidance, President. Um, I would like to make the point that, uh, from the Australian Greens' point of view, the Corporations Amendment, Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill uh, 2020 should be referred to a parliamentary committee and, and won't be if the Senate accepts the uh, selection of bills report. And I just wanted to place on the record that uh, that, that bill, the Corporations Amendment Corporate Insolvency Reforms Bill 2020, does propose to ease the regulatory burden on businesses. And note that uh, we regulate businesses for many reasons, including to protect our environment, to provide safer workplaces for people and ultimately we regulate businesses in the public interest. Now this bill would um, uh, wind back business regulation. We're not saying that's a bad thing. We're simply saying it is a matter worthy 
of Senate inquiry, and we are disappointed that the selection of bills report does not recommend that that bill be inquired into by, uh, by the Economics Legislation Committee. So I will put the amendment moved by Senator Dunningham. The question is, those who support that amendment say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Could I put it again? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. We now go to the adoption of the report as amended. The question is, those in support of the adoption of the report say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. I shall now proceed to the placing of business. Is it desired to postpone or rearrange the business? Senator Dunningham. Mr President, um, I move that a Government of Business Orders of the Day, as shown on today's order of business, be considered from 12.45 pm today, and b Government of Business be called on after consideration of the bills listed in paragraph A and considered till not later than 2 pm today. Uh, C. A general business notice of motion to be circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation be considered during general business today. And D. The following bill be considered at the time for private senators' bills on Monday, the 7th of December, 2020. The Social Security Administration Amendment uh, protecting consumers from predatory leasing practices, Bill 2020. Question is, Senator, that the question is that motion be agreed to? Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Urquhart. Mr President, on behalf of Senator Farrell, I withdraw General Business Notice of Motion No. 818, standing in his name for Monday, the 7th of December. Thank you. Um, I will now ask the clerk to notify postponements and extensions. Mr President, postponement notifications have been lodged in respect of Government Business Notice No. 1 for today, postponed to the 7th of December. General Business Notice number 900 postponed to the 8th of December and General Business Notice 906 postponed to the 7th of December. Committees have lodged extension notifications as shown at item 8 of today's order of business. I remind senators the question may be put on any proposal at the request of any senator. There being none, I shall now proceed to the discovery of formal business. And it being Thursday, I'll go through the items in the order they appear on the notice paper. So I'll commence with Number 874, Senator Faruqi. I ask the general business notice of motion number 874 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Faruqi. Um, I move the motion. Senator Daniam. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Australia has a track uh, record of meeting and beating our international commitments. We've beaten our 2020 target by 459 million tonnes and we're on track to meet our 2030 target. Australians are also deploying renewable energy at 10 times the global per person average. These are achievements Australians can and should be proud of, but climate change is a global problem requiring global action. That's why Australia <coughs> is committed to the Paris Agreement. We're committed to achieving global net zero emissions as soon as possible. Senator Roberts. Leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. One Nation does not support this motion. Australia's chief scientist stated that if Australia were to reduce its entire carbon dioxide output to zero, it would have virtually no effect on the global temperature. It's time that the Liberal, National and Labor Greens parties acknowledge that implementing layer upon layer of destructive climate policies and re renewable energy schemes cannot change the global climate. If people were serious about reducing the world's carbon dioxide output, they would be pressuring China, who account for 30 per cent of the world's output and renegotiate their renegotiated their Paris Agreement, which allows them to increase output until 2030 and then only slow the increase. There's no agreement. Yes, you heard that right. China will be increasing their carbon dioxide output for the foreseeable future, while climate policies here in Australia decimate our economy. And what's more, we are subsidising them to build the appliances that they will install here and raise our electricity prices. This is insane. Question is: the Motion moved by Senator Faruqi be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells.
Stop the bells. The question is the general business notice of motion number 874 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell off the nose.
The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 30. The matter is resolved in the negative. Senators Billick and Dean Smith note motion number 877. Hold them all. You've got it, Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 877 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Polly, number 878. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 878 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham, leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Tourism across Australia, and indeed Tasmania, was among the first and worst hit by COVID-19. The Morrison government did not hesitate in providing support for this critical industry from an unprecedented package of broad economic and targeted uh, industry support. In addition to JobKeeper, this includes small business grants, funding for airlines, zoos and aquariums, and national parks. Uh, Tasmania is also receiving $13.5 million through the uh, recovery of regional tourism package in acknowledgement of the state's critical reliance on international tourism. With regard to skills, our JobMaker plan includes a billion-dollar job trainer fund with skills and training crucial to Australia's economic recovery. The government will provide around $131.3 million to Tasmania over four years through the NASWD, supporting skills development. Uh, this funding is for Tasmania uh, to run its training system, including TAFEs. Question is motion number 878 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. Number 898, Senator Abetz. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I ask the general business notice of motion number 898 relating to the commemorating the 25th anniversary of Yitzhak Rabin's assassination whilst attending an anti-violence rally be taken as formal, and in doing so, can I recognise the presence of Mr Gerstenfeld from the Israeli Embassy in the gallery? Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Abetz. I move the motion standing in my name and, more importantly, Mr President, in the names of Senators Kitching, Molan, Wong, Rennick, McLaughlin, Keneally, Askew, O'Sullivan, Ryan, Antic, Carr, McGrath, Sheldon, Smith, Van, Hughes, Henderson, Ciccone, Fawcett, O'Neill, Griff, Roberts and Hanson. Senator Rice. Make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. If this Senate truly affirms a vision of a peaceful and enduring two-state solution, which we believe it should, then we should also be urging the Australian government to call out the breaches of international law that present a huge obstacle to achieving this vision. Australia needs to make clear to the Israeli government that increasing settlement building and the threat of annexation, not to mention the regular demolition of Palestinian homes, is a massive obstacle to achieving peace. And we urge the government to finally recognise a Palestinian state, as so many other countries have done. Senator Wong. I seek leave to take a short statement in response to that. Leave is granted for one minute. <coughs> uh, I express my regret uh, that the Greens felt in relation to a motion commemorating such an honourable and decent man uh, the need to make a political statement such as was just made. We all have views about uh, the foreign policy issues to which the senator averted. Uh, I think there is support across the chamber for a two-state solution. People may have different views about how that should proceed, but those differences ought not have been aired in the context of this motion. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. President, and uh, I would also I, I, can like I just through the formalities. Leave, leave is granted for one minute. Remarks for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I would also note uh, in the chamber today that this motion comes to this place uh, to uh, commemorate and mark um, the death of Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak Rabin. Uh, it acknowledges his promotion of peace and coexistence uh, at that time, but we know for all time, uh, given the nature of his leadership uh, and his legacy. 
The motion very clearly refers to an enduring two-state solution to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, uh, supported by Australia. Mutually, a, con a, a two-state solution mutually negotiated and agreed by Israelis and Palestinians. But it is not possible to extend with courtesy and uh, diplomacy uh, and generosity of spirit an acknowledgement of this resolution by the Greens in this chamber is profoundly disappointing. The question is the motion moved in the name of Senator Erica Betts and the others whose names he read out be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Roberts. Thank Number you, Mr. 899. President. Oh, sorry, Senator Betts it was seeking the call. I just moved the motion. I, Senator Betts. Uh, Mr. President, uh, with leave of the Senate, can it be acknowledged in the Hansard that the Greens, in fact, did vote on the voices for the motion? Because I think that would add uh, to the import of this motion. Um, I think the Hansard can record that there was no no voice to the motion. I think I can't assert. I, Intervention has now put that on the hand, and that is why I did yeah. what I did. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Abetz. You've done this before, Senator Abetz. Ah, well done. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 899 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Roberts. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Can we move Senator Lambie to your matter number 901? Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 901 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Lambie. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr President. The Morrison government firmly believes that tackling this devastating issue requires an ongoing focus, ensuring we remain forever vigilant about the welfare of our defence and veteran communities. This is why the government is committed to pass the bill before the end of the year and has listed the bill on the weekly program. Senator Hanson. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you very much. Um, I am totally aware that the people of this, um, of this chamber, most of them, are very mindful of the fact that the suicides that happened passed and the attempted suicides that are still happening in our defence personnel. We have all wanted royal commissions into a lot of areas, and I've wanted in family law, but I've got a hearing with that. I think the commissioner, where we've moved forward with this, is the commissioner, interim commissioner has been named, and the fact is that the commissioner can work with the government and they can report and work with the commissioner. They can start immediately to start working and answering the questions with, and Senator it is retrospective, Lambie. and they can look at the pr past deaths that have happened and the attempted suicides that are happening. I believe that you know it's a shame that Senator Lambie does not support a commissioner Lambie. that a commissioner be appointed and the legislation be passed because I don't believe she will be voting for the legislation next week. And I believe that Labor doesn't intend to vote for it either. I think it's a shame to the Order, people of this Senator nation Hanson, that have lost please. their lives. Senator loved Lambie, ones. I asked another senator yesterday that when they were called to order to at least concede some respect for the chair. Otherwise, debate in this chamber will break down, especially at this time. I called you to order on a number of occasions. The question is that motion number 901, moved by Senator Lambie, be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for four minutes.
stop the bells. The question is motion number 901. In the name of Senator Lambie be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I point Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Smith tell off the noes. The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 28. The matter is resolved. It is therefore negative. Senators, please remain in the chamber for a couple of more matters. I will only be ringing the bells for one minute. Senator Rennick, can we come to your matter number 902, please? I ask that general business notice of motion 902 relating to scientific research be taken as formal. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Rennick. I, I move the motion. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I seek leave to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. This motion is just another sad example from the self-described tinfoil hat-wearing senator, Senator Rennick, on his war on science and his war on scientists. Labor will not be supporting this motion because we support science. We support scientists and the work that they do. We do acknowledge that the more extreme elements that appeared earlier this week in this motion, referring to indoctrination, intimidation and shoddy mathematical modelling, have disappeared from Senator Rennick's motion. But the fact that this motion appears today reflects poorly on the government in their inability to contain the frequent and getting more erratic outbursts uh, from Senator Rennick. Whilst you're trying to make it look perfectly reasonable, we will not support it. We on this side of the chamber will not be providing the senator with more ammunition in his crusade against science. Senator Rice, leave is granted for one minute. Look, the Australian Greens support a scientific approach, and we support scientific research. Senator Rennick is a climate denialist, and he wants to challenge other science that he happens to not agree with. The subtext of what he's trying to say here is that climate science isn't legitimate science, and he is undermining the excellent, high-quality work of climate scientists around the world and here in Australia. It, the Greens support science. We support the absolute the science that is done here and the quality climate science, as is reflected by the excellent work done by the International Panel on Climate Change. The government needs to act rather than be fiddling around with Senator Rennick's climate denialism. It needs to act on our climate crisis and act on the good science that our, our climate scientists do around the world. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Rennick be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. Can I look to cross benches to get some sort of sense to try and get this right? The, those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. The ayes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute.
Stop the bells. Can we just make it, the whips have a challenging enough role with the pairing, can we just give the whips a moment to... So the question is, motion... The question is that motion number 902 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the nose to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Smith teller for the ayes and Senator Urquhart teller for the nose. Senators Rennick and Watt and Gallagher. The result of the division is ayes 29, noes 27. The matter is resolved in the affirmative. Senators, the final matter. The final matter. The final matter is number. Oh, I've got a couple left, have we? I've got. Oh no, we've got. Sorry, we do have several matters left. I was working off a. I got an updated sheet. So we're now up to 903 in the name of Senator Patrick. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice the motion number 903 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none. Senator Patrick. I move the motion. Senator Dunningham. I seek leave to move an amendment to the motion. Is leave granted? Leave is granted. Senator Dunningham. Uh, I move that at the end of the motion we have the words for up to 30 minutes. The Everyone's familiar with the amendment as moved by Senator Dunningham, so I'll put the amendment. Those in support of the amendment say aye. aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I'll now put the substantive motion as amended. The question is those in support of that motion of Senator Patrick as amended say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. We have two more matters. Number 904, Senator Chisholm and others. Senator Urquhart. Thank you, Mr. President. I ask that general business notice of motion number 904 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. I move the motion. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Now the final matter is in the name of Senator Pratt. Senator Urquhart. Uh, I ask oh, sorry, the Senator Hanson is seeking the call. Can make a short statement, please. And with respect to that which motion? That notice of 904. Oh, I didn't see you stand. Is it okay? It's my fault. Sen is it okay if Senator Hanson, who sought the call, I, I assume you sought the call before I, and I didn't see her. Is that okay? 
I'll give Senator Hanson leave for one minute. Senator Hanson. Thank you much. Community radio stations across the country continue to outperform commercial networks for their time spent listening, and therefore their listeners are more inclined to support station sponsors who help maintain the running costs of these stations. While it's unlikely for Triple Z hosts are One Nation supporters. I do support their efforts as a community radio station, and I congratulations them on 45 years of community service throughout Brisbane. Let me also take the opportunity to highlight other community stations, including Keppel FM in Yapoon, Noosa FM on the Sunshine Coast, Sunshine FM in Budrum, Bay FM in Cleveland, 4CRM in Mackay, Fraser Coast FM in Harvey Bay and many others across the home state of Queensland who all do a great job. In a time where we hear excessive network content on commercial radio stations, it's community radio who genuinely provide the amount, most amount of local content for their local communities. Thank you. I thank the Chamber and I thank Senator Hanson. Senator Urquhart, number 905. Thank you. I ask the general business notice of motion number 905 be taken as a formal motion. Is there any objection to this motion being taken as formal? There being none, Senator Urquhart. Sure. Senator Dunyan. Leave to make a brief statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you, Mr. President. The government's policy is only to use carryover to the extent necessary to meet our 2030 Paris target. It was the Labor Party that made carryover a condition of Australia signing up to the second period of the Kyoto Protocol. It was under this coalition government that Australia beat its 2020 target by 459 million tonnes. Senator Roberts. Leave, Mr. President, to make a short statement. Leave is granted for one minute. Thank you. Order. One Nation does not support this motion. The Kyoto carryover credits were created by stealing property rights from farmers without compensation. Farmers lost the rights to manage their land and vegetation without compensation. The purchase of freehold land has been turned into a leasehold agreement with government controlling the land used through overburdensome and crippling regulations. The decision by the Howard government to steal property rights without compensation remains to this day an unjust and morally reprehensible decision that the Morrison government refuses to reverse. It has been estimated that to compensate farmers for their loss of rights would cost in excess of $200 billion, but they should be compensated. If this government is unwilling to compensate, then they must immediately restore full property rights to farmers so they can recover their productive capacity. Farmers are the best custodians of the land and do not need to be brought into this mess that is climate change. The question is that motion number 905 be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Sorry, I'll, I'll take the clerk's tip. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll put that again. The clerk suggested I could call it again. The, those in favour of motion number 905 say aye. aye. The contrary, no. The noes have it. Division required. Ring the bells for one minute. Stop the bells. The question is that motion number 905 be agreed to. The ayes will pass to the right of the chair, the noes to the left of the chair. I appoint Senator Urquhart tell off the ayes, Senator Dean Smith tell off the noes.
The result of the division is ayes 28, noes 28. The matter is therefore negative. Senators, that concludes the discovery of formal business. I have received a message from the House of Representatives forwarding the Social Services and Other Legislation Amendment Extension of Coronavirus Support Bill 2020 for concurrence. Senator Dunningham. I move that this bill uh, may proceed without formalities and be now read a first time. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Clark. Bill for an act to amend the law relating to Social Security veterans entitlements and farm household support and for related purposes. Senator Dunningham. I move that this bill be now read a second time, and I seek, to, uh, seek leave rather to have the second reading speech incorporated in Hansard. Is leave granted. Leave is granted. Senator Dunningham. I move that the debate be now adjourned. The question is that motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. The clerk. Business of the Senate order of the day for the presentation of a report from the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee. Senator Smith. Mr President, on behalf of the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee, I present the report of the Committee on the Commonwealth Electoral Amendment, Donation Reform and Other Measures Bill 2020, together with the Hansard Record of Proceedings and documents presented to the Committee. Thank you, Senator Smith. Call on the clerk. Government Business ordered the day number three, Native Title Amendment, Infrastructure and Public Facilities Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. And I thank Senator Thorpe for her flexibility. Being in continuation again, Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I continue to uh, speak on the Native Title Infrastructure Bill. If only they listened to our mobs in the in the way we in the way that they say, we wouldn't have to go to court and fight tooth and nail to protect our heritage, just like we have been doing on Japwarung Country. Today, Judge Forbes handed down her decision on the injunction application by Japwarung people to have their sacred birthing trees protected. This is a welcome decision by Japwarung mob. We shouldn't have to go to court to fight for country over and over again. <clears throat> if only governments would listen to our people and worked with us, we wouldn't have to be in the Supreme Court arguing. If this country valued its first peoples, then we wouldn't have to be in court. This is why we are voting against this bill today. The Greens know that this bill doesn't extinguish native title, but it does extinguish our people's sovereignty. The Greens know that this bill doesn't uh, extinguish native title. This breach of the right of our people to get free, prior and informed consent will not be supported by the Greens. The minister has not made a strong enough case on extending this legislation for another 10 years, not when they have been in government for seven of those years. As our amendments to this bill show, we are willing to give them one more year than to come back and properly make the case to us as to why this section is needed. If this section wasn't in the Native Title Act, it would be hot, rightly condemned for being racist, because what the government is trying to do is to acquire interests over the property on Aboriginal territory without due process of payment. The government's bill leaves native title owners with infrastructure built on their land, which is alleged, allegedly for their benefit, but they have no control over it. This is shameful and we will not support it. Our amendment would give them one year if they cannot justify to the parliament in one year why they need section 24JAA, then that section must lapse. Thank you. Uh, is the senator seeking to put, put, put it? Okay, thank you. Uh, Minister. Uh, well, uh, I believe there are no other contributions to uh, be made here, so I thank uh, senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. So the question is that the bill be read a second time. All those in favour say aye. 
Those against? No. Uh, the, the ayes have it. Two voices. Is a division required? Ring the bells for four minutes. Stop the bells. The question is that the bill be read a second time. Those in favour say. Uh, those in favour will pass to the right of the chair. Those opposing to the left. I call Senator Smith as a teller for the eyes and Senator Seward as a teller for the nose.
you. There being 40 ayes and nine noes, the matter is determined in the affirmative. And I call the clerk. Thank you. A bill for an act to amend the Native Title Act 1993 and for related purposes. Uh, is it the wish of the committee that the bill be taken as a whole? There being no objection, it is so ordered. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Thank you. I move amendment bill on sheet 1102. And then you can just speak to it now. You can just keep speaking. Uh, this uh, bill is about having government properties on Aboriginal land. Uh, it's a sneaky way to continue uh, the oppressive nature of this government and how they want to continue the control of Aboriginal people and take away our sovereign rights in this country. To be allowed to build police stations in communities that the government own control and continue to oppress us with is against our basic human rights. It's against self-determination and it puts the fear into our people to be to continue to be profiled and harassed by police in their own homes and in their own communities. And we've only seen recently uh, where there has been a death in custody as a result of a government owned police station on Aboriginal land. I beg your pardon. I beg your pardon. Order, order, Senator. I don't. I, or, I am order, here. Senator Thorpe, just reserve your seat for the moment. Just wait for the moment. So, did you? Did you see? Okay. So, so we do note that interjections are always disorderly, uh, and at the time I was actually taking advice from the clerk. I didn't hear what was said. Um, I'll call call you, Senator. Senator Waters. I think it's appropriate, given the tenor of the remarks made by Senator McMahon, which I heard and everyone up the back here heard, that she be asked to come back into the chamber and withdraw that interjection. Um, well, Sen Senator Just McMahon is, is not here at the moment, and I will take note of your request and I'll seek advice about what can be done about that. Thank you very much. Um, back to you, Thank you. Uh, Senator Thorpe. Thank you. And this is my workplace, may I remind everybody, and to be white-splained by a white woman is inappropriate and it's borderline racism. So uh, I expect, whilst I'm in this place, that I am not racially vilified or white-splained by white people on my own country. Uh, after all, you, you, know, you um, all benefit from being on stolen land. You benefit from the colonisation of this thought. land. Senator Thorpe, um, I was pleased to be here at your first speech yesterday. It's, it's appropriate to maintain the tenor of the chamber, despite the reported interruption and interjection that you heard, that you make your comments to the chair uh, and, and you speak to the issue rather than to the people in, in the room. So if you can just continue, uh, mindful of you know, your important contribution nonetheless, but a little, a little care with the language. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And through the chair, uh, I do remind uh, people in this place that they are beneficiaries of a, an invasion that took place, and we are on stolen land. And uh, one of the ways that uh, the colonisers or the government uh, are trying to take back um, or continue to colonise and oppress is certainly uh, in this bill, uh, in a way that putting government owned infrastructure on Aboriginal land is another oppressive uh, way that the colonisers act. It's part of the art of war uh, and it's uh, a way that um, the government keep a very close eye on what happens in Aboriginal communities. 
So uh, this again breaches the rights of the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People uh, in terms of free, prior and informed consent, takes away people's self-determination and it puts the fear, as I said, into families and communities. And as a reminder uh, to the senator that walked out, uh, I think Northern Territory Senator, in fact, uh, there was a death in custody um, from a local police station on a, a local Aboriginal community. So the precedent has been set that it is an oppressive uh, way to continue colonising our lands and our people, and uh, we, the Greens, will not be supporting uh, this bill. That's all I've got to say. Thank you. The, the question is that the yeah. Senator uh, McCarthy. Thank you. Uh, look, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, this is such an important topic around native title, and I would just remind all senators. Uh, in particular of some of the unhelpful comments that were made in relation to this bill and towards uh, a, a First Nations senator as well. Senator McCarthy, uh, I, I'm sure that you'll be able to continue those remarks, but it being 12.45, Thank you. the uh, debate is interrupted. Uh, and the committee reports progress. The clerk. Government Business Order of the Day number six, Family Law Amendment, Western Australia de facto superannuation splitting and bankruptcy bill 2020, second reading debate. Senator Lyons. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Well, finally, finally this bill comes before this parliament and this Senate. It has taken way too long to get here and there's been unimaginable hurt created because the um, Abbott, Turnbull and Morrison governments have taken way too long to act on something that should have been done and dusted in a day. I've stood in this place when, and seen legislation go through both houses in one day. This bill which in WA has discriminated against de facto couples for years and years has taken a very long time. And of course, it's particularly discriminated against women because, as we know, women have much lower superannuation balances, where they've not been able to legally split when de facto couples choose to separate. And there's one person, one person who's been central to holding this up. That's the member for Pierce, Mr Christian Porter, who ironically was Attorney General in the state parliament and is now Attorney General in this place. And it has sat with him for a very long time. And he must have been aware of this issue. He must have been aware of this issue. I've got my good friend Rachel Roberts to thank for telling me about this about six years ago. Six years ago. Uh, when the Barnett government refused to do anything about the splitting of superannuation for de facto couples. And I thank Rachel for being so steadfast in making sure that we dealt with this issue. And I thank Labor's Attorney General, John Quigley, in the State Parliament for again urging the Attorney General, who's absolutely central to this, to act so that finally de facto couples in Western Australia who unfortunately split up, their superannuation will be treated exactly the same as uh, all de facto couples uh, across this country. And I have no idea, I have no idea why the Attorney General, Mr Christian Porter, has chose to sit on this legislation to do nothing for more than a year, uh, to sit on a bill that's not controversial, that in Western Australia discriminated against uh, de facto couples separating, and I'm really pleased that he's now finally before the Senate. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Lyons. Um, I think Senator Seawett was on her feet. Um, I just want to add a few comments here. I won't uh, uh, take long. 
I'd, I'd very much like to uh, support uh, the comments that Senator Lyons has just made. Anybody who pays attention to these issues in WA knows that this is a, has been a very significant issue for a very long time. And so it's, it's way beyond time that this was dealt with because it was an anomaly where women, and it's nearly always where the women, it's the women that suffer here, um, that have not been treated uh, fairly and uh, equally. And so this is long past time due, so I'm really pleased it's finally now come to the top of the list. I'd also give, like to give a shout out to the women that have been emailing um, and urging this to be uh, done and completed. And so big shout out to them. Uh, thank you for keeping this on the agenda. Um, and I think you'll all be finally very, very happy that this is now about to pass. And, uh, Senator Pratt. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. Back in 2001, Western Australia was the first uh, place in the country, because the rest of the nation was covered by the Federal Family Law Act, to do de facto law reform so that um, couples could split their assets, be they same sex or opposite sex, in de facto relationships. In 2008, Federal Labor also did superannuation splitting as part of its de facto law reform. But it has taken until 2020, because uh, uh, Western Australia is not part of the Federal Family Law Act, to, for de facto couples now to be able to split their superannuation. And I cannot begin to tell you of the injustices that have been done in that time because of the lack of capacity for people to split their assets. A constituent wrote to me with a very uh, com uh, pleading the parliament to make sure that this gets passed. She had been uh, paying all of the household, most of the household bills. Uh, so, and her partner at the time had said to her, look, this is great. I, because you're paying the bills out of your salary, I can afford to pay more into my super so that we can have uh, a happy and full and rich retirement. And so that is what, as a couple, they did. But what happens when they're before the family court? Even if they had amicably wanted to split their assets, when a lot of the assets were in the superannuation, the failure to act on law reform in this area meant that they could not. And it has left hundreds of people, if not thousands, uh, worse off than they otherwise would have been if they had been able to split uh, their assets fairly, including superannuation. Minister Porter said that this was urgent 12 months ago, uh, and I don't think the fact that it is now in this place some 12 months later reflects that urgency, but I will make these remarks short because I believe it is urgent that it passes today. Minister. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Acting Deputy President. I thank senators for their contributions and commend the bill to the Senate. Uh, the question is that the bill be now read a second time. All those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Uh, the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and the Bankruptcy Act 1966 in relation to Western Australian de facto superannuation splitting and concurrent bankruptcy proceedings and for related purposes. Thank you, clerk. No amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I'll call the minister to move the third reading. I move that the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Family Law Act 1975 and the Bankruptcy Act 1966 in relation to Western Australian de facto superannuation splitting and concurrent bankruptcy proceedings and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 7, VET Student Payment Arrangements Miscellaneous Amendments Bill 2020, resumption of second reading debate. Thank you, Senator Farrell. 
Thank you, uh, Acting uh, Deputy uh, President. Uh, I rise to speak on the uh, VET Student Payment Arrangements Miscellaneous Amendments Bill of 2020 and indicate that the uh, VET Students uh, Payment Arrangements Miscellaneous Bill 2020 proposes sensible administrative changes that Labor will, of course, support. However, as we reach uh, the end point of this year, we continue to see devastating impacts of the government's failure in the, vo the, in the vocation, vocational education and training sector. Uh, as you would be aware, Madam Acting Deputy President, before the COVID pandemic, the Liberal government had ripped $3 billion from the TAFE and training sector and oversaw a decline in Australian apprentices by 140,000. The very people who will be responsible for rebuilding Australia's path out of these health and economic crises. It's uh, very disappointing that this government is doing so little to help Australian tradies. Thank you, Senator Farrell. Call the minister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I thank Senator Farrell for his contribution and commend the bill to the Senate. The question is that the bill be now read a second time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. The ayes have it. The ayes have it. No amendments have been circulated. Or just Clark, sorry. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to vocational education and training and for related purposes. And no amendments have been circulated. Does any senator require a committee stage? If not, I shall call the minister to move the third reading. I move the bill be now read a third time. The question is that the bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Clark. A bill for an act to amend the law relating to vocational education and training and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number three, Native Title Amendment Infrastructure and Public Facilities Bill 2020. Resumption of debate in Committee of the Whole. The committee is considering the Native Title Amendment Infrastructure and Public Facilities Bill 2020 and the amendment on sheet 1102 was moved just a little while ago by Senator Thorpe. Uh, the question is that the amendment be agreed to. Is anyone seeking the call? Uh, Senator Seward. Thank you. Can I draw the attention to the state of the chamber, please? Is a quorum required? Senators can't leave the chamber until quorum is actually achieved. Quorum established. Thank you. Call Senator Farrell. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I seek to 
speak on the um, native title amendment, infrastructure and public facilities. Senator, could Senator Farrell's microphone be put on? Thank you. Senator Farrell. Thank you for that uh, courtesy, uh, <coughs> Madam Acting De Deputy President. Uh, Labor does not support the amendment being proposed. When Labor introduced these measures back in 2010, we did so uh, with great care and following extensive consultations with First Nations communities. And while the provisions have been used sparingly over the, uh, over the decade, they have been in force. Um, they, uh, they have been useful means to help facilitate the building of necessary facilities on land subject to native title, and we support their extension for a further 10 years. That being said, we and Labor share some of the uh, concerns raised about the way in which facilities built on Indigenous lands are managed. These are outlined in the uh, Shadow Assistant uh, Minister for Reconciliation in his second reading speech to the bill. In particular, <coughs> it is essential that uh, proper good faith consultations take place with affected communities. The legal framework contains a number of safeguards outlined to ensure this occurs. This includes requiring consultation to take place at the request of affected parties. It also uh, includes granting the uh, Attorney-General the ability to prescribe how uh, consultations with native title parties should occur and put in place specific requirements that can be tailored to a particular community. These provisions for cons consultation are an essential part of Labor's original design uh, for subdivision JA. Madam Acting Deputy President, uh, it's important that this uh, subdivision continues to be used only when strictly necessary to facilitate urgent construction. So I take this opportunity to reiterate our calls for the government to ensure that at all times it deals with First Nations communities in a consultative man manner uh, so as to ensure that any facilities built under subdivision JA uh, of the Native Title Act are managed in a manner that is appropriate and respectful to those communities before, during and after construction. Thank you. Senator Farrell. Uh, are you seeking a call, Minister? Uh, President? Senator Rustin. Oh, thank you very much, Madam Deputy President. Uh, well, the government um, won't be supporting the amendment proposed by Senator Thorpe because it has the effect um, of only extending uh, this particular provision for a further year instead of the 10 years as proposed by the government. Uh, and the reason the government doesn't support the one-year extension is because we don't believe it will provide certainty. Um, to communities, to state governments, and has the risk of delaying critical public infrastructure on Indigenous lands for the benefit of Indigenous Australians. Um, so we uh, we think that um, that you know the bill still does retain the, the temporary status of the provision, but it does so for a time period that allows certainty and the continued support through infrastructure um, for the benefit of Indigenous Australians. The question is that the amendment be agreed to. Senator Thorpe. Chair, I have some questions in relation to the bill. Yes. Uh, how does this bill facilitate the principles of free prior and informed consent over all decisions of what happens on the lands of traditional owners? Minister. Thank you very much, uh, adding Deputy President, uh, to Senator Thorpe's question and, uh, and further to the comments made by uh, Senator Farrell um, in his uh, contribution to this amendment. Uh, fundamental to any um, actions and activities that occur um, on in lands of, of uh, Indigenous Australians is, is the consultation to make sure um, that, that it is that, that the infrastructure and, and the activities that are being undertaken on those lands uh, reflect the wants of the people. Senator Thorpe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you outline in detail where traditional owners have been so unreasonable and where Indigenous land use agreements were not possible that this section of the Native Title Act must be relied upon to construct infrastructure on country against the wishes of traditional owners? Oh, 
Oh, sorry, Minister. Uh, Senator Thorpe, um, I can inform you that this particular section um, has been used um, 127 times um, on approximately 1,000 residential lots since 2011, so after over the last 10 uh, years, 53 times in Queensland, 74 times in Western Australia, uh, and this includes at least 778 public houses and other facilities in Queensland, 312 public houses and 73 other facilities in Western Australia. Um, these figures are as at the 8th of October 2020, um, and that's been the overwhelming purpose for using it is for uh, residential um, properties and public housing. Um, but you can be assured that the measure is only used sparingly. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Minister, what are the reasons traditional owners have given you? for not allowing infrastructure to be built on country, that this section of the Act must be used to, to build it anyway? Thank you, Senator Thorpe. Minister. very much, um, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, to Senator Thorpe's question, my understanding is that um, it's been um, used at the request of the state or territory um, governments um, and, uh, and also uh, the Queensland Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander councils. So um, it's solely for the purpose of delivering public assets and infrastructure, um, but it has been at the request of the state and territory. Um, governments um, under Hugh, within whose jurisdiction uh, the infrastructure is to be built. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Can, Minister, can you explain the rationale for not funding prescribed body corporates to operate and develop strategic plans and land use plans instead of expecting them? as under-resourced organisations to respond to proposals drawn up by government agencies under the threat that if they don't agree to infrastructure on country, they will build it anyway without their consent. Minister. Mm. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Each and every application is assessed on its merit. There is no one blanket answer to your question. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Chair. Minister, can you clarify that this bill will lump traditional owners with infrastructure on their land over which they have no control? Minister. Um, Senator Thorpe, uh, sorry, Senator, Madam Acting Deputy President, um, this is a matter for the state and territory governments in negotiation and consultation um, with the traditional owners. Senator Thorpe. Question. Thank you, Chair. Minister, why is the government using the need for housing as an emotional wedge to undermine the fundamental rights of free, prior and informed consent over country? Minister Thorpe, um, through you, Madam Acting Deputy President, I, I don't accept the premise of your accusation. <coughs> Thank you. The question is that the amendment on sheet 1102 be agreed to. All those in favour say aye. Against say no. The noes have it. The noes have it. The question is that the bill stand as printed. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. The question is that the bill be reported. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. 
The committee has considered the Native Title Amendment Infrastructure and Public Facilities Bill 2020 and has agreed to it without amendments. Minister. This bill now be read a third time. The report of the committee be adopted. <laughs> Thank you, Minister. Um, the question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. This bill, Minister. The bill now be read a third time. The question is that this bill be read a third time. Those of that opinion say aye. Those against say no. I think the ayes have it. I call the clerk. A bill for an act to amend the Native Title Act 1993 and for related purposes. Government Business Order of the Day number 4, Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020 and for related bills, resumption of second reading debate. Senator McAllister. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Labor welcomes these bills. No, because we generate 67 million tonnes of waste a year. And a large portion of that is recyclable. On a per capita basis, we generate more than 100 kilograms of plastic each and every year, and yet we recycle barely 12 per cent of that waste. And we're not alone in having that problem. Globally, more than 10 million tonnes of plastic finds its way into the ocean every year, and that is only expected to grow. And some estimates are that it will triple triple in the next 20 years. Wrap your mind around that proposition. And we are going to need to come to grips with this as a parliament, as a country and, frankly, as a planet. Because the environmental effects of large amounts of plastic entering the ecosystem are stark and well understood. Everyone has seen the horrific photos of the impact on wildlife. Turtles with straw, birds that have ingested large amounts of plastic, and we're confronted by the visible reminders of our waste habits when we see the debris on our creek beds and the Great Pacific garbage patch that swells around in the ocean environment that we inhabit. And the evidence for the impact on human health is growing. We know that microplastics have entered marine ecosystems and are accumulating in the food chain with uncertain effects. Our current practices are not sustainable in any sense of the word. Limited materials are sunk into ultra-disposable products. Many of them have a lifespan of minutes minutes before being thrown away. And there is no doubt that the best future for Australia and for the world lies in building a more circular economy, where materials are seen as a resource to use minimally and to reuse and recycle to the maximum extent possible. There's a strong economic incentive to act. In addition to being environmentally responsible, it allows the prospect of creating new resource recovery and manufacturing opportunities, and that means jobs and employment. For every 10,000 tonnes of waste recycled, 9.2 jobs are created, and you can compare that to the 2.8 jobs if the same amount of plastic goes into the landfill. Now, these bills build on an important labour legacy. Labor supercharged the process towards a more sustainable approach to material management by creating a national waste policy in 2009. We introduced the Product Stewardship Act in 2011, and that was a major step forward in developing a regulatory framework to encourage responsible waste management in partnership with industry. Labor created the one co-regulatory scheme in existence, the National Television and Computer Recycling Scheme. And the overdue, the well overdue statutory review of the relevant Act confirmed the fundamental value of this scheme. These bills establish a framework for the phased ban on the export of certain waste materials, and they also absorb the regulatory framework previously contained in the Product Stewardship Act 2011, while making some minor changes to the substantive rules for product stewardship. The government 
should have acted significantly sooner and it has dragged its heels on this question. These bills are best understood as a response to our inability to export our waste as we previously were able to do. In January 2018, China instituted its national sword policy, which banned the importation of most categories of waste. And until that point, a large proportion of Australia's waste products were sent to China. Similar announcements were subsequently made by India, Taiwan, Malaysia and Thailand, and there were reports of paper and glass building up in waste management centres across Australia. Some municipalities resorted to dumping recyclable waste in landfill to deal with the problem. These changes forced Australia's hand, and in March this year COAG agreed to ban the export of waste, glass, plastics, tyre and paper. The reality is that exporting our waste was never a good solution. It is ultimately and indeed definitionally unsustainable. It is not a real long-term solution. And reports, there were reports that in the jurisdictions we were exporting this waste to, that material was not necessarily being recycled there. In some cases, rubbish was burned, buried or thrown into rivers. Nonetheless, exporting that waste could have, in theory, bought us time—time time to deal with our own waste problem. But that time was not used. The government could have been transitioning to a more sustainable use of resources during their time in office. Instead, next to nothing has been done. The amount of waste we exported actually grew under this government. Three million tonnes were being exported in 2006-07, compared to 4.5 million tonnes by 2018-19. As I've already indicated, they didn't even do the statutory review they were required to do on time. That review uh, of the Product Stewardship Act was supposed to be handed down in 2016, but was handed down three years later. And there are consequences. There are consequences for the endless delay on almost everything by this government on matters of substance. But on this question, the Senate inquiry into this bill heard from the Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation, and they said this, and I'll quote it, I think it, and by which they mean the review of the NEPM, would have been a useful contribution to the discussion. The NEPM, like any other regulation, has both positive and negative in it, and there are things that we recognise could be done better going forward. I think the fact that we're at 20 years into that regulation and there hasn't been a review is probably more indicative of some of the issues or some of the perceptions that are currently out there. And I think that if a NEPM review had been done earlier, then obviously it would have informed this discussion and given rise to thinking around other alternatives as well. Since taking office, the coalition has taken no action enlisting any new item for co-regulatory or mandatory schemes. It is clearly not a priority for this government, whose indifference to the national envir natural environment is scandalous. So these bills, I said we welcome them, and they are an important step, but they do not go far enough. There are a number of specific amendments before the Senate to improve the operation of this Act, but we also need practical steps to re support recycling. The government announced a recycling fund after last year's election. However, it turns out that 100 million of this was, in fact, merely a reallocation of existing clean energy finance funds, and questions to the government this year confirmed that not a single dollar had been loaned to support recycling infrastructure through the CEFC. The $20 million National Product Stewardship Investment Fund has not made a single grant. The Senate inquiry into this bill noted the urgent need for the Commonwealth to adopt sustainable procurement models to provide leadership and boost the recyclable sector. The inquiry recommended that the government should expedite consideration of a cost-benefit analysis of large infrastructure pro projects, including mandatory targets for the use of a percentage of recycled material. Most importantly, as the Labor senators noted in the inquiry to this bill, Australia's lack of capacity to recycle the waste we produce, especially in certain material categories like plastic, is not unrelated to the lack of demand for recyclate. And there is no doubt this must be an area of focus and support, both through the relevant procurement arrangements and through product stewardship arrangements that are effective in seeing changes to product design and the lifting of recycled content outcomes. 
The failure of the Morrison government to finalise market incentives for the use of recycled materials before implementing an export ban is creating a risk that domestic reprocessed materials, which can be repurposed, may still go to landfill after the bans are in place. As noted, such matters can only be addressed through the adequate provision of procurement targets that would drive the acquisition of waste materials. As the Waste Management and Recovery Association of Australia noted, I think the perverse outcomes we were talking about first and foremost were the fact that we've lost access to markets by bringing in the export bill without the commensurate demand on shore. The opportunity existed if there was more emphasis on the product stewardship with the paradigm shift towards generator responsibility of utilising that product onshore. So if I'm the packager that's making the plastic that was previously getting exported, now I have to use that packaging material in Australia because it's good food grade. We could have avoided those perverse outcomes of additional stockpiling or landfilling. So the opportunity that's been missed today is the integration of these packages to change the shift of the paradigm to say this is good material that could be used over and over and over again in Australia and create jobs. Now I'll conclude by making the obvious point that this is a disappointingly familiar story. The previous Labor government put in place a scheme to tackle a major problem. The scheme suffers neglect under the coalition, and it turned out that there were consequences for literally taking no action at all, and the government was forced to take action. But instead of getting a proper scheme that would stimulate jobs and build industry, we get a minor regulatory fix. Recycling, climate, energy, that is a story that we see time and time again. This government is incapable of recognising environmental problems as being worth fixing. It is incapable of recognising the economic opportunities that come when you engage with environmental challenges properly. These bills are a necessary first step, but they're a step that should have been taken years ago and been accompanied by real action to build a real market for recycled materials in Australia. Thank you, Senator McAllister. Senator Wish Wilson. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I really am glad to be rising to speak on this bill that the government calls the Recycling and Waste Reduction Bill 2020. But the simple problem is it does very little to reduce waste in Australia. And it doesn't give the recycling industry the certainty they need to invest in a circular economy and move this country out of the waste crisis that we have been in since China soared in 2017. We have a historic opportunity with this bill to not only fix this waste crisis, create tens of thousands of new green jobs in the green industry in recycling, solve an environmental problem, but we also have the opportunity to do a solid for our oceans and our community. Now, this is very important to me personally. For the last nearly 15 years, I've been campaigning on trying to stop plastic going into the ocean, nearly half of that in this building in parliament. My, set, my first speech, I talked about this issue and some of the fantastic people that I've been working with uh, in community and in the environment movement to tackle this problem. My first senator's statement was about tackling marine debris. And uh, I feel very privileged to have had the platform as a senator and a fantastic committee system and the cooperation across political parties to have chaired, initiated and chaired two Senate inquiries into marine plastic and into the plastic waste crisis we find ourselves in. And this Senate was the world's first parliament to do so. We were the first parliament to inquire into this most pervasive and enormous environmental problem and how we were going to get our way out of this waste crisis because we've been so lazy by exporting our contaminated waste to the rest of the world for so long. And we came up with a series of very good recommendations. 
So this is important to me, and I know it's extremely important to my party, to my colleagues, who are going to make fantastic uh, contributions to this debate, to Green State MPs, to dozens of fantastic local government representatives for the Greens around the country. And I swear if I was to name the good people that I have campaigned shoulder to shoulder with on this for the last 15 years, my entire speech would be taken up by naming them. But I will try and get their names on record uh, at some stage soon. And the supporters and the environment movement. But here's the really interesting thing, Acting Deputy President. I was really surprised, and I must say pleasantly surprised, if not, and you'd have to forgive me for being a little bit cynical, I was very surprised when the Prime Minister mentioned at a press conference that his daughter had raised this issue with him and that he was going to tackle this problem. I was even more surprised when he made it the keynote part of his speech to the United Nations General Assembly uh, in New York in 2019. Of course, I'd like to have seen him talking about Australia taking a leadership role in climate change, but I wasn't going to complain that a Prime Minister of this country was telling the world that Australia was going to lead on this issue of tackling marine plastics, the toxic tide, the scourge of plastics in our ocean. And I understand he, uh, it was something he discussed with President-elect, or soon to be President, Joe Biden in the US. It was one of the issues they discussed on the telephone. The problem is this bill, the way it is written, doesn't act on plastics in the ocean because it deliberately excludes plastic packaging, the key source of marine plastics. And for those, of course, yes, it is a global problem on a massive scale. As we speak now, thousands of tonnes of mostly single-use plastic are making their way into the ocean. It's been estimated that by 2050 there will be more plastic in the ocean than fish. We are finding microplastics in plankton in the Antarctic. It's all through our seafood chain. And yet what do we do about it? What do we do about it? If you came to someone who understood this issue and said, how are you going to take action to reduce plastics in the ocean? What's the single most important thing you would do? You would go ban the single-use plastics that are causing so much problem. Reduce our consumption and production of plastics that are almost impossible to recycle and that form so much of the litter and the trash that does so much damage to our precious marine life. The first thing you do is ban those plastics. And guess what? There's nothing in here to ban plastics. There's nothing in here to hold the big producers of plastic, some of the most profitable companies in Australia and internationally, the retailers of plastic products like the big uh, supermarket chains. There's nothing in here to mandate strong targets for these companies. That's the second thing you would do. You would say, OK, if plastic packaging is the problem, let's try and reduce as much as we can of the stuff we just don't need. By the way, everybody agrees, including the packaging covenant, that we need to get rid of problematic single-use plastics. But where's the action on it? I'll tell you where it is, senators. It's in the states and it's in the territories. They're going their own way because we've failed to show national leadership on this issue. The Senate Environment Committee recommended a ban on single-use plastics in 2017. It's not even included in the government's threat abatement plan for marine debris. Marine plastic was declared a threatening process under federal environmental laws. Guess when? In 2003, nearly 20 years later, we still haven't tackled the key source of plastic that's doing so much damage. But today, 
Next week, this chamber, this parliament can do that. And I expect we will. We will do that. And that's what the Australian people expect of all of us. No more time for being cute. No more time for technicalities, excuses, wriggle room. Let's do it. I'll talk more in detail about the Greens amendments and other amendments when we get to the committee stage. They've been circulated now for over a month. We've had discussions with all political parties, all independents about this issue. We can create Aussie jobs. Banning the export of waste, okay. It's probably not the way I thought the government was going to go, but given the waste crisis we find ourselves in, if we ban the export of waste such as plastics, it does put it back on us to do something about it. It forces us to deal with this problem. And if we go down the right path, and what we do in the Senate will dictate that, if we go down the right path and build a circular economy, then we will create Australian jobs. And not just in the big cities, in rural and remote Australia. We will see massive upgrades in technology and infrastructure from the recycling industry. The recycling industry want to fix this problem. But they need policy certainty, and I'll go into that in more detail when we get to the uh, Greens amendment on mandatory product stewardship schemes. I can't stress how important it is that we get this right, because this is the first legislation that this parliament has seen on waste in nearly a decade, and I would say nearly two decades. And I do acknowledge what Senator McAllister said earlier about Labor's contribution with product stewardship schemes. The architecture is already there. And if anything, the uh, uh, second part of this bill, which is rewriting product stewardship schemes, really just does fiddle around the edges and has some, uh, some added benefits and measures that we support, but doesn't get to the root cause of the problem. But as I said, I am convinced we will do so today and next week when we vote on this. So, uh, Acting Deputy President, in the Senate committee recently, in the Environment Committee, um, I put up a private member's bill uh, over 18 months ago to ban single-use plastics to copy the European Parliament. I genuinely was disappointed. I was genuinely disappointed that the European Parliament beat us to the punch. They were the first parliament in the world to ban single-use plastics, although this chamber, this Senate, was the first to have a parliamentary inquiry into the problem. The Europeans beat us and they banned single-use plastics. So I'd put up a bill that was going to do that. I also put up a private member's bill that was going to take the Packaging Covenant, APCO, Australian Packaging Covenant. I was going to take their voluntary targets for plastic packaging and other packaging, and I was simply going to mandate those to put them in law to take Labor's existing uh, architecture and legislation and mandate them. Now, I believe APCO when they tell me that they're different to what they used to be. But let me tell you, uh, Acting Deputy President, in 2005 APCO set themselves some targets for 2010 to achieve a 30 per cent recycling rate in this country. Ten years later, does anybody know what it is? It's 16 per cent. So in 15 years, we're only recycling 16 per cent of the plastic we consume in this country. So the Australian Packaging Covenant, which is predominantly made up of, by big companies, big packaging companies and retailers, has had this voluntary target set they have never come close to meeting, and they've never been held to account. Well, it's time for that to end. If we want the recycling industry to upgrade and fix this crisis, and they employ nearly 60,000 Australians, and it could be tens of thousands more if we have a full circular economy, if we back the recycling industry and give them the policy certainty that they are asking for and they support the amendments that will be before this Senate, 
then we can actually create a circular economy, tens of thousands of jobs and solve an environmental problem. There's four key stakeholders in this debate, senators. There's the recycling industry, there's the packaging and retailing industry, there's local governments around the country that do a lot of the recycling, the curbside, and then there's community and environment groups. When my bill went to committee, we took extensive evidence, and three of those stakeholders supported the amendments that will be before the Senate. Local governments supported mandatory product stewardship schemes banning single-use plastics. Environment and community groups unanimously cheered on mandatory product stewardship schemes, government putting in law packaging targets and banning single-use plastics. Three out of the four supported it. No surprises as to who didn't support it, the packaging industry. Now, saying that, I'll be really clear, APCO said they were agnostic as to what kind of structure they were put under. And the big retailers like Woolworths and Food and Grocery Council, who uh, deal with a lot of the APCO members, and I was on a, a really good hookup with the head of Amcor, the CEO of Amcor, all of them said they are going to meet their 2025 targets, their voluntary targets. They're confident they're going to meet them. So why would they have a problem with the Senate mandating them in law? You can talk the talk, walk the walk. Easy enough. So when we get to the committee stage, Acting Deputy President, we'll be able to talk in more detail about why banning single-use plastics is important, why taking voluntary schemes and mandating them and giving the recycling industry the confidence they need is so important if we want to fix this problem. In a true circular economy, waste doesn't exist. Rubbish doesn't exist. The term doesn't exist because everything has value. Everything is created for its end of life. It doesn't end up in the ocean. It doesn't end up in landfill. It ends up being reused and creating Australian jobs. Thank you, Senator Wish Wilson. Senator Green. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Um, I rise tonight to um, speak on the Recycling Waste Reduction Bill, uh, and in doing so, as senators often do, we reflect on the constituents in our communities, um, people all across Queensland uh, who would be listening in on this debate and um, taking special attention. Now, um, because I live in Cairns, I I live in the same place as um, Molly Steer, who's a 12-year-old campaigner who led the Straw No More campaign um, and managed to eradicate straws from cans at the very young age of, I think she was about 10, 11 years old when she started her campaign. So I give this speech tonight in full recognition that there are people like Molly listening and wondering what the government has done after all their rhetoric about action on recycling, action on waste, action on plastics. Because Labor does support this uh, bill, but it remains critical of the government's inaction when it comes to regulatory reform of waste management and, quite frankly, the job creation in recycling, which we know is potentially there if the government got the settings right. Evidence from the Senate inquiry showed that while stakeholders support an export waste ban, this bill lacks effectiveness. It highlights the Morrison government's poor track record on making lots of announcements, failing to deliver on those promises. The bill would introduce a ban on export of certain waste materials through a new licensing and declaration scheme with standard qualifying requirements, fees and charges to cover those costs and reporting arrangements. It will replace and update existing product stewardship laws, making overdue changes to the national television and computer recycling scheme. This legislation has been introduced in part in part because of China's decision to, um, in 2018 to ban the importation of most categories of waste, a decision which had a major consequence on the Australian waste management sector. 
It means that Australia needs to dramatically increase our recycling capability and better manage waste across the board. Labor has been critical of the government for its inaction when it comes to regulatory reform for waste management. Since the Liberal National Government came to power, they have taken no action in listing any new items for co-regulatory or mandatory schemes. The Morrison ha government has taken three years, three years to conduct a review at a time when the country's waste crisis is worsening. Labor will support these bills because there is no time to delay when it comes to banning on ex the export of waste materials. But in doing so, we want to highlight to the Senate some of the evidence that was received during the Senate inquiry and the report handed down last month, because stakeholders have said that they do support this legislation, but are concerned about the effectiveness of the legislation itself and some of the failures of this government to get the policy settings right. Stakeholders, including the national waste and recycling industry, have acknowledged the government's lack of focus on reforming Australia's product stewardship re regime. In their submission, the national waste and recycling industry said, there is nothing that compels the minister to act should the recommend recommended actions not be completed, nor is it clear if the minister can actually recommend in the priority list, apply for accreditation as a voluntary arrangement as an action. The Global Product Stewardship Council submission said, we encourage the government to consider reflecting more of a clear willingness to pursue co-regulatory approaches as appropriate to build upon the proposed strengthening around the minister's prior priority list. Stakeholders also recognised problems with the National Environment Protection Measure 2011, which regulates industry participation for improving environmental outcomes for plastic packaging. The Australian Packaging Covenant Organisation drove this point in their submission. They said, I think the fact that we're 20 years into the regulation and there hasn't been a review is probably more indicative of some of the issues or some of the perceptions that are currently out there. If a national environmental protection measure review had been done earlier, then obviously it would have informed this discussion and given rise to thinking around other alternatives as well. Labor agrees that this evidence should be heeded and notes that the Morrison government should have reviewed the national environment protection measure in conjunction, in conjunction with the Product Stewardship Act. It was the former Labor government, Senator McAllister pointed out, that established the product stewardship framework in 2011, which included the national television and recycling scheme. This has led to the recycling of 360,000 tonnes of computer TV e-waste. But since the Liberal National Government was elected, they have failed to introduce any additional co-regulatory or mandatory schemes. Witnesses during the inquiry recognise that the government's shortcomings in meeting the key targets, including the goal of achieving 70 per cent recycling of packaging and elimination of an unnecessary packaging. Currently, only 12 per cent of plastic packaging in Australia is recycled, despite it being a major contributor to Australia's waste crisis. This raises the question of whether the targets can be achieved within, within the current voluntary participation framework. It is a shame that it took a ban on importations from another country and several other key nations for the government to act on waste and recycling. There is now a serious deficiency in Australia's recycling capacity. There is now less capacity to recycle plastic than there was in 2005. All of those jobs that could have been created through this industry, if the government was willing to act, have gone wanting. In Australia, we recycle only 12 per cent of plastics, 58 per cent of waste in total. The government's own review found that growing numbers of industry free riders is the primary factor that leads to a failed voluntary scheme, yet their limited response 
is to set up a form of naming and shaming to influence businesses to take responsibility, but without any way of affecting that change. What this bill also brings into sharp focus is some of the empty words and lack of follow-up by the Prime Minister and the Morrison government. They are always there, always there for the photo op. And, and when it comes to recycling, those photo ops are always quite flamboyant, always very interesting. The media releases go out. But even when it comes to recycling and waste, as other senators alluded to, something that the Prime Minister has said that he will champion personally, well, he still has not delivered on this. Just, when week, just one week after the election, the member for Leichhardt, Warren Ench, hit the headlines in Cairns about his so-called war on plastic pollution. It was the major media story after the election. Mr Ench had been returned as the member for Leichhardt and he appeared on the front page holding up a big bag of waste and saying that he was going to declare a war on waste to protect the Great Barrier Reef. The Morrison government, in making those announcements, promised $100 million of, for the Australian Recycling Investment Fund to be run by the Clean Energy Finance Corporation. $100 million that this government promised. This scheme was intended to provide concessional loans from between $10,000 and $5 million to support the manufacturing of products from recycled plastics and paper to take on the war on waste. But over 12 months later, not a single cent of this fund has been spent. $100 million promise, but now nothing has been spent, starting to become a very familiar pattern for this government. This was confirmed by the Clean Energy Finance Corporation, which confirmed that zero dollars had been loaned to date. The Morrison government has form when it comes to making carefully packaged announcements on waste and recycling, but in large part, they're not worth the paper that they are written on. They, are also, they also promised $20 million for the National Product Stewardship Investment Fund. This announcement was supposed to provide grants between $300,000 and $1 million to encourage new and existing product stewardship schemes for batteries, electronic products and plastic oil containers. But in June this year, the Department of Environment revealed that guidelines for this program had not even been finished. $20 million announcement, and yet we don't even have guidelines yet. The money isn't being spent. All these things that have been promised, well, here we go again. These two schemes from, form part of what the Morrison government's $167 million recycling investment package. And I'm sure that senators opposite will be getting up in their speeches today, talking about these numbers and all these schemes and all these programs. Well, can I tell you, they don't mean anything if you don't actually deliver them. It means that at least 72 per cent of the package that was announced by the Morrison government has made no difference to Australia's waste crisis 18 months on. 18 months on, after the waste crisis was finally acknowledged by this government and a war on waste was declared by members like um, Mr Ench in Leichhardt, by the Prime Minister Scott Morrison himself, only 72 per cent of the package has actually has not, has not been delivered. Failures like this undermine the federal government's promise that the $600 million recycling modernisation fund would create 10,000 jobs and divert 10 million tonnes of waste from landfill. Again, big numbers, big promises, but it's just not happening. These aren't isolated examples of incompetence. There is example after example of promises not being delivered by this government. The Morrison government announced a $4 billion emergency response fund to prepare for disaster recovery eight months ago, and we know that that has not been rolled out. There are countless other examples of announcements made by this government, and recycling and waste is another 
area where they have failed to deliver. Labor supports this bill because there is no time no time to delay when it comes to banning waste materials and developing our recycling and waste industry. We want to see those jobs. We want to see those jobs in places like regional Queensland. But we remain critical of the Morrison government's record on waste management. This bill will not be as effective as it could be if the Morrison government continues to lag behind on targets to cut plastic pollution. Under the Liberal National Government, only 12 per cent of plastic packaging is being recycled. Progress on election promises like the $100 million Australian Recycling Investment Fund and the $20 million National Product Stewardship Investment Fund have stalled. They have promised to spend this money and they have failed. Time and time again, the Morrison Government is failing to roll out what it is promising in a timely manner and in a manner that would make a difference. In many cases, it can't even get program guidelines finalised. So in concluding, can I say to the young people living in Cairns, uh, particularly uh, Molly Steer, the activist when it, um, of the Straw No More campaign, uh, and all of those people who have stood next to members like Mr Ench, who've gone to the plastic summits and stood next to Scott Morris, uh, the Prime Minister, as he's delivering a yet another announcement and a commitment to take on this war on waste. That unfortunately, can I say to those young people, this government is not delivering on its promises, is not delivering on its promises. They were very happy to stand up next to you, very happy to get a photo with you, very happy to tell you the big numbers that they were going to spend and going to deliver, but they're not, they're not doing that. They've stood next to young people and told them that they were going to take action on recycling and waste. They have stood next to workers and said that they were going to create jobs in this industry, but they haven't. The numbers don't lie. They are not spending this money. They are not rolling out these packages, and it can only be for one reason, is that they really are not committed to taking action on recycling, taking action to help our environment, or taking action to create jobs. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Green. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I'm very pleased to say that One Nation will support this bill. It's a rare event when I can honestly compliment this government for the quality of their drafting and the sincerity of the process. We have the courage and the integrity to give credit where it's due. This bill has been developed after many years of consultation, public submissions, exposure drafts and fine-tuning. The Recycling and Waste Management Bill 2020 is an excellent outcome. The provisions allow the minister discretion to pick the approach on an industry-to-industry -industry basis, yet with enough written direction, discretion to the minister that there can be no backsliding. The timeframes envisaged in the legislation are appropriate. The Greens amendments, sadly, are bringing forward timeframes to the point where it will place an onerous burden on industry, and that means on jobs. Industry must have time to change their practices in a sensible and orderly fashion. Products with outdated packaging must be allowed to work their way through the supply chain so that small businesses and family supermarkets and low turnover areas, often rural and regional Australia, are not left holding products that are illegal to sell. Where industry does not cooperate, there are penalties in this bill to ensure compliance. Those penalties are fit for purpose. The Greens' amendments to increase the penalties would place a burden on small and medium business such that they are unlikely to threaten, such that they are likely to threaten the future of those businesses. Almost every policy that comes from the Greens demonstrates a complete failure to understand rural and regional Australia and small business. In fact, a failure to understand Australia. Australia is more than the big cities. It's more than the inner big cities. The Recycling and Waste Management Bill finds the right balance between urgency and fairness. And there is urgency required around this issue. Every year, 645,000 tonnes of waste are exported to third world countries from Australia. 
The locals there sift through to remove anything of value, and sadly, the leftover waste is often dumped into rivers where it makes its way into our oceans. I often see social media posts pointing out that the garbage problem in the oceans comes from just seven major rivers and therefore is not our problem. The point that social media is missing here is that the waste from those rivers originated in countries like ours. It's our waste and we need to own it and deal with it ourselves. This bill does exactly that. Now, processing such a large amount of extra waste will create additional employment here in Australia. Now, I appreciate that the Morrison government is getting right quite the reputation for dodgy job creation stats, trying to look good, not do good. The budget laid claim to creating more jobs than there are unemployed. For example, 400,000 job maker positions turned into 40,000, one tenth. I was pleased, to pleased then to fact check the figures for job creation contained in the explanatory memorandum to this bill and find that, to my surprise, it is accurate. This bill should create 10,000 new jobs at a time when those jobs are badly needed. This bill is a win for the environment, a win for local industry, and a win for the countries and a win for the countries that we will no longer be using as our rubbish dumps. In the waste reduction space, I often hear the phrase circular economy. What circular economy actually means is reusing plastics by cleaning them and then melting down plastic to re-enter the production process. As such, recycled resins compete with new resin. The suggestion on the CSIRO website is that the cheap cost of new resin makes the high cost of reused resins commercially unviable. The Greens would add a carbon dioxide tax to new resin, meaning oil, to make the new option dear enough to make recycled resins, un uh, resins attractive. Adding cost needlessly. This is typical green thinking. Their solution is always to tax it or ban it. One Nation has a better idea. Our CSIRO, the Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organisation, has a role to play here. I acknowledge that it's been a long time since the industrial element of their charter has been used. The CSIRO, after all, has become in some ways a propagandist for global governance. Yet I do live in hope that the organisation charged by the Australian people with finding industrial solutions to everyday problems and challenges can come to our rescue here. So let's talk about what the CSIRO is actually doing on this topic from their website. Firstly, this is all quote, data analytics, creating new data collection and sampling strategies to establish baselines of plastic use. Machine learning, our artificial intelligence capabilities can be used to conduct autonomous visual detection of plastic debris. Behavioral science, we have researchers focused on social questions, social questions like how to inspire recycling communication action. Is the CSIRO gone mad? Next one, waste to energy. Our work considers how to use plastics at end of life for energy production. Won't that create so-called greenhouse gases, the dreaded carbon dioxide? What rank hypocrisy from the CSIRO? Environmental economics. We're studying the financial impacts of changes in the plastic supply chain, says the CSIRO. Isn't that the Productivity Commission's job or Treasury? How has that anything to do with the CSIRO? Then the last point from the CSIRO, material science. We recognise the importance of plastic polymers, biological catalysts and identifying recycling options and new biomaterials that could be less destructive to the environment. There we go. Finally, a mention on contributing the science behind a whole new Australian industry for biodegradable and compostable plastics that will drive billions of dollars of economic growth. I remember when the CSIRO invented things and solved problems that Australia faced. The CSIRO, sadly, is now more interested in telling us that we have a problem than they are in actually fixing the problem. And at times, the CSIRO helps politicians fabricate problems. But getting back to the bill, after, after suggesting my hope for the CSIRO, this bill is a massive opportunity for free enterprise to fix a problem of human progress. I urge the CSIRO to work with industry to produce biodegradable and compostable plastics that will allow Australians to simply switch from environmentally damaging materials to environmentally friendly materials. But there's an opportunity 
because pollution is waste, an opportunity for higher productivity, an opportunity for higher profits to those who are sensible. For example, safety was seen as a cost burden because incidents, but, but yet incidents are a waste. So safety, when fixing, when improving safety by removing incidents, is an aid to reducing waste. It's an aid to improving productivity and profit. That's changing. Fortunately, people are starting to work out that safety is not a cost, not a burden. It's a boost to productivity, potentially. Secondly, quality used to be seen as a cost, as a burden. Defects are obviously waste. Now, quality is starting to be seen by enlightened management as improving productivity and profit. The environment is similar. The environment is seen as a cost by many, seen as a burden. Yet pollution is waste. Pollution is the enemy of productivity. Pollution is waste. And when we remove the waste, remove the pollution, it improves the environment, it improves productivity and profit. Real environmental problems, like real pollution of air, soil and water, are costly to humanity and to business and to profits. Fortunately, humans address real pollution. In California, for example, the pollution coming out of car exhaust is now one thousandth what it was in the 70s. And that has led to more efficient use of fuel which has saved money for people. Order. Senator Roberts, you'll be in continuation when debate resumes. Questions without notice. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Mr President. My question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. How many years has the coalition government presided over record low wages growth? Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Mr President. I thank Senator Gallagher for her question. Uh, the government, uh, which, uh, which we have been proud to serve and deliver for Australians a strong economy uh, in the lead-up uh, into this global economic crisis, pandemic-induced crisis that we face, uh, has worked tirelessly to create more employment opportunities for more Australians and have achieved that in record levels. Uh, we acknowledge indeed during that time that uh, inflationary factors, including wage factors, uh, have been at relative lows. They have been at relative lows both together, noting that the inflation factors have also been at lows, and so uh, nominal wages growth uh, has been at lows alongside low inflation growth. Uh, but what our government managed to achieve, Mr President, in the run-up to the last election was growth of one and a half million extra jobs in Australia. One and a half million additional jobs for Australians, giving them Order. every opportunity. Senator, Senator, Senator Birmingham, uh, Senator Gallagher, on a point of order. Point of order is relevant. No I'm actually trying to hear the point of order. I didn't, there, was there was no need... preamble, Mr. President. It was a very direct question about wages growth. How many years have they presided over record low wages growth? And the minister should be relevant to the question. Um, I can't instruct the minister how to answer a question, nor the terms in which he can answer it. When the minister, uh, I've allowed you to remind the Senator, minister of the question, Senator Gallagher, when the minister is talking about wages growth, and I would contend that includes being able to glance across, as he just was, issues of the labour market, as long as he relates it to wages growth, he can't. Be, I cannot instruct him how to answer a question or the terms in which to answer it. But talking about wages growth is directly relevant to the question, Senator Wong. If that were the case, we would agree. But he's not. He's talking about and jobs I, and other economic parameters. And, and I, a glancing, if I may, my submission is, a glancing reference uh, doesn't then justify a range of material which is simply not relevant to the question. Okay. Well, um, in my view, Senator Wong, the minister was, to use the colloquial phrase, glancing across. I I heard him turn to this just around the one-minute mark, so less than 15 seconds in a two-minute answer. I do consider to be glancing across issues of the labour market when they're made directly relevant to the issue of wages growth. I will listen carefully and let the minister continue. Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, th thanks, thanks, Mr. President, and uh, and indeed, Mr. President, I'm more than happy to talk about wages as well as jobs. 
The two are firmly connected. Now, real wages have increased in Australia over the past year. Wages price index growth of 1.4 per cent has in outpaced inflation of 0.7 per cent. What I was pointing out earlier in the answer, Mr. President, in addressing this is that inflation rates have been at incredible lows. And so with inflation low, Order. unsurprisingly, Mr. President, so too have associated wages rates. But, Mr. President, what we have done and what achieved the economic strength for Australia was achieve record jobs growth, Order. which of Senator course Birmingham, feeds into wages. The answer pressures. has expired. Senator Gallagher, a supplementary question. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Yes, I do have a supplementary. On Tuesday, the RBA governor warned of, and I quote, subdued increases in wages and prices over coming years. Will Australian workers have to endure a decade of low wages growth under this government? Senator, will, oh, sorry. When will growth return to trend? My apologies. Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, it's important, and I thank Senator Gallagher for at least um, using uh, all aspects there of a quote, recognising that the RBA governor was noting anticipated low prices growth as well. So low prices growth, low inflation environment, and it does, of course, mean that you would. Well, those those opposite like to come in here, and of course, what they frequently seek to do is talk about the nominal rates and the nominal rates in uh, in relation to wages. We face at present a global economic situation quite unlike, quite unlike anything the world has seen in the last hundred years. Our country has responded more strongly and better than most, but we acknowledge there remain difficulties across the economy, for many businesses, for many households. But yesterday's growth figures, welcomed by the RBA governor, who you quote, who has endorsed strongly the approach the government has taken in terms of our policy settings, are all about getting people back to work and driving Order. growth Senator across Birmingham. the economy. Senator Gallagher, a final uh, supplementary thank question. You. Thank you, Mr President. Given that the government has prioritised spending uh, $15 million worth of taxpayers' money, congratulating itself on its so-called comeback marketing <laughs> campaign, when will Australian families, under mounting cost of living pressure, finally experience a wages comeback? Senator Birmingham. Mr. President, our absolute focus is, uh, is on driving strong economic growth across the economy to get growth in all quarters for all Australians. And our focus and what we are achieving in that regard has clearly been about getting the growth that delivered yesterday impressive economic figures for Australia, economic figures uh, that demonstrate yet again our country is outperforming much of the rest of the world. We went into this pandemic in a stronger position than much of the rest of the world because we had been outperforming in terms of jobs growth, because we had outperformed in terms of budget management. We went in with, with resilience and strength, and we are now coming through this pandemic in a better position than most of the rest of the world, not just on the health outcomes but on the economic outcomes, which are closely tied to one another. And so, Mr President, we clearly are committed and will continue to implement the policies that deliver the economic growth like Order. that we Senator saw yesterday. Birmingham. Senator Hughes. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Can the minister please update the Senate on what the Morrison government is doing to remove barriers to employment for people with a disability? The Minister for Families and Social Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and thank uh, Senator Hughes for her question. Um, well, the Morrison government is absolutely committed to challenging um, misperceptions about people with disability and promoting a more inclusive Australia. In this financial year alone, we will be spending around $34 billion on programs and services to support and improve the lives of Australians who live with disability. And today, being International Day uh, of People with Disability, it's timely to reflect on the contribution of the more than 4.4 million Australians who live with disability. It's about celebrating their lives, their achievements and their contributions. It's also an important opportunity to, to mark the contributions that people with disability make to the workforce uh, and to focus our attention on making sure that we change the attitudes of our employers so that they understand that people with disability can be a really strong asset in so many businesses around our country. So I'd encourage employers, not just today but all year round, to see the ability in disability and hire based on what people can do 
and in doing so improve the job yeah. um, uh, opportunities uh, for people with disability and understanding that people with disability are missing out on jobs because people just don't think this needs to change. And today, can I acknowledge the pin that I am wearing uh, was designed by Oliver Mills, and I noticed that a number of my other colleagues are wearing it too. He's a 32-year-old man from Adelaide who lives with cerebral palsy, epilepsy and vision impairment. But that's only a small part of Oliver's story. He's also written four books. He's an artist, a poet and a speaker. Yeah, yeah. And we cannot overlook these talents and experiences of people like Oliver and the contribution that they make to Australian society. So today, on the day of International Day for People with Disability, I encourage everybody, I encourage our communities, our workplaces, our schools to participate in International Day of People with Disability. Order, and Senator Rustin. Senator Hughes, a supplementary question. Can the minister advise how the Morrison government's 2020-21 budget is helping people with a disability to get into the workforce? Senator Rustin. Mr. President, well, we are investing more than $3 billion into disability employment services over the forward estimates. Uh, a changes announced in just in this uh, recent budget mean that investment in disability employment services will be better targeted, working to assist job seekers uh, most in need of specialised assistance to ensure that they can be supported in the workplace. Uh, we're also investing an additional $45 million in the Individual Placement and Support Program, um, which will now expand out to 50 sites across Australia. The IPS program uh, co-locates vocational and other support services with youth mental health services through the Headspace program. And it focuses on the need of young people, uh, making sure that we support them uh, either remaining in education or getting into employment uh, and making sure that the young people are accessing the services that they need to enable them to be able to do that. So by offering early support, we hope that we'll be able to set up these people for a lifetime. Senator Hughes, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. What is the government doing to support people with a disability that are employed within the Australian Public Service? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, we all know that a, do that a job is an absolute game changer in anybody's life, and it shouldn't be any different for somebody with a disability. Um, as a nation, we need to rise to the challenge of improving the employment outcomes for people with disability, and that starts with the Australian Public Service setting an example. Uh, so, the Australian Public Service um, currently uh, employs 4 per cent of people with disability, but I'm really pleased to say that the department of which um, I have the, uh, the pleasure of being the minister, uh, that figure sits at 6.8 per cent. And today, um, I'm pleased to announce that we've released the new Australian Public Service Employment Strategy to make employing people with a disability a mainstream activity in the culture of the Australian Public Service. And only this morning, I had the pleasure of meeting Nick and Gordon, two fantastic young men who work at Services Australia. And in speaking to their supervisors, they said that they are some of the best employees they have had, and their work is outstanding. Senator Wong. Thank you, Thank you Mr. President. On Monday. Oh, sorry, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. On Monday, the Minister said that as soon as the government became aware, and I quote, that the method of debt collection was not valid, we immediately ceased collecting funds. End quote. Can the Minister advise on what date the Morrison government first became aware? that the method of debt collection was not valid. The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President, and, and I thank um, Senator Wong for, for her question. Um, and just in the interest of being absolutely clear about what I said on Monday, and, and I, accept the, I accept the direct quote that Senator Wong has just read into the Hansard, but what I would say is what I said on Monday was that income averaging was deemed to not be a valid method by which to determine a debt. Um, and so we just need to be very clear that it was not what Senator Gallagher alleged that I had said, and that was that the income compliance program was not valid. So just to be absolutely clear. 
absolutely clear. Um, but um, Senator, Senator Wong, as, uh, as is always the case uh, in this place, um, we do not, uh, you know, it, and it's been the, the practice of, of everybody, whether it be the Labor governments or successive Liberal governments, that we do not provide details in relation to specific legal advice. However, I do stand by my statement. That, um, that as soon as we were made aware, we acted with great speed to make sure that Order. we did not continue to use Order. income averaging as the sole method by which we would determine debts. In fact, we made it very, very clear um, that we would um, make sure that we had further proof points uh, in determining um, if, uh, a debt, uh, if a debt was raised. And so that the, to ensure that the income compliance program um, was uh, collecting or was determining debts by a valid means, and as I subsequently went on to say during the week, uh, that we uh, am, have now this year um, proceeded to uh, repay the debts that were uh, that were generated through uh, income averaging as the sole means for collecting those debts. We have now gone through the process um, of repaying the majority Order. of the debts that were determined by that means. Senator Wong, a supplementary question. Supplementary question, and I refer to the minister's answer. I'm not seeking legal advice. The minister herself has made a public statement, including to this chamber, uh, that the method of debt collection was not valid. She herself has indicated that. I'm not going to the substance of legal advice. I am asking this government when you became aware of the method of debt collection being not valid. What was the date? Senator Rustin. Thank you very um, much, Mr President. Um, Senator Wong would be well aware that the matter that we are referring to is actually still before the court. And for me to come in here and to provide information not only um, about the legal advice but the dates when it was received. Um, however, what I can tell you is that, um, that um, last year uh, that we made a decision that we would, uh, we would include an additional uh, proof points to enable us to make sure the method by which da, uh, debts were calculated uh, was, within, was, was valid, and that was undertaken at that time. Senator Wong, a final supplementary question. Can the minister explain why this government ignored warnings over three years prior to late 2019 and at least 76 AAT decisions and continued with a method of debt collection which was not valid? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Well, I reject the premise of the question that Senator Wong just put to me, um, because as I have said in this place, when I became aware, or the government became aware, that the method of the income averaging as a method for determining uh, debts was not a valid means by which to uh, to determine those Order. debts, we changed the program to ensure that we did not continue to be collecting uh, to be determining debts by this invalid method. Um, however, when you go back to the comments in relation to the AAT, as I've said in this place this week on a number of occasions, Senator each and every case that goes before the AAT turns on the specific facts of that case. Um, there were cases before Order. the AAT uh, that were, were upheld, and there were also cases that went before the AAT. Sorry, that Senator were Canavan, on a point of order. Look, on a, on a point of order, Mr. President, um, and this has been happening all week. Um, I, I, it's hard to hear the answer to this question with Senator O'Neill's constant interjections. And I, I would like to be able to hear interjections equally. I can't hear Senator Keneally's interjections over Senator O'Neill's interjections. And I think it would only be Order, fair Senator if they Canavan. were given equal opportunity Senator to Canavan, interject thank you. on these Order. important questions. Order. Order. Senator, I'll, I'll take Senator Wong on this or another point of order, Senator Wong. On this, on point, this of point of order, Senator Wong. Uh, on this point of order, I would have hoped Senator Canavan might care a little more about the fact that this minister is entirely refusing to be accountable Senator Wong, to the that's chamber. not a point of order. That is not a point of order. Um, interjections, I will restate, are always disorderly, and I ask senators to allow their colleagues to hear the answers to questions so they may be debated after question time. <laughs> Senator Rustin, have you con continued? Uh, Senator Rustin has concluded her answer. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. 
Today, the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called on the world to make peace with nature and to address the climate emergency. He said, quote, the state of the planet is broken and humanity is waging a war on nature. Secretary General Guterres has called on nations to be more ambitious. The planet is already sick. The Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, meanwhile, is fiddling around with dates in the second half of the century to reduce carbon pollution to net zero. The goalposts have shifted. Net zero by 2050 is no longer enough. Does the Prime Minister know this? Does he understand that we need net zero by 2035 or earlier? And what is the Prime Minister doing to address this crisis and this war on nature? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, uh, thanks, Mr. President, and um, look, I, I thank Senator Hanson Young for the question. It is tempting to refer her to the answers that I've given during the course of the week to, uh, to Senator Waters, and, uh, and I forget which other Green senators have asked almost identical questions. I think Senator Faruqi uh, asked a very similar question. Senator Rice. So, Mr. President, let me again remind the Green senators. Uh, in relation to Australia's position that we have committed very clearly to the Paris Agreement, to reduction targets under the Paris Agreement, and to deliver those targets and indeed strive to exceed those targets as we have done in relation to our commitments under the Kyoto Protocols, Kyoto Protocols 1 and Kyoto Protocols 2. Our effort to date in terms of emissions reduction is real and world class in terms of the level of those emissions reductions. If you take examples of reductions between 2005 and 2018, Australia has achieved 13 per cent reduction in emissions. Compare that with others, Japan at 8 per cent, the United States at 10 per cent, New Zealand at 1 per cent, Canada at 0.1 per cent. Our emissions reduction activities have been clearly delivered, and our approach is to continue that. You asked about plans. Our approach is to continue to achieve those reductions through our investment in technology rather than the type of taxes or other mechanisms that the Greens, of course, would love to see applied. Our approach is to back technologies, to work with counterparts around the world, like the United States, in terms of investment in technologies along our tech roadmap, to build upon the partnerships we've struck in new technology areas like hydrogen with countries like Germany, like Japan, like Korea, to drive investment in those spaces and to achieve positive outcomes that continue that track record of Senator emissions reduction. Order. Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Well, it's this type of faffing around, lack of action, that the General Secretary calls is suicidal. That is the truth here. What is your government going to do? We need net zero well before 2050, and you don't even have a proper 2030 target. What are you going to do? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr. President, we're going to keep implementing the policies that have been driving down Australia's emissions already. I just outlined the extent to which Australia has been achieving real reductions in our emissions relative to 2005 levels compared with other countries not meeting the same scale of achievement by Australia. What are we going to do? Well, over the next decade, our government will invest $18 billion in low emissions technology. Out of that, we're going to leverage $50 billion worth of new investment. This is all about getting the technology points like hydrogen or carbon capture and storage or otherwise to the financial tipping point where they are not only used and adopted in Australia, but they're economically viable for other countries. Because you know what? We're not going to see transformation in terms of China's emissions or India's emissions or other countries' emissions without cost-effective technological solutions. That's why we're investing in it, to get solutions here that can also be adapted in other countries around the world to fix what Order. is actually Senator a global Birmingham, problem. Time for the answers expired. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Will the government cancel the surplus Kyoto credits, as countries like the UK, New Zealand and Germany have already done, or will you continue to, uh, so they cannot be used now or in the future, or will you continue to hide, to squander and to faff about while the planet burns? Senator Birmingham. Well, m m m Mr President, let, let, let me try to give a little bit of an explanation about why it is that Australia has surplus credits. Uh, yes, you know why we have surplus credits, Mr President? 
because when it's come, when it's come to the first Kyoto commitment period, we overachieved. We overachieved. We made a commitment to the world that we would reduce our emissions, Order. and we did so not only by the margin we promised, but by more than that. And that generated a surplus. And guess what's happened with the 2020 target, the second Kyoto commitment period? We made a commitment to the world again that we would reduce our emissions. And we met that commitment. And we overachieved. We overachieved for a second time. And so that is why Australia has carryover Order. credits. You know what other countries do? Other countries don't achieve the emissions reductions in their own country and go and buy credits from elsewhere around the world. We have achieved the reforms in Australia, overachieved. That's why those credits Order, exist. Senator Birmingham. Senator Order. Order. Senator Sheldon. Well, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Can the Minister confirm that Qantas has received more than a billion dollars in taxpayer funded support since the start of the COVID 19 pandemic? Including hundreds of millions of dollars of JobKeeper wage, sub wage subsidies. The Minister representing the Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Sheldon for the question. Senator Sheldon, what I can confirm is that we're in the middle of a global pandemic and that many industries across Australia have been hard hit. And I do acknowledge that the aviation sector in particular has been hard hit. And as a result of that, you are correct. The government has provided industries and employers with support, whether it's by way of JobKeeper or the plethora of other policies that we have put in place. I am also, like you, Senator Sheldon, and like my colleagues on the government side of the chamber, we are saddened with any job losses as a result of the global pandemic, and including those job losses that have recently been announced by Qantas. Without a doubt, without a doubt, it has been a tough year for the aviation sector. It has been a tough year and a long year. And in particular, as you know, Senator Sheldon, because of the fact, because of the fact that our international borders remain closed and our domestic borders are only now really reopening up, and they will continue to reopening, are we seeing more flights in the air? But, Senator Sheldon, our government, we have taken extensive action, as you know, to support the aviation sector to the extent possible, bearing in mind, bearing in mind the extent of the global pandemic. And in fact, Senator Sheldon, you would be aware that support to Australia's aviation industry now totals more than $2.7 billion. But, like any industry or in Australia and employers, you are right. We have, as a government, provided them Order, with Senator support. Cash. Senator Sheldon, a supplementary question. Despite receiving more than a billion dollars in taxpayer support, Qantas has outsourced a further 2,000 jobs does the government support this decision by Qantas? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Sheldon, again, the government's been very clear from day one. Any job lost as a result of COVID-19 is an absolute tragedy. Order. But this is a decision, as you know, it is a commercial decision for Qantas, and Qantas are entitled to make those decisions. But, as I've also already said, I have some statistics, Senator Sheldon, in relation to stand-ups and stand-downs. This actually shows the effect of the global pandemic on the aviation industry, but also what we're seeing. As borders reopen, aviation companies are able to bring, as you know, their staff order. back Senator on. Order. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, uh. Actually, the question related to outsourcing. I'd ask the uh, a commercial Order. decision. Okay. Um, have you concluded your answer, Senator Cash? Senator Sheldon, the final supplementary question. Since March, the government has allowed Virgin to fall into administration while giving Rex 
millions of dollars in untied grants, enabling them to expand their routes, given some aviation companies access to JobKeeper while abandoning others like Donata workers, and sat back while Qantas has sacked a further 2,000 workers. What does the minister have to say to the Qantas workers in the gallery and the building today who have lost their jobs? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Senator Sheldon, as I have said, as the Prime Minister said, as my colleagues have said, any job lost as a result of COVID-19 is absolutely devastating. The aviation industry has been hard hit as a result of COVID-19, and that is why the government has provided extensive support to the aviation sector after what I acknowledge has been a very long and a very tough and a very difficult year. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr President. My question is for Senator Payne, Minister for Foreign Affairs. Will a prisoner swap between Australia and Iran, as happened last week, start a new trend of Australia negotiating with terrorists, moving away from the proclaimed position of never negotiating with terrorists? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President, and I thank Senator Roberts uh, for his question. Last week, Australia uh, was able to welcome the return of Dr Carly Moore Gilbert uh, to Australia after more than two years in detention in Iran. These are deeply complex, uh, very difficult matters to deal with in any uh, international context and even further complicated by the impact of a global pandemic. Australia worked for many, many months across two years to secure the release of Dr Carly Moore Gilbert. And a range of diplomatic discussions and exchanges between international partners uh, are held at times such as this to pursue those matters. I will not go into further detail on those issues, but I am very pleased to be able to say to the Chamber that it is an enormous relief to have been able to welcome Dr Carly Moore Gilbert back yeah. to this country yeah. last week. Yeah. We know that Dr Moore Gilbert was imprisoned order. in Senator Iran. Order, Senator Roberts, on a point of order. Yeah, Senator. point of order, Mr President. I asked about the proclaimed position of never negotiating with terrorists. Um, Senator Roberts, you had a preamble, um, and the minister is being directly relevant to the question um, in addressing that part of the question as well. Senator Payne. Uh, thank you, um, Mr President. Uh, as I said, uh, we never accepted the charges upon which Dr Moore Gilbert was purported to have been uh, detained and ultimately sentenced, uh, convicted and sentenced. Uh, in that context, we continued our negotiations. We will not go into the nature of diplomatic discussions with other countries. Uh, our role is to protect the rights, the freedoms, the safety of our citizens in the national interest, uh, and that is our absolute focus. We consistently advocate in favour of the international rules-based order, and we fundamentally oppose coercive diplomacy in any of its forms. Senator Roberts, a supplementary question. We too are concerned about preserving the rights and freedoms of Australians, and with that in mind, if more Australians are taken as hostages again in future, how many more terrorists will Australia need to set free to gain their release? Senator Payne. Thank you, Mr President. We are very concerned about the use of arbitrary detention in a number of places around the world. We have engaged with international counterparts in relation to those matters, particularly uh, counterparts in the UN Human Rights Council uh, and in the United Nations context. I'm working closely with my Canadian counterpart in particular uh, on these issues. And it is always a matter of concern when Australians travel to countries where issues such as this uh, also are referred to in our travel advice explicitly and openly. Uh, we recommend strongly that Australians who seek to travel to such places, notwithstanding the fact that the current travel advice continues to be do not travel in the context of COVID-19, we recommend strongly that that travel advice is read uh, and observed. We 
form, the advice through Order. our consular and Senator crisis Payne. division, Senator. Senator Roberts, a supp final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Does this promotion of Australia's release of three terrorists in a hostage swap constitute providing support to a terrorist organisation, which may constitute an offence under Section 102.7 of the Criminal Code Act 1995? Senator Payne. No, it does not, and I reject the premise of Senator Roberts' question. Senator Mackenzie. Thank you very much, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Can the Minister please update the Senate on how the Morrison McCormick government's economic and health response to COVID 19 is supporting Australia's employment and economic the recovery? Minister representing the Treasurer, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Mackenzie for her question, and I know her concern for uh, Australians right across this country, city and metro and regional, uh, in terms of their health and economic well-being through what has been this most remarkable year around the world. And indeed, Australia has and continues to perform better than most other countries in terms of saving the lives of Australians and saving the jobs of Australians. It's been an incredibly tough year for many people across Australia and an even tougher one for many people across the rest of the world. But yesterday's national accounts have shown that in Australia, real GDP increased by 3.3 per cent, the largest quarterly increase since 1976. Of course, it came off the back of a significant decline in the previous quarter. However, when you look around the world, the decline Australia faced was less than most of the rest of the world, and the recovery is stronger than most of the rest of the world. And these are the defining factors. It is a work that is ongoing work. It is going to be a long road back for all countries around the world in terms of the recovery from here. But over the last five months, we've seen 650,000 jobs created, 344,000 of those filled by women, 226,000 filled by young Australians. We welcome this incredibly important progress in terms of getting Australians back to work and the decline in the effective unemployment rate from 14.9 per cent to 7.4 per cent. Our economic recovery plan outlined in the budget this year are programs to allow profitable businesses that are previously profitable for loss carrybacks, our investment deductions, our bring forward of tax cuts, our plans around home builder are all about the next stages of recovery over the months and years ahead to keep getting more Australians back into the workforce and to drive those numbers back to where they were in the past, Order. back into Senator the future. Birmingham. Senator McKenzie, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President, and thank you for that comprehensive answer, Minister. How has the government's record economic support through the COVID-19 pandemic protected Australians' livelihoods and kept Australians connected to jobs? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, $257 billion in economic support from the government, $130 billion of it already flowing into the pockets of households and businesses, has been crucial to maintaining and keeping business capability, businesses afloat and therefore, of course, Australians in as many jobs as possible. Programs like JobKeeper, the Job Seeker Supplement, the Cash Flow Boost to Businesses, the two $750 payments to millions of pensioners and others on income support. These have all been crucial support that have kept almost 3.8 million Australians connected to their employer. The Reserve Bank estimating at least 700,000 Australian jobs saved that would otherwise have potentially been lost without these types of programs in place. Our supporting apprentices and traineeships wage subsidy has helped over 57,000 small and medium businesses to save again around 100,000 apprentices and trainees to keep them in jobs. Crucial saving of jobs Order. throughout Senator this Birmingham. year. Senator McKenzie, a final supplementary question. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. As Australia enters a new phase of our COVID-19 recovery, how will our Liberal and Nationals government support Australians back into work, back into training and empower local communities, including in regional areas, to deliver tailored responses to our communities? Senator Birmingham. Mr President, so many of our programs have been supporting right across the economy and the country, but our local jobs program is putting 
boots on the ground across 25 regions targeting particular support uh, for employment, funding local jobs plans in collaboration with local stakeholders, employers and training organisations to help make sure the jobs growth in those sectors and regions is as strong as we are trying to drive right across the whole country. Our job maker hiring credit benefits right across the country, supporting 450,000 Australi young Australians back into work. Uh, boosting apprenticeship commencements, wage subsidy will help support the training of a new generation of 100,000 apprentices and trainees across Australia, but especially in regional and rural Australia, giving these apprenticeships and young Australians maximum opportunity to get a job in the regional areas, to stay in those regions, to contribute to their growth and their opportunity, and ultimately to generate even more jobs into Order, the future. Senator Birmingham. Senator McKim. Thank you, President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Senator, I refer to the generous offer from the New Zealand Prime Minister to resettle refugees and people seeking asylum who have been detained by your government on Manus Island and Nauru. After over seven years of misery, suffering and uncertainty for thousands of innocent people who have committed no crime, Will your government finally accept this kind offer from Prime Minister Ardern and give people the freedom and safety they so desperately need and deserve? And if not, why not? The Minister representing the Minister for Home Affairs, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, and Senator McKim, uh, you did mention uh, Nauru and Manus Island, and uh, just for your benefit, because clearly you've forgotten why uh, people are on Nauru and Manus Island. So just to, just, to, just to remind you, Senator McKim, it is because you supported the failed border protection policies of the former Labor government. You see, colleagues, when we came point into of order, Senator, um, Senator McKim on a point of order. Uh, well, predictably, it's relevance, President. And, and yes, the word Nauru was in my question, but uh, the history, the sordid and shameful history of Australia's offshore detention policies is not relevant in any way. Um, I order, I'll make the rulings if people don't mind. Um, on the point of order, a small amount of historic context is directly relevant. It would not be appropriate for it to form the bulk of the answer to the question, nor a substantive part of the answer to the question. But I think it is reasonable to have some historic context, but to be directly relevant, it must, direct, it must directly address a substantive part of the question. So you have reminded the Minister, Senator McKim, and I call the Minister to continue her answer. And thank you, Mr. President. And as I was saying, the only reason Senator McKim is able to ask his question today is because he supported the failed policies of the former Labor government. Senator McKim, in relation to though the New Zealand refugee resettlement offer, um, the Prime Minister and the Minister for Home Affairs have made it very clear. We appreciate the offer from the New Zealand government to resettle refugees. However, as you know, Senator McKim, we remain focused on completing the United States resettlement arrangement. You clearly know the answer. You're sitting there shaking your head. The US arrangement, Senator McKim, for your benefit, is actually progressing well. It is actually progressing well, with 876 refugees resettled to date and further departures expected in the coming weeks and months. Senator McKim, a supplementary question. Thank you, President. Minister, why is it that uh, your government insists that the US arrangement must run its course before engaging with the New Zealand government in response to their offer. Why must people wait longer than the seven and a half years that they have already been detained? Has your government not heard and does it not have the capacity to walk and chew gum at the same time? Senator Cash. Uh, well, unfortunately, Senator McKim, in answer to your question, and colleagues, I'm going to have to go to the R. The statement or the question by McKim, does your government have uh, the ability to walk and chew gum at the same time? Well, the answer is yes, Senator McKim, because clearly we showed that when we came into office and we actually stopped, we stopped the boats coming. Because you see, Senator McKim, you supported failed policies. And as such, when we came into government, we had to clean up the mess 
the mess that you created. Just let me remind you, Senator McKim, 50,000 people arriving on more than 800 boats, 1,200 lives. Senator Hanson Young will remember this well. 1,200 lives tragically lost at sea. Over 8,000 children were detained whilst Labor uh, were in office uh, in government. In, to, in July 2013, just to remind us, Senator McKim, 10,201 people in detention, including Senator McKim, Order. almost Senator Cash, 2,000 children. Time for the answer children. has expired. Senator McKim, a yes, final supplementary um, question. Thank goodness for that, uh, President. Um, Minister, I note the findings of the Australian Human Rights Commission's report released today, which notes grave concerns for the physical and mental health of the 100 and 96 refugees and people seeking asylum who were transferred to Australia from Papua New Guinea and Nauru for medical reasons. When will you finally give these people freedom and safety and end their prolonged and heartbreaking suffering? Senator Cash. Uh, well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, the Morrison government, we, are, we will never apologise for protect, protecting Australia's borders and restoring integrity to our borders. We will never apologise for that, Senator McKim. In relation to the report that you refer to, uh, you'd be aware that the Home Affairs Department has responded to it um, and has agreed with nine of the Commission's recommendations. But, Senator McKim, what you also, what you also failed uh, to advise the Senate was the Commission importantly notes that the reduction in the number of children in detention, uh, which peaked at almost 2,000 under those opposite, that, that the Commission actually acknowledges that reduction. Um, Mr President, this is also what Senator McKim has failed to tell the Senate. Um, overall, we've reduced the number of people in detention by 85 per cent, more than 10,000 under your alliance to just 1,500 now, and more than 70 per cent of those in detention, Senator McKim, have a criminal record. Senator Keneally. Thank you very much, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. On 18 September, the Prime Minister promised that 26,000 stranded Australians registered with his government at that time that they'd be home by Christmas. Can the Minister confirm that in the 76 days since the Prime Minister made that promise, only 14,000 people on that list have made it home? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and uh, thank you, Senator Keneally, for uh, the question. Mr President, uh, the challenges for many Australians overseas are well appreciated by the government. This is a very difficult time, and the impact of the pandemic uh, is not, as it would be easy to say or think, uh, past. It is, in fact, uh, a matter with which many countries around the world continue to grapple with at the most difficult level now. So the health and the safety of Australians abroad and at home has been the government's number one priority in these difficult and unprecedented times. We are very aware that many Australians face hardship overseas because of the global travel restrictions that are resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are helping vulnerable Australians, Mr President, by facilitating access to flights to Australia by providing financial assistance where required through the hardship program which uh, we announced some months ago, by continuing to provide a professional and responsive consular assistance to those in need. Since the National Cabinet meeting Mr. President, on 18 September, where the Prime Minister indicated that of the 26,000 uh, Australians uh, then overseas, we would endeavour to bring as many of those Australians back to Australia as we could, we have seen 40,800 Australians return from overseas, including more than 16,000 Australians registered with the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Of those, over 3,500 were described, uh, were uh, categorised uh, as vulnerable. Mr President, since uh, the government advised Australians to return, more than 432,000 Australians have returned Order. to Senator Australia. Payne. Senator Keneally, a supplementary question. Thank you. And I note the minister's response that 16,000 of the 26,000 have come home. Given that the Prime Minister has only got seven days for the 10,000 stranded Australians who were registered with DFAT on the 18th of September, 
to be with their families on Christmas Day. What hope do, the, do those 10,000 stranded Australians have that they'll be able to celebrate Christmas with their families in Australia? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And let me just clarify, Senator. I said that since uh, the National Cabinet on the 18th of September, over 40,800 have returned from overseas, including more than 16,000 Australians registered with DFAT. That is not necessarily specifically of the 26,200. There will be a component of the 26,200 plus others. Uh, I will get the senator. I will get the senator that uh, that other number. Mr. President, I know that Senator Keneally uh, and those opposite uh, have uh, been uh, discussing uh, these issues for some time. In fact, I understand Senator Keneally's uh, um, interview with Mr Fordham this morning uh, referred to this. And it is clear that the, uh, those opposite do understand the process of national caps uh, and the management of the quarantine and the number of arrivals that, that restricts us in dealing with in Australia. And we are working closely with the states and territories in relation to that, uh, Mr. President, because Order. we know Senator what happens Payne, when quarantine time for the goes answer wrong. Senator has expired. Senator Keneally, a final supplementary question. Thank you. Dave and Kate Jeffries have been stranded with their young son, son Mitchell, in Canada since their return flights were cancelled in March. They've had their travel plans disrupted and their flights cancelled multiple times. Will the Prime Minister deliver on his promise to the Jeffreys family to have them home by Christmas, or will he leave them behind? Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President. We are doing everything that we are able to do within the flights available, the quarantine places available within the CAPS, to bring as many Australians home as we can. Order. As many as we can. Order. And since that meeting on the 18th of September, 40,800 Australians have returned from overseas. I very much hope, Mr President, that families such as the one that Senator Keneally has referred to are able to do that within, and we will continue to provide them with appropriate consular support through this process, because it is a very difficult situation, Mr President. We are dealing with, as I have remarked before and as I know others have remarked, a global pandemic which has impacted our ability to, re to return Australians from overseas. It's impacted by flights, it's impacted by quarantine space. We have opened Howard Springs. We have, have accommodated 500 Australians in How uh, Order. returning Australians Senator Payne, in Howard time Springs for the as part of that expired. process. Senator Bragg. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Can the minister please update the Senate on a global search for a COVID-19 vaccine and how it will impact Australia's health response? The minister representing the Minister for Health, Senator Cash. Uh, thank you, Mr President, and I thank Senator Bragg for the question. And, uh, I'm pleased to obviously update the Senate that the uh, Morrison government welcomes the emergency approval given to the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine in the United Kingdom. Uh, this is particularly so given the over 1.6 million cases and the tragic loss of over 59,000 lives in the United Kingdom. Uh, this emergency approval is not a full public authorisation. However, it does allow the United Kingdom government to deploy the vaccine as quickly as possible to specific groups of patients, such as frontline uh, healthcare workers, people over the age of 80 and aged care residents. This emergency authorisation is in response to the very high disease load in the United Kingdom at present. Uh, it is understood that the emergency use authorisation, the vaccine, uh, will not be generally available to the wider United Kingdom population. Uh, in terms of Australia, Pfizer continues to work with the Australian Therapeutic Goods Administration, providing data for safety and efficacy as part of the approval process. Uh, our advice remains that the timeline for a decision on approval is expected by the end of January 2021, and our planning is for the first vaccine delivery in March 2021. Pfizer, of course, is one of four vaccines the Australian government has purchased for a total projected supply of around 134.8 million units. Uh, in addition, we will have access to up to 25.5 million units under the international COVAX facility. Safety is, of course, though, Mr. President, uh, our number one priority, and Australia is well placed both for a thorough but rapid safety assessment 
and early rollout of a free, voluntary but universally available COVID-19 vaccine program. Senator Bragg, a supplementary question. Should a vaccine Order. prove safe and effective, how has the government's vaccine strategy positioned Australia to roll out a vaccine in 2021? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, the Morrison government has made a $3.2 billion investment in advance purchasing agreements with four vaccine manufacturers, AstraZeneca, CSL, Pfizer and Novavax. We have contracted for, as I have already stated, uh, around 134 million vaccines directly, in addition to another 25 million units of vaccine through the International COVAX facility. This means Australia has secured enough supply to vaccinate Australia many times over, subject to success and approvals. Our medical experts have identified the class of vaccines that we need. The vaccines we have secured amongst the most advanced, and it is increasingly likely that all of our contracted vaccines are on the pathway to being successful, safe and effective. Australia actually has high vaccination rates. Uh, with over 94 per cent of Australian five-year-olds being vaccinated each quarter this year. Order. Australia, Mr Senator President, Cash. Senator well Bragg, positioned. a final supplementary question. Thank you. How will these investments continue to support Australia's unique response to the COVID-19 pandemic, and how is Australia positioned compared to other countries to face the challenges of COVID-19? Senator Cash. Uh, well, Mr. President, more than $18.5 billion has been committed to support the emergency COVID-19 health response to the pandemic. Uh, when we do look at, though, the situation here in Australia, compared to other nations, uh, we are performing remarkably well. Just in terms of a global update, uh, there have been over 63 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 globally, and over 1.4 million deaths in total in Australia. We've had 27,923 confirmed cases uh, and, sadly, 908 deaths. Uh, whilst we can never be complacent, the systems we have in place have resulted in lower loss of life, lower transmission rates and lower economic impacts than in most other countries. Senator Green. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Youth, Senator Colbeck. How many young Australians are unemployed? The Minister for Youth and Sport, Senator, uh, Minister for Youth, Senator Colbeck. Thank, thank you, Mr. President. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the youth unemployment rate is too too high at the moment, at 15.6 per cent, Mr. President. And and so, Mr. President, as uh, we have done through the uh, budget process through the period of COVID-19, Mr. President, uh, we have put in significant measures. Mr. President, we have put in significant me measures to support to support young Australians. In fact, Mr. President, uh, it's, it's interesting that the Labor the Labor Party were a few, only a few weeks ago criticising the government for the range of measures that we have put in place to support young Australians to get back into work as the government and, and, and as the economy recovers from COVID-19, Mr. President. So significant order. resources. Senator being Colbeck. I have Senator Wong on, or Senator Green on a point of order. Uh, point of order, Mr. President. Um, my question didn't have a preamble, and it was uh, directed at how many young Australians are unemployed. Uh, that's a question about a figure, not a rate of unemployment. Uh, with respect, I don't think it's within the, my ability to um, decree that a rate is not directly relevant. Um, there's a, a time to debate questions. The minister, the minister is entitled to. Order. The minister is entitled to answer in that form, and it was a very specific question. And I will maintain uh, a tight test of direct relevance because of that. As long as the minister is talking about youth unemployment, I do think that is directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Mr. President, and, and, and I believe I was being directly relevant to the question because I actually quoted the youth unemployment rate of 15.6 per cent, Mr. President, as part of my response to the question. Uh, Mr. President, uh, and, I, and I've also said that the youth unemployment rate in this country is too high, and, and the work that this government continues to do to support young Australians to, to, uh, to get back into work, because we are concerned that young people who stay out of work too long have significant lifelong effects. 
Thank with respect right. to uh, their futures, their career, their financial circumstances. So, Mr. President, so we have made through our budget processes and through the pandemic, in supporting people with uh, JobKeeper, in supporting young people with JobSeeker to keep them in, connected to their workplaces, and then to support them to gain new jobs through our job maker programs, uh, our su Senator, apprenticeship support Senator programs, Colbeck, Mr. President. Senator Wong, on a point of order. Uh, direct relevance. The minister has been asked for the number. I understand he's now being given the brief. Perhaps you could advise the chamber. As I said before, Senator Wong, I think answering in this form, I cannot say that is not directly relevant to the question. What I'm being asked to do is to rule on the substance of an answer, which I cannot do. While the minister is talking about issues directly related to youth unemployment, I do think that is directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. And so this government will continue to do everything that it can to get the 337,200 young Australians who are unemployed back into work, and we'll continue to do that. Order, Senator. Senator Green, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. I do have a supplementary, but I can assist the minister. The latest ABS data reveals that 337,000 young Australians are unemployed. How many of these? How Order. Order. How Sorry, oh, Senator, sorry gonna... order. Senator, Senator, Senator's on my right. Senator Wong, one of your colleagues is asking the question. I heard multiple colleagues on my right. Is one of your colleagues answering, asking the question? After you read out the number, could you? I'll let you continue the question if you could go, start from after you read the number again, Senator Green. How many of these young Australians are unemployed today as a result of the Morrison government's deliberate decision to exclude them from JobKeeper? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, this, this government has worked assiduously through COVID-19, through the development and the implementation of JobKeeper, through the development and the implementation of JobSeeker, to assist young Australians to uh, stay in work where they can, connected to their jobs, to support them through the COVID-19 pandemic. And Mr. President, unfortunately, the youth unemployment rate over the, the last period has increased. Uh, that's why we put in place measures, Mr. President, to assist young people to get work, to, us, to attract young people, to attract employers, to employ young people in apprenticeships, Mr. President. And only. In the last sitting fortnight, Mr. President, the opposition were criticising us for focusing on young people and employment as a part of our budgetary strategy, Mr. President. But we will continue to do that because we know the negative effects on young Australians if they stay out of work too long. We will continue to support them into new jobs Order, and, Senator and Colbeck. assist the Senator Green, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. 337,000 young Australians are unemployed and more are expected to join them in the coming months. How long will it take for youth unemployment to return to pre-crisis levels? Senator Colbeck. Mr. Mr President, as the economy continues to grow off the back of the, the release of the border lockdowns that have been occurring, we saw a 3.3 per cent growth in in the economy over the in the recent figures that came came forward last week, Mr. President, more people will go back into work, and they will continue to be encouraged to do by the measures put in place by this government, Mr. President, unashamedly put in place by this government, Mr. President, measures that the opposition has criticised us for, measures that the opposition have opposed in this place, Mr. President, the youth measures that we put in place, criticised by the opposition. Uh, opposed in this place by the, the opposition, Mr. President, uh, but we are proud to support younger Australians and employers of young Australians to bring young people back to work. Senator Birmingham, I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper, please. All yours. Ah, Senator Sheldon. Could I, I rise to take note of the answer given by Senator Cash to the question I asked. Yesterday's national account figures are nothing to crow about. Our GDP is nowhere close to where it was a year, year ago. Investment is down. Consumption is still down. 
Wages still stagnant. The Labor share of income has fallen to record lows. And there are still 2.4 million Australians either unemployed or underemployed. And the Morrison government is out congratulating themselves. And while millions of Australians are still hurting, the jobless queues are growing. And nothing has been done about the challenges of insecure work and underemployment. It is clear for many Australians what looks like a recovery on paper will still look like a recession. Just ask the 2,000 newly outsourced workers at Qantas. 2,000 Australian men and women with families right across Australia now without work because of the heartless decisions of the Qantas board under the government's watch and the government's subsidies. Only a few hours ago, I stood with Qantas worker, workers like Sean. Sean works for Qantas as a ground crew at Canberra Airport and he has a wife and three daughters, three young daughters. He said, how am I to tell my three girls that you can work hard, but you can be replaced by a company that will pay people less? And this is happening on your watch, the government's watch, and with Australian taxpayers' money. No accountability, no control, no responsibility to these companies and their actions that they're taking. You are abandoning hard-working Australians. Is this the economy that we want in Australia? These are jobs that will be go to the lowest common denominator, to companies who pay the lowest wages, jobs that will go to companies with lower conditions. The workers at Qantas will have to beg for their old jobs at lower rates and lower conditions. Because why? Because of Alan Joyce, the CEO's corporate bastardry, doesn't care about the workers that made the company the spirit of Australia. This is quite obviously not the Australian way. But if losing your job as an outsourced company isn't enough of a kick in the teeth, Alan Joyce and the board of Qantas have done this plan with the implicit backing of the government. Qantas has received more than $800 million in government support in tax relief and JobKeeper payments. All of it taxpayer money. Much of it the taxes of many of thousands of Qantas workers to keep the airline alive, to keep it flying, to keep these jobs secure. Instead, when Alan Joyce and the board chose to abandon these workers, they did so taking Morrison's money and running for it. They did it with a Prime Minister not saying a word. The Prime Minister and the government have abandoned these workers to lower pay and lower conditions, all the while patting themselves on the back that we are technically out of a recession. The government is crowing about comeback. Well, these Cirque Qantas workers want a comeback too. They want to come back to their jobs at the same rates and conditions they worked hard to earn. The road to economy, to a better economy, and recovery is getting longer and longer every day that the Morrison government ignores the catastrophe in the aviation industry. First, they let Virgin fail, leaving thousands of workers without jobs and the corporate raiders to pick through the scraps. Then they abandoned the workers at Donata, retrospectively denying them JobKeeper with a cruel stroke of a pen. A mistake that the Treasurer could fix this afternoon with just another stroke of that pen. And now the workers of Qantas, more than 2,000 everyday hard-working Australians, abandoned by this government. Only a few weeks ago, this chamber passed a motion calling on Alan Joyce and Qantas to stop this madness. And of course, did they listen or did they care? No. Is this the future economy in Australia? One where businesses take from the public purse in one hand and with the other sign away thousands of jobs without a thought to the cost to their workforce and fellow Australians. And the government turns a blind eye to a blatant act of corporate bastardry. Thank you, Senator Sheldon. Senator Stoker. Thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. And can I start 
with a tone that is a little bit different to what we often employ in this chamber during Take Note, often a time for uh, theatrics and drama and witty slurs across the chamber. I, so speaking of slurs, um, Senator Sheldon's given us a fine example of precisely the kind of behaviour that isn't appropriate when we're talking about the families and who are, who are suffering the consequences of a commercial decision that Qantas has taken in relation to making staff redundant. Now, it's important, um, and I notice that Senator Sheldon is walking out of the room in, in a debate Stoker. that he, he pretends. Or, he pretends Stoker, may I remind you that during this time of remote participation, the president did ask senators not to reference whether particular senators were in the room or not. Right. Well, um, perhaps I will instead frame it this way. While I was willing to give Senator Sheldon the respect of listening to his contribution, I hope he will listen as um, sincerely and in the heartfelt fashion um, that this important issue deserves. I've got my doubts, but nevertheless, any job lost is a disaster. It's a disaster for the people involved and it's a disaster for us here in the coalition. And it's part of the reason that the Morrison government has put so much effort and so much of the public's resources into trying to keep businesses strong so that they can keep on their staff. And whether we talk about the cash flow boost, whether we talk about JobKeeper, whether we talk about the instant asset write-off, whether we're talking about programs like Home Builder or JobMaker, we are trying to make it as easy as possible for people to keep working people in work. We know that when businesses are strong, they can keep their staff on, and that gives the certainty families need to get through this time of uncertainty. I understand that anxiety. We all do. That's why our every effort is going into building that economic strength and resilience. But the difficulty I have with the arguments made by Senator Sheldon just a moment ago is that it takes a small piece of the puzzle and ignores all of the other interconnected parts that go into whether or not a business is able to keep staff on. And he's happy to talk about how we must at all times have rising wages. And he's happy to talk about how we must at all times have all people in secure work. All wonderful goals. But if we don't look at the context in which that occurs, it's actually pretty ignorant. In circumstances where those opposite have fought tooth and nail for zero flexibility in the workplace, they have fought tooth and nail to deny businesses the chance they need to be able to move people around or change the way they do things, shift people into different skill sets to try and get through hard times and emerge stronger, more able to offer the kind of high wages and security that is desirable, when they've stood in the way of those important measures every day that they have served in this parliament, going back decades. Uh, the issue of industrial relations is one that gets nothing but obstinacy from those opposite. Well, they need to confront a really uncomfortable truth, and that is that by their very obstinacy, their very refusal to countenance any kind of flexibility at any time, it is those very policies that tend to sign the redundancy papers for good people who deserve jobs. Because the fact is, businesses need to be able to adapt to difficult times, and this is one of them. The failure to adapt, the failure to provide a business that's struggling to cope with it with the ability to shift gears to survive hard times, that is what ends the opportunity for vulnerable people like those who are in the gallery to keep on in their jobs. And so instead of standing here and grandstanding, Senator Sheldon and his colleagues should apologise to the Qantas workers who have been let down by inflexible and unreasonable industrial relations attitudes from those opposite. And I call upon those opposite to get into um, to get into a mental space where they confront the reality of this difficult market for aviation, the difficult market we all face in COVID, 
and start to take a Team Australia approach because the prospects of business survival are actually compatible with the positive prospects of working people. Thank you, Senator Stoker. Senator Stirl. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. Well, I've got to tell you, I've heard some uh, contributions in this joint that was one of the worst. And I'll tell you why, Senator Stoker. No, seriously, before you start slurring this side of the chamber, I'll throw a challenge out to you, through you, if I may. How many enterprise agreements I've negotiated over the years? How many negotiations I entered into as not only a delegate as a long distance owner driver, but also as a union organiser in 28 years on the job? How many men or grown men, Senator Stoker, have you had in your office on Friday night bursting into tears when they found their job go down the road? So how dare you? How dare you use that language? How dare you try to mislead those that may be listening or reading and the Qantas workers that this side of the chamber need to apologise for standing up for working men and women? That is one of the worst contributions, and I will debate you in every city, every town, every yard, every shop floor in this nation. You will not win. You will not win. You are so mischievous Order. the way you dare try and insinuate that the Qantas workers' wages was the reason they got the big A. Why, well, they didn't even get a meeting or a letter. You know how they got the sack? Are you aware, Senator Stoker, because you're so well informed? No, you've Senator got no Stirl, idea. Senator I just remind you to make your uh, remarks to the chair. Thank sure, you. And through I the chair. Other senators Do that you know? You have no idea. They got an SMS. Now, before we start talking about the disgraceful rates of pay that Qantas workers demand, they were negotiated over the years. They were negotiated by the workers on one side, represented by their unions, and by management on the other side. You know why? Because I've been in the room for a number of them. Qantas EBA Mark III, Qantas EBA Mark IV. They weren't, there, there was no gun to their head, Qantas. They did it. But you see, Senator Stoker, you need to understand, these jobs are still there. Your government has thrown taxpayers' dollars out like confetti to Qantas, $800 million for JobKeeper, over a billion dollars all up. Your government, and you know what Qantas are doing? They're giving this. Oh, I nearly did that. I won't do that. Sorry, Chair. They're giving you this, right? This is what they're saying to you. Thank you very much. Because we're not only going to get rid of the workers, we want their jobs to come back with uh, companies that will pay not even Australian standards. They won't pay the superannuation guarantee charges that we are seeking. They will fight like hell. And you make it sound like Qantas are going broke. Guess what, Senator Stoker? And I'm not allowed to say this as she walks out the chamber. Ah, oh, you hypocrite. What hypocrisy. You couldn't wait Senator to bag Stirl, out other senators. Senator Stirl, it is not I okay to wait. take no, poetic licence. So I'm just, sorry, Madam Deputy okay, President. But hypocrisy really, you know, rank hypocrisy with me really gives me a nut in the guts. And there's a classic example. Now, Qantas, Madam Deputy President, have actually said they're going to be in the black in two months. So what does it take to get through the head of that side of chamber? Qantas have used a pandemic for the opportunity to outsource jobs that are there and will be there as the borders come down and we kick in. And you watch all the flights come on the screens next week. You watch all the flights coming for Christmas. And dare I may ask, check how much it cost all of us to get here to Canberra, because we all probably came on Qantas, I don't, unless the ones that drove. Check the prices that Qantas are charging us to go home. Make no mistake about that. They're having a ball. They can't help it. They're rubbing their greedy hands together. They won't have any skin left. But I've got to tell you, my disdain for Mr Joyce, Madam Deputy President, is not a secret in this place. I've had many, and you were at one of my inquiries when, we, when he shut down the airline. Oh, remember that magnificent piece of bastardry for the Australian, not only the Australian travellers, worldwide Aussies trying to get home. Oh, we forgot about that. But he's got eight other accomplices. He's ably backed up, and I am calling for their, this mob must resign. Joyce must lead the charge and resign because there's no guts on that side. The Prime Minister's lacking guts. He's too busy flicking money with his hand in hand with uh, uh, Mr McCormack for their mates at Rex. But I'll tell you what, what about Richard Goiter, the chairman? Why should he escape scrutiny while he's on his $584,000 of Qantas's money? Qantas's money, not earned by the greedy board, 
by the 30,000, Madam Deputy President, you used to represent Qantas workers, and your great union has stood up for Qantas workers for many, many years. And you know the negotiations we've had. $584,000. Goiter, Mr Goiter did not make Qantas great. The workers made it great, but he couldn't wait to get his claws into the till, ably backed up, as I said, by Mr Joyce. Maxine Brenner for her $364,000. Jacqueline Hay, her $211,000. Belinda Hutchinson, and she gets an AC, I don't know what for, $283,000. Michael Lestrange, there's another set of initials and in AO, $223,000. Todd Sampson, that's the last time I'll ever watch him on TV. What a, hip, what, a, what a state of hypocrisy that fellow shows. And there's Anthony Tyler, Barbara Ward, and Paul Rayner. What a terrible, terrible situation. 2,000 families going into thank Christmas. Thank you, Senator Searle. Your time has expired. Senator Rennick. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. And um, I would like to continue uh, the remarks there of. Senator Stirl, because he's, he was right in, in the uh, conclusion of his uh, take note speech that he actually started to point the finger in the right direction, and that is the Qantas board. Now, he mentioned a name there that didn't probably get enough prominence, but I'll, I'll, I will bring that name to attention because I think it needs to be mentioned. Uh, this uh, 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 Miss uh, Barbara Ward, uh, who just happened to be a senior ministerial advisor to wait, wait for it. Who was she a senior ministerial adviser to? Former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Former Prime Minister Paul Keating. Now I wonder if I wonder if this is her 30 pieces of silver for privatising Qantas. Because that's the thing here. And I've, I've been consistent about this. I, I talked about privatisation wasn't the right thing to do in my maiden speech. So you can't call me being hypo, uh, uh, hypocritical about this, right? But you know, the privatisation of Qantas was facilitated by superannuation and the industry funds who wanted to privatise everything so that the Labor Party and the unions could get control of industry. Well, guess what? You've got your people on the boards now, and one of them just happened to be a senior ministerial adviser to Paul Keating. Now, if you want to take it out now, I'm, you know, I'm not, you know, I, I, you know, I don't want to start going into it, but you know, at the end of the day, Alan Joyce is there at the behest of the shareholders and of the board. Now, I did have a look at the top 20 shareholders, and unfortunately they're all nominee holdings, which I'm working on because it really annoys me that I can't see who owns what. Um, but I'm keen to actually, if you're keen on this, Senator Stirl, I'd be keen to find out who are the biggest 20 shareholders in the real names, not nominee accounts. But I suspect if you were to drill down into who the shareholders of Qantas are, I suspect a large deal of them would be industry super funds. I'm not having to go here, but seriously, if you want to do something about this in a constructive manner, um, I, I suggest that you find out which industry funds own Qantas. Uh, yeah, I'm talking about jobs. I'm getting on to jobs, right? So if, if you want to do this, and you, you, know, you, you guys now have got control of industry through your industry super funds, you need to speak directly to the uh, industry funds. Because that, as government now, we no longer own we no long, longer own Qantas. And I spoke about this in my maiden speech. There is no accountability. Okay? Who can the people be accountable to if infrastructure is sold? Okay? Because you can't sit there because it was the Labor Party that sold Qantas. It was the Labor Party that sold Qantas. And to be fair, and I've got a lot of time for you, Senator Stirl and, and uh, Senator Gallagher, um, it's a bit Rich to come in here and have it a go at us because we've been trying to help people get through the COVID crisis. Okay, now you know we drew a line in the sand because we didn't want to subsidise uh, foreign-owned companies. Um, and you know, look, I, I've been actively trying to get Qantas to relocate to Queensland so that it's cheaper. The costs are cheaper. It's cheaper to live in Queensland. You know, it was started in Queensland. It's not the New South Wales and Northern Territory Air Service. It's the Queensland. And Northern Terri Territory Air Service. And the first time I met Alan Joyce, I said, When are you taking Qantas back home? Because that's where it belongs. And let me tell you, if it's back in Queensland, it'll be a lot cheaper to run. It'll be a lot cheaper to run. And we should also bring home QBE as well. Um, so I, 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 I totally empathise with the fact that these workers have been outsourced. I hate outsourcing. And if you actually read uh, chapter 12 of Machiavelli's The Prince, it says never outsource, never use mercenaries, never use auxiliaries. And I've always subscribe to that. My own work experience, whenever we outsource, it always ended up uh, in a terrible situation. However, what, what I will rebut in this take note is the fact that the government doesn't care about the welfare of working-class Australians, of working-class Australians. And that is why today 
We stood up and we were happily to, happy to push back on what Labor seemed to think we shouldn't count those carbon credits that were earned fair and square, fair and square by the Australian workers, particularly the agricultural sector and particularly South West Queensland, who, as I mentioned yesterday, is doing it tough because we're locking up mulga paddocks. And I'll tell you what, your old mate Barry O'Sullivan would be you know, uh, choking on his soup if he knew that you know, we were, what we were doing to great towns like Charleville and Corpy and Longreach. You know, the home, Longreach, I should add, the home of Qantas. Um, so before we get, you know, start argy barging for the sake of argy barging, I'd just ask to reflect on this. Someone owns, those, uh, owns Qantas. Go to the shareholders, go to the people who control the company, control the board. And I agree with you on Todd Sampson. I've got no idea what he's doing here. I don't know how this bloke got on there. Um, uh, and, and let's try and find a solution together. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rennick. Senator Green. Thank you. Uh, today I got the chance to meet with Qantas workers uh, here in Parliament House, and um, I asked them about what they usually do for Christmas. They um, are going to have a very different Christmas this year. Uh, usually on Christmas Day they go to work. They go to work so that other people can get home, see their families, spend Christmas with their families. But this Christmas they are looking down the barrel of losing the jobs that they have had for decades. They found out that they would be losing their jobs through an SMS, a TV screen came up with an automated message and told them that a decision had been made not to cut their job because the work didn't need to be done anymore, but to outsource their job to another company, to another worker. And I asked them, was there someone there to take your questions, to listen to you, to talk about these concerns, to tell you why this decision had been made? And there wasn't. There wasn't anyone at that company that was willing to stand up and listen to the concerns of workers. They left the room. So that's why we're here today talking about this decision and talking about it in reference to the decisions that the federal government has made in regards to the aviation sector. Because nobody here is denying that the aviation sector has had a difficult time through this pandemic. Nobody is denying that. Nobody is denying that. And Labor senators on this side of the chamber have been in here since the start of this pandemic, calling for support from this government for our aviation sector. But what we are saying is that if you are going to deliver $800 million of taxpayer funding to a company, to Qantas, then why would you give that money with no strings attached? Why would you just hand over this amount of support, the support that was greatly needed to make sure that people could continue to travel and that those jobs could be saved? Why would you do that and make that decision without telling workers that this funding would save their job? because it hasn't. All of this support that this company has taken from the federal government with no strings attached. Because what we know is that these jobs are being outsourced. They are not being cut. The company has made a decision to make these jobs less secure, to make sure that these people can't unionise, don't have annual leave, probably won't know even when their shifts are, They've had 10 years of loyal service to a company, and let's face it, to Australians, because they have been the ones getting you home when you need to go home for Christmas, making sure that you can spend time with your family, getting you there safely, getting you there safely because these workers care about safety. But this outsourcing decision will make sure that the people who stand up for safe conditions at aviation won't have the same job security that they have at Qantas. So yes, we are asking the government, is that acceptable? Do you support that decision? And they can't say that they do. They couldn't possibly say that they do, because if they did, they would have to admit that they gave this, this company billions, hundreds, $800 million of support, of support without thinking to attach a condition 
that this company didn't outsource jobs, didn't outsource jobs. And I just want to make sure that those opposite, because they crow a lot about supporting regional jobs, that they know that this decision will result in 50 jobs being cut from the Cairns Airport in regional Queensland. 50 jobs from an, ec from an economy, from a community that has already suffered enough. Already suffered enough. These jobs will become more insecure. And this comes after previous, previous redundancies resulted in about 90 jobs being lost from the Cairns Airport. As I said, no one is denying that this has been a difficult time. But when these, when these uh, workers come here and when they rally outside MPs' office, all they've got is basic denials that this government is prepared to do the tough thing and the hard thing to stand up for their jobs. That's Thank all you, they're Senator asking Green, you to do. Thank you, Senator Green. Your time has expired. So the question is that the motion as moved by Senator Sheldon to take note of answers be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I rise uh, to take note of the answers from uh, Senator Birmingham, uh, representing the Prime Minister in this place today. Uh, the answers that uh, he attempted to give in relation to my questions. Of course, today uh, we've seen the Secretary General, uh, Antonio, uh, Antonio De Ke Sorry. Today we've seen from the Secretary General of the UN, Antonio Guterres, a very dear and very sobering warning of the situation that the world faces right now. The Secretary General Guterres has told the world that we need to lift our ambition urgently, quickly and seriously if we are to tackle the collapse of biodiversity and the collapse of the climate before things really do get too late. He says that this is an epic policy test, but that ultimately this is a moral test. He says that if we continue with the denial that action does not need to be taken urgently, that we can push things off to the latter half of this century, that we are risking suicide that it would be suicidal to continue to deny the actions science tells us we need to take. Secretary Guterres has called for countries to take more action and be more ambitious in relation to our 2030 uh, emission reduction targets. He's called on us to do whatever we can to make sure we meet net zero emissions. And rather than going with a 2050 target, it's quite clear that if we are to tackle the climate crisis, the extinction crisis and the death of this planet, we have to bring forward that target to much, much earlier. The goalposts have shifted. Debating about whether 2050 is the appropriate time frame for net zero emissions, we've missed the boat. We have to make that decision much, much earlier. It needs to be at least 2035, if not earlier. And yet we've got our government here refusing to engage in a proper strategy and the action to reduce our pollution, to help address the climate crisis in the timeframes that we have left. We have 10 years to take action. The UN's dire warnings today should not simply be dismissed. And in fact, what we're seeing now is that countries right around the world are focusing their minds, sharpening their action and are forcing countries like Australia to justify our ignorance. There is nowhere left to hide. We have just had, of course, the very clear message sent from President-elect Biden that we need to come to the UN conference next year in Glasgow with a much more ambitious Attempt, commitment 
and action to tackle climate change, to reduce carbon pollution. We now have the head of the UN saying that if we don't do this, we risk the death of the planet. He says that the state of the planet is broken. He talks about the impact on food security, on conflict, that it is now climate change that is not just risking the health of our environment, more extreme weather, an expansion of deserts and the choking of our oceans, but that it is going to be climate change that is the biggest driver of conflict around the world, displacement of people and the conflict that flows from that. I asked the minister representing the Prime Minister whether this government understands how dire this situation is. I asked the Prime Minister, through Senator Birmingham, whether he understood that we needed to get to net zero emissions by at least 2035. I asked the Prime Minister through Senator Birmingham whether we were going to improve our action to, towards 2030 and have a more ambitious target. And I asked the Prime Minister through Senator Birmingham whether the government would rule out using Kyoto carryover credits. On all three of those questions, the minister refused to answer. And why? Is it just ignorance? Is it because they're too busy faffing about, they don't understand their own policy? Or are they just hoping that if they continue to turn a blind eye to the facts, that the crisis will somehow disappear? We need climate reality Thank from you, this Senator government, Hatsinian. and all we've got time is climate. Expired. So the question is that the motion to take note of answers as moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against, I believe the ayes have it. Senator Patrick. Thank you, um, um, Madam Deputy President. I seek leave to lodge a late notice of motion. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, we will now move to the tabling and consideration of committee reports and government responses. Uh, Senator McGrath. Thank you. I present additional information received by the Finance and Public Administration Legislation Committee relating to estimates. Thank you. On behalf of the Chair of the Community Affairs Legislation Committee, Senator Askew, I present additional information received by the committee on its inquiry into the revisions of the Social Security Administration Amendment Continuation of Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. Thank you, thank Senator you. McGrath. Senator McCarthy. Uh, thank you, Madam uh, Deputy President. I wish to take note of uh, the committee's report. Mm -hmm. The cashless welfare card, and I don't think there is another issue that so clearly demonstrates this government's agenda to demonise, penalise and brutalise people who find themselves relying on our social safety nets. It is a terrible policy, a devastating policy, and one that has, through numerous inquiries, seen no evidence to suggest that this is the direction our country should continue to go. For the people of the Northern Territory, whom I represent here in the Senate, there has been overwhelming evidence that they certainly do not wish to be a part of the cashless debit cards at trials or permanent situation. The people of the Northern Territory have had the 2007 intervention upon them, which brought the basics card and forced compulsory income management on every single family who lived in over 70 uh, communities that were identified by the Commonwealth as areas that they should intervene on. 
Those families, their children and, for some, their grandchildren have grown up under this system over the last 13 years of income management. We have heard certainly uh, some comments around uh, whether there is extra food on the table. But can I just remind the Senate that we have had a COVID-19 pandemic which has seen the increase of funds to families across Australia. And guess what? That too puts food on the table. The real issue here, though, goes far deeper. The real issue here is the focus on a particular race here in the Northern Territory. And I cannot stand more passionately against such racist intervention, such a deliberate attempt to continue to disempower some of the most vulnerable families without encouraging them to empower themselves to rise above their particular situation. It is not good enough to say that family over there who live in a remote or regional part of Australia should have their monies, their choices determined by this parliament in such a way where they feel they have no chance to rise above their own situations and to grow, just as any other Australians do, in determining their own future, their own livelihoods and the livelihoods of their children. The Australian government is considering the best possible ways to support people, families and communities in places where high levels of welfare dependence coexist with high levels of social harm. The cashless debit card is testing whether reducing the amount of cash available in a community will reduce the overall harm caused by welfare-fuelled alcohol, gambling and drug misuse. It is pretty clear, Madam Deputy President, the CDC has failed that test. By any measure, it is exacerbating harm and hardship, and the efficacy of the cashless debit card and income management more generally has been the subject of several inquiries, as I have mentioned. And these investigations have not found evidence of the effectiveness of these policies. In fact, significant harm has been associated with compulsory, broad-based income management. An independent analysis of the cashless card in Sejuna, conducted by the University of South Australia, concluded that the CDC policy has had no substantive effect on the available measures for the targeted behaviours of gambling or intoxicant abuse. Now, isn't it incumbent on us as political leaders, and in particular this government, to listen to its own reviews of its own policies, and yet on this particular occasion, a near $2.5 million review into the evaluation of the trial sites across uh, four jurisdictions or three jurisdictions with two trial sites in one, that evaluation was not even read by this minister. Not even read. And not even the department that she is responsible for could tell us the certainty of that report. However, however, all of that aside, the minister still introduced this piece of legislation in order to continue to permanency those four trial sites across Australia, and even worse than that, include 23,000 Territorians and plus families in Cape York without having even read her own evaluation report. It is absolutely disgraceful. And then we see in the House of Representatives last night the member for Bass, Bridget Archer, stand up and argue that numerous inquiries have failed to find even any evidence the cashless debit card scheme has any benefit to at-risk communities. She is a Liberal member of 
the Morrison government, who says it fails to address systemic issues of disadvantage among vulnerable Australians. Mrs Archer was telling her team this is a policy that is not working. This is not working, and she does not want to see it in Tasmania. Unfortunately, Mrs Archer didn't go far enough and vote against the cashless debit card. But then we see today another Liberal MP comes out and says, hmm, this just doesn't work. Victorian Liberal MP Russell Broadbent said his expectation was the government would drop the legislation, which also transitions another 26,000 people in the Northern Territory and Cape York onto the card. According to Mr Broadbent, no one wants to rock the boat over this issue, but I don't believe it has broad support in the party room, Mr Broadbent told The Australian. People should have the freedom to deal in cash if they want to. <coughs> well, there you go. I wonder if we have courageous senators of the coalition government who would not only speak their truth, similar to their colleagues in the lower house, and stand up and vote against this horrendous policy that disempowers, that brutalises, that keeps people in poverty and gives them no hope for breaking through the incredible disadvantage that they do not need thrown in their faces because they experience it so deeply. I have had the wonderful pleasure, and it was, to be able to invite senators to the Northern Territory and to ask them to listen to the people of the Northern Territory. And I do thank uh, Senators uh, Rex Patrick and Senator Jackie Lambie for doing exactly that, because this particular piece of legislation is going to have a profound impact on the lives of thousands of families. Thousands and thousands and thousands of families of the Northern Territory who've had enough. And I want senators in here to speak from the heart, to bring back the voices that they listen to up north. And I also thank Central Alliance, Rebecca Sharkey and her staff who came up to the Northern Territory, and I know that that is shared with Senator Griff. Senators, I dearly hope that you will do some solid reflection on this piece of legislation. This is the time when our parliament can be enormously courageous and get rid of, get rid of the cashless debit card, get rid of the falsehood of what it espouses to do for the people of Australia, when in reality what it does is disempower, disengage and give hopelessness to families, to Australian families, who need far more from us as politicians and who need far more from us as a country that should be working with all families to rise above all those issues and empower them to be the people that they are here to be, just as we are standing here in this parliament. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. Senator Seward. I rise to make comments on this particular piece of legislation and this additional information as well. My views on the cashless debit card and income management are well known in this place. From day one, the Greens have said this is not good policy, this is not the way to treat people. Income management, compulsory income management, has been in this country in the Northern Territory for 13, nearly 13 and a half years. Nearly 13 and a half years. And yes, I heard that intervention, for those that didn't hear it, mentioned Jenny Macklin. And yes, Labor did make a mistake. I, I have said that many times in this place. But they, but they have now looked at the evidence and show and seen it doesn't work. So I give them an enormous amount of credit for that because they've looked at the evidence. And certain Labor senators have been opposed to this all along. They knew it wasn't going to work. 
but they've looked at the evidence, or should I say lack of evidence? Lack of evidence, which is in itself evidence, I suppose you'd say. It doesn't work. The final evaluation of the Northern Territory intervention clearly showed that it met none of its objectives. None of its objectives. And the government keeps changing now what the objectives of the trials are. They were originally about, you know, the intervention was originally about supposedly ending child abuse and putting food on the table. And now the trials have morphed to addressing alcohol and drug abuse and gambling. And now they seem to be morphing back to putting food on the table. This is flawed ideology about the way that you achieve change. And you know the way you achieve change? You address the underlying causes of the, of the disadvantage that exists in First Nations communities. You address the social determinants of health. You address the fact that this is still stolen land, that we have never, ever acknowledged that as a nation. We address the intergenerational trauma. We address the fact that children are being still inappropriately taken from their families. We address the fact that there's not sufficient housing. We acknowledge the intergenerational trauma and we finally address that. But instead, what does the government do? It takes an ideological approach. And that's the only conclusion you can draw, because despite the fact that there's no evidence. They still proceed. They still proceed. And they send in the warriors to, to argue that this is the way to go. Certain billionaire puts up the idea that income management is the way to go, despite the fact that the final evaluation of the Northern Territory intervention showed that it did not meet any of its objectives. This is the time where we knock this failed, flawed, ideological, punitive approach racist, discriminatory approach on the head. When this comes up for a vote next week, this chamber has the opportunity to say no permanently and end this abusive card that for 13 years has been in place in this country. Knock it off. I beg crossbench senators to knock this off finally. Say no. Don't let them do this permanently and don't negotiate any form of extension, which is what has happened in the past. It's, oh, let's just extend this a little bit longer. No, you don't need any more extensions. It's flawed. It's failed. And the government hasn't produced its evaluation. It's had it for quite some time now. It makes you wonder what's going on with it. Perhaps it doesn't say the things they want it to say. Just like the ARIMA evaluation didn't say the things that it wanted to say. Just like the Auditor General's report or the ANIO's report actually found that there was no evidence to show that they could claim there was a reduction in social harm. Knock this legislation off and let's focus the resources, the time and energy that's wasted on this flawed approach, on something that works and genuinely commit to walk with First Nations peoples, in fact, walk behind them. We need to have Aboriginal-led decision-making, First Nations-led decision-making here. And the government runs up the line, oh, it, we did talk to First Nations peoples. Well, they didn't talk to communities. Walk the talk. Walk the talk of the, the new agreement with First Nations peoples to uh, close the gap. Walk the talk, because this is not walking the talk. The card is not walking the talk. Knock it off for good permanently when this comes to a vote next week. Thank you, Senator Seawitt. Senator Brockman. Thank you, Madam Deputy Chair. I just wanted to, for the record, uh, speak briefly to this matter, but more to correct the record. Senator McCarthy. Uh, quoted uh, Mr Broadbent from the other place. My understanding is Mr Broadbent has corrected the record and those comments were actually to do with another piece of legislation. 
So I, I just think it is important that the chamber knows that. And, and perhaps uh, Senator O'Sullivan may be uh, wanting to expand on that if he is making a contribution. Thank you, Senator Brockman. I'm going to go to Senator Seawit now, who is sharing it round. I beg your pardon. <laughs> Senator Pratt, you had to go. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Senator Pratt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. And I also rise uh, to take note of the additional information in relation to the Social Security Administration Amendment Cashless Welfare Bill 2020. And I share uh, the anger and the angst of others on this side of the chamber in relation to the government's pursuit of this legislation. Uh, and I note in particular among the additional information that's been presented to the chamber this afternoon that I'm taking note of, uh, Senator Seawert asked for information about the departmental costs to date associated with the CDC for the department and any other government department uh, associated with the trials. And I have to say it was a rather eye-watering amount. The costs from 15-16 to 2019-20 is some $33.632 million for the hotline, the card, merchant management, administration, processing and support, blah, 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 blah. And I have to say, when this government is looking at taking the same people that they want to put into mandatory cashless debit card income management, uh, when they want to reduce those payments for people on payments like JobSeeker to just $40 a day, what is it you really think you're doing in spending that kind of astronomical amount of money micromanaging people's finances? What's the point of micromanaging the finances of people who simply don't have enough to live on anyway? I note that one of the objectives of the so-called cashless debit card uh, is to address alcohol and drug abuse. And I have to say that if you are managing to buy alcohol on uh, those low payments, we know that the research into these, uh, the cashless debit card showed, I think uh, looking at Labor's dissenting report, that some 87 per cent of people simply don't have a problem with alcohol. They simply, uh, 87 per cent of uh, participants reported they did not have a problem with alcohol. Now I can tell you of the 76 senators in this place, and of 76 people who might be on job seeker payments in the Northern Territory who have been placed on, uh, income on this cashless debit card. You take 76 senators versus 76 people on a cashless debit card on job seeker payments in the Northern Territory. Who do you think spends more on alcohol each month, each fortnight? Hands down, uh, I'm sure that that spent, money spent in here would be tenfold, tenfold that of anyone on a cashless debit card. So if you want to invite people to look in your pocket, to look at your drug habits, at your alcohol consumption, go right ahead. But I have to say, this punitive micromanagement that does nothing to build the capacity and resilience of people is absolutely galling. I also have to say that the focus of making the cashless debit card compulsory in the Northern Ter Territory, I find 
implicitly and overtly racist. It is overtly racist. You only need to look at other examples in Australian history, such as you know, our debate this week about uh, saving a seat in the Northern Territory. I have to say, if the citizens of Australia, First Nations people, our citizens in Australia who lived in the Northern Territory prior to 1911, that's the time when uh, the Northern Territory was split from South Australia to become a territory and effectively had its Senate voting rights at that time removed, its, its Democratic House of Ren Representative voting rights removed. So South Australia got its 12 senators and the people of the Northern Territory lost their right, lost their right to vote for senators. So I have to say, would we have done that to the population of the Northern Territory back then in 1911? Had the population of the Northern Territory all been white? Well, the answer is obvious. It's intrinsically obvious. The answer is, of course, no. And I think those that look back on this debate about the cashless debit card in the future would also know when they reflect on this debate that the Northern Territory is singled out because the majority of people that live there are First Nations people. So when it comes to these debates, we must, as others have said, leave the cultural authority and leadership around finding things that work for community in the hands of those communities. We are too far and too remote. It's not them. It's not those in the remote communities of the Northern Territory that are remote. It's we that are remote from them. We have to talk about the issues in their communities in a way uh, where they have the voice in it and not us uh, as uh, representatives uh, in this place with all the privileges and income that comes with it. And so I implore the Senate to reflect morally on what it is to single the Northern Territory out and other, the other trial sites, essentially in large part for their indigeneity. And the government will say, well, this now applies to everyone in the Northern Territory. But I take you back to the principle. Are you about to want to apply, apply this to Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia, to everybody? There are 1.4 million people now on job seeker payments in our nation. What gives this place the right to start interfering with their budgeting and their freedom within our society? And these impacts are very real. We leave stupid bureaucratic systems in charge of the fundamental details of people's lives. As someone quoted in their evidence to the committee, uh, and they were an, uh, a student, a hospitality worker, paying their own rent, earning their own income, once they lost their, uh, once they finished their study, and went on to a job seeker payment, they were, of course, also moved on to a cashless debit card. And what did that? young person who'd finished their education tell us. They told us that they had lost count of the number of times Indu blocked the payment of my rent. The simple fact is that the cashless debit card is a big bureaucracy 
that doesn't meet people's needs. Their needs to uh, exchange money with family members, to participate in a cash economy, to do basic things like pay their rent. So this afternoon in this debate, I call on senators to uh, reflect Senator, morally your on this issue. Now expired. I call Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I look forward to a uh, more fulsome debate uh, on this subject uh, when the bill eventually does come uh, before the Senate. But I did want to place a few things on the record uh, and deal with some of the issues that have been raised uh, by those opposite. And I and I'd really do respect the contribution of senators in this place. I, I don't in any way uh, want to take away or diminish their sincerity and their, their commitment to the issues, the, the substantive issues that uh, are dealt with uh, when talking about this subject. But for me uh, and this government, we certainly believe that every right, every child has the right to feel safe, receive a good education and have high hopes for the future. Yet sadly, uh, through the work that I've done over many years uh, across Australia, particularly in, uh, in, in Indigenous communities, uh, I've seen firsthand that not every Australian is given that opportunity and afforded those opportunities. Uh, alcohol and drug-fuelled harm, enabled by unaccountable welfare, provided to parents or guardians, have robbed far too many children of these rights. But thankfully, thankfully, based on the testimony of people living in the communities where the cashless debit card exists, thankfully, in those communities, we are seeing that through the trial of a more responsible delivery of welfare, through the cashless debit card, we are seeing improvements across those communities. The CDC is a user-friendly, sophisticated bank card that offers participants access to PayWave, BPay, online shopping, uh, recurring uh, deductions and the ability to transfer funds between program accounts. Rent can be paid through it. We've heard testimony here from um, former senators who said that, uh, that rent couldn't be paid. Well, that's simply not true. There might have been a situation where there wasn't enough funds in the account, and that's why the payment couldn't have been made. But there's no technical limitation on, an ability, on a person's ability to be able to pay things such as rent, to be able to pay for bills, to be able to pay for those essential services that they would require to provide for their families. When a payment is loaded onto the card, 80 per cent is quarantined for things like bills, groceries, living in school expenses, really anything except for alcohol, gambling or cash, which of course could then be used to purchase drugs. Now, the other 20 per cent can be used to purchase any items that don't fall into these categories. And I've been on the ground in the trial site communities, speaking to locals, community leaders and meeting with organisations directly involved in the delivery of the scheme and the wraparound services which support it. And their feedback, along with the evidence, has actually been very clear. Participants have reported consistently drinking less. Now, does it mean that every single one has been able to deal with, and the, with the issues that they have got? No, of course not. No one has said that this cashless debit card is a silver bullet. No one has said that this cashless debit card is going to be the solution to solve the issues that are there. But what the communities are telling us, what the communities have told me directly as I've been in these communities, I'm not some academic from a, des from a desktop in, in, the, 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 in Canberra or in Melbourne or in Sydney. I've been to these places, spoken to people on the ground. And what they tell me is that it's become a circuit breaker to enable them, whether, you know, particularly if they're a service provider, providing social services to the community, providing counselling services, providing drug and alcohol services, providing support to the community. They're telling me that it's a circuit breaker so that they can actually help connect with people. Now, just last week, as it so happens, uh, a group got together uh, 
from various parts of the country, uh, organised by the Mindaroo Foundation. And uh, for full disclosure, I used, I used to work for the Mindaroo Foundation. I was part of the development of the cashless debit card when it was first uh, first put to government. And the Mindaroo Foundation uh, brought together people from the communities, from the communities that the cashless debit card is in operation, uh, including a few other places where they operate the basics card and where this legislation that will come before the Senate will actually uh, swap the basics card, which is a very uh, rudimentary technology. There's only something like 16,000 merchants across Australia that will accept the basics card, whereas the cashless debit card, there's 900,000 merchants because it's essentially just a, a MasterCard. So it can be used at FBOS machines right around the country, whereas the basics card is very limited in where it can be used. So there were uh, individuals uh, representing uh, themselves and in, and in many cases representing organisations that were from the Northern Territory and from Queensland in the, in the Cape York where, where the basic card is in operation. People, uh, Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people. Uh, there was a room uh, when I was there for about 50 people that, were, that had gathered together, sadly, because of the border restrictions. Uh, people from Sejuna weren't able to come, uh, but they participated online. Uh, through, through uh, Zoom or, or one of those mediums. And at the end of that forum, they have written a communique, which has actually uh, just been released. And I just want to quote one section of it. It says, we support the continuation of the cashless debit card as an ongoing income management program to make the existing CDC trial sites permanent and to transition income management in the Northern Territory and Cape York region from the basics card to the CDC. So this assertion that the communities where it's operating now don't want it or that it's not supported in the community is just simply not true. If I went to a community, of course, if any of us went to a community, of course you'll find people that don't support it. But the overwhelming sense that you get from people when you speak to them on the ground particularly the mothers, particularly the grandmothers, who care deeply about their children and are sick of the, the humbug, sick of the, the problem that comes from, uh, uh, you know, in, in their families when, when others come and, and, and hassle them for, for money. And you hear from them and you sit down on the grass with them and listen to them. They'll tell you when there's not the threat of... of, of um, you know, been ostracised when there's not the threat of being abused for, for maybe speaking out openly, they'll tell you. And they'll tell, like they did last week when they came to Perth, that they support the extension of this program. And one of the great parts of this legislation, just to give comfort for those that are listening, one of the things that the legislation, when it's a bit before the uh, Senate and it was dealt with uh, through the committee process, is that it removes the power of the minister through regulation to expand it into other communities. Therefore, it would require further legislation, further legislation to be able to come to this place to take it anywhere else. So at that time, we'd be able to have a debate about the future of it, about where it would go. This legislation is primarily dealing with the fact that the basics card needs to be replaced with a better solution. So that when someone runs out of fuel or getting run low on fuel and they're driving past a service station that doesn't accept the basics card, they don't run the risk of running out of fuel to drive down the road further down the road where there's a, a service station that sells that fuel using a basics card. Because the cashless debit card will be able to use wherever an FPOS machine is. And so it makes it seamless, frictionless for the participant and they won't have the hassle that they currently would have with the basics card. So this is going to help the communities across the Northern Territory and across the Cape York. And for those communities that have the cashless debit card already, that want the certainty of it going forward, rather than just 12 months to 12 month to 12 month extension, they want the certainty of it so that they can continue to build and continue to deal with the issues that they so desperately want to deal with. 
that they so desperately want to get on top of. That's what this is about. That's what this bill is about. It's, and that's what this, this report ultimately has demonstrated. Thank you, Senator O'Sullivan. And the question is that the report be noted. All of those in favour say aye. Against? I declare it carried. Senator Gallagher. Uh, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. On behalf of the Economics References Committee, I present the report of the Committee on Regional Inequality in Australia, together with a hand-side record of proceedings and documents presented to the Committee, and I move that the Senate take note of that report. And I also seek leave to speak to the. I don't report. believe you need leave, but I'm off you go, Senator Gallagher. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Acting Deputy President. And I suppose that uh, at the outset, I'd just like to put on the record the, uh, the competence, professionalism, and dedication of the Secretariat in preparing uh, the report after assessing, you know, a, a large number of submissions. It's, it's always uh, a pleasure to work with the professional people in the Secretariat. And I suppose just before I go into the detail of the report. Uh, it's incredible that sometimes in this place the debate preceding uh, an item is, is very cognizant. This is about regional inequality, and there's no greater area of regional inequality in some of the areas of indigenous uh, activity and the lack of uh, educational opportunities and the like. So uh, I did uh, enjoy the contributions of previous senators on the, on the matter, and I think a central theme of it all was that there is areas of improvement by state, local government and federal governments, which would impact on the, uh, the topic before. So basically on the 14th of February 2018, uh, the Senate referred the inquiry into the indicators of and impact of regional inequality in Australia um, for inquiry and report by the last sitting day of 2019. And it has been extended uh, subsequently since then. Uh, one of the unfortunate things is that uh, Due to the pandemic, we weren't able to travel as frequently or as far as we would have liked to do, but we did get a substantial number of uh, visits in. And the, uh, the indicators of and the impact of regional inequality in Australia were particularly reference to government policies and programs in the following areas. Fiscal policies at the federal, state and local government levels, improved coordination of federal, state and local government policies, regional development policies, infrastructure, education, building human capital, enhancing local workforce skills, employment arrangements, decentralisation policies, innovation, manufacturing and any other related matters were the terms of reference. So as at about the 15th of December 2019, the committee had received a total of 140 submissions to the inquiry, 129 during the 45th parliament and a further 11 during the 46th uh, Parliament. Uh, conducted five public hearings in the following regional areas. Emerald, 29th of August 2018. Darwin, 5th of November 2018. And uh, Townsville, 7th of November 2018. Uh, Port Augusta, 19th of uh, November 2019. Terralgan, 21st of November 2019. And, and as I've said, we always get um, plenty of submissions, plenty of interesting evidence and plenty of good contribution from regional Australia. Because there is a, there is a necessity to do this systematically and, and continue through, no matter who's in government. It doesn't really matter who's in government. This work needs to continue systematically and method the methodology needs to be agreed. Each uh, stakeholder needs to know their part and we need to get on with it. And I, I will pay credit on the other side of the chamber because I think um, Senator Payne, in the uh, position of uh, Minister of Defence, took on board our submission and our inquiry into the involvement of defence spend around their regional bases. We identified some areas of concern, and almost in an eye blink, uh, Senator Payne was onto it and incorporated that sort of strategy of direct involvement engaged in employment around regional defence bases. I suppose the irony of the chamber is that it was Senator Reynolds that claimed, claimed the credit for it, but uh, uh, I'm sure that Senator Payne had a wry grin when that happened. But anyway, we've been around and there's a continual theme in this, in this particular area uh, which shouldn't go unreported or unrecognised. 
And that continual theme is the lack of education and training opportunities uh, in regional Australia. The view that education and training were both neglected and important for the regions was a common one. A number, a number of submissions argued it was difficult for people living in the regions to have the same level of access to education as those who live in major cities. Um, the regional universities network commented there is a significant inequality in education attainment between the region, regional Australia and major cities. Regional Australia is a generation behind in educational attendance compared to major cities and may, wake a, may take a generation or more to address this inequality. So, you know, this theme is not, uh, is not just coming from one area, it's coming from right around the country. Uniting Country SA, when asked what could be better uh, in terms of support, the first point, immediate investigation in education and training opportunities across our region. We have a lot of people who have to leave our communities to access, access that sort of service. Policies and procedures that encourage investment from industry within our service area, as well as provide greater career opportunities, would be promoting greater wealth within our communities. We've got TAFE, and they do a range of courses, but there are not enough opportunities. So, once again, if you educate people, you need to have a pipeline of opportunity. And without that pipeline of opportunity, we're condemning people to, in some cases in the Indigenous sector, to almost a lifetime of inequality. If they can't complete high school, or if they can't, there are no opportunities when they complete high school to go into an apprenticeship or a traineeship, then you know, we really have failed those regions. Uh, we take the vibrant city of Wyala, being a bit parochial here, and I apologise to those people I don't mention in the short time I have here today, but uh, any senator will tell you they'll always take the opportunity to mention their home state first. So, the Mayor, Mayor Claire McLaughlin of the Wyala City Council observed, we are a city with ageing infrastructure, both industry and community assets. We have pressure on the Council's budget to balance fiscal, uh, financial sustainability against the need to upgrade assets to improve livability. Continued cost shifting from other levels of government place a significant strain on our ability to ensure financial sustainability into the future while managing and upgrading our ageing infrastructure to become more desirable and a living city, a livable city. We encourage increased funding allocations to upgrade, upgrade regional commun community assets, something that is integral to our vision for our city. A lot of our infrastructure is very old, built in the 70s when the, time, the town was booming, and we'd certainly appreci uh, appreciate some more funding uh, for those sort of uh, upgrades. And look, this is a continual theme right around the country from many, many communities. Education, infrastructure, opportunity and the like. What I want to put on the, uh, on the record in this short time that I have is Mr David Ross, Director of the Central Land Council, advocated government investment into infrastructure as one of the several recommendations to assist Indigenous people to fill their potential. The government needs to take urgent action to reverse these trends. I know better than most that this problem is complex. However, I believe there are clear steps that can be taken to narrow the gaps. These include investing in the vital basic infrastructure in remote and very remote areas to improve opportunities for Aboriginal-driven development on Aboriginal land and sea, including in roads, water, power, telecommunications and access to health and uh, education services. Now, I met Mr Ross, I think, in the early 1970s when we were both truck drivers for John Drink Transport in Alice Springs. He knows what he's talking about. He's lived that area all his life. He's contributed in that area all his life. And I humbly suggest that those, uh, um, you know, those who can make the decisions that will impact in this area uh, listen to his advice, because uh, it's coming from the right place. So there's a couple of recommendations we made. Uh, was that the committee recommends that the Commonwealth Government fundamentally re-examine its regional infrastructure spending plan and make an expanded infrastructure program the basis of its stimulus plan for Australia's economic recovery from the impacts of the pandemic. So use the opportunity the pandemic has created and the funding of infrastructure properly in regional Australia. Secondly, in order to establish the most appropriate response in terms of regional investment, 
the committee recommends the Commonwealth Government undertake a series of roundtable consultations with the Commonwealth departments and agencies, state and local governments, uh, regional associations and community organisations. So, I think a very timely uh, uh, report tabled just after the debate on the cashless welfare card because I know the debate there is widely held, deeply felt. There are various positions on it. Uh, I think this points the way forward. We have to improve the infrastructure, the education, the training. Listen to the indigenous people who have been there for a long time and get some opportunities. And I mean, even just the infrastructure in uh, telehealth in remote communities would be a remarkable change. People could get diagnosed over the internet. You could remediate problems early and quickly. So I commend the report to the Senate and seek leave to continue my remarks. Senator. Brockman. Rutman, sorry. That's all right. I kept to say first, Thank please. you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to make a, a very brief contribution, contribution uh, on this report so following Senator Gallagher. Uh, as, as chair of the committee, I am uh, the deputy chair of the committee. Uh, I will add my thanks to uh, the secretariat and all those who made submissions to the report, and, and I will pay tribute to uh, the, the role of Senator Gallagher. Uh, in driving that inquiry and all the other senators that participated in it. Uh, obviously, uh, right across the chamber, there are uh, many uh, members of this place who wish to see uh, re rural and regional Australia advance. And, and there is some uh, additional comments from coalition senators noting some of the uh, very, very important things that this government is actually doing in this space uh, in terms of things such as infrastructure and job creation and uh, I'll note the presence uh, in the chamber of, of the minister who has been central to driving some of those changes in terms of jobs programs um, uh, and the like. Uh, I guess one of the frustrations of, of 2020 has been that the plan of the committee was to get out into the regions much, much more than we were able to. Now, obviously, in light of this year, that is, that is um, the, uh, the least important thing that has, has, has happened this year, but it is uh, a frustration for many of us who would have liked to have seen uh, this place take its committee work out into the regions much more. Unfortunately, this year hasn't allowed. We all know why, but uh, it, it is an important report. It is a very important uh, policy issue, and uh, it is one that I certainly commend uh, to all those uh, out there listening to this to examine. Thank you. Do you seek to continue your remarks? Do you my remarks? Thank you very much. Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, on behalf of the select, select Committee on the Effectiveness of the Australian Government's Northern Australia Agenda, I present an interim report of the committee and I move that the Senate take note of the report. The question is that the report be noted. All those in favour say aye. Oh, do you want to speak? Yes, Senator? please. So you might start and I'll okay, put a question do that afterwards. Now. Terrific. Um, thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Just in the time available, I'll make a relatively short contribution um, on this report. So, for those listening at home, we've, the, the Senate inquiry into the effectiveness of the Australian government's Northern Australia agenda uh, commenced uh, very early in this term, and it was always intended to be a fairly long-running inquiry to give the Senate an opportunity to review just exactly how the government's Northern Australia agenda is progressing. Uh, what we've done today is table an interim report of the committee. Uh, the intention is that the final report of this committee will be tabled at the end of March next year. Um, like every uh, inquiry that's been conducted over this term, this inquiry has of course been disrupted by COVID-19 and particularly the limitations on travel that have been possible. And that's been especially an issue for this inquiry, given by its very nature it involves travelling and hearing from uh, people in some of the most remote parts of this country. That, of course, hasn't been possible as much as we would have liked to have achieved this year, which is the reason for the extension of this inquiry into next year. Uh, but notwithstanding that, today's interim report, I think, does make some important recommendations to the government about how it can. Uh, improve the performance of probably its key 
funding mechanism for the Northern Australia Agenda, which is the Northern Australia Infrastructure Facility, uh, the NAIF. I'll come back to that in a moment and what the committee has recommended for the NAIF shortly, but I just also want to put on record my thanks to the other committee members, uh, Senator Macdonald, the deputy chair of the committee, uh, my colleagues from Labor, Senators McCarthy and Dodson, uh, Senator Roberts and Senator Seawett as well. Uh, again, travel limitations have made it a little bit difficult for people to participate in all the hearings, um, but I do appreciate the efforts that everyone has put in. And I do want to thank everyone as well for reaching uh, a unanimous position in this interim report. That's obviously not always possible. Um, so I think we've handled ourselves very maturely uh, and uh, no doubt we can continue to do that th over the course of this inquiry. Um, can I also thank the uh, hard-working Oh, sorry, and Senator Dean Smith. How could I forget Senator Smith? Thank you for <laughs> reminding me. We'll, we'll, um, we'll see more of you when we get the uh, committee over to Western Australia in the new year, Senator Smith, and I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, the, uh, yeah, can I also thank the uh, Secretariat, who have worked very hard uh, over the course of this inquiry uh, with the logistics and, and, of course, the preparation of this report. Uh, we do all very much appreciate your efforts and, and your beavering away to get this report done uh, behind the scenes. Um, what we have achieved to date uh, is a number of hearings in Darwin, Townsville, Mad Isa, Mackay and Nullumboy in Arnhem Land. Uh, and over the last few months, particularly since COVID hit, we have made a point of this inquiry continuing uh, and have undertaken a number of hearings by teleconference so that we do keep it progressing and continue to hear uh, from witnesses. Uh, as I say, uh, this, what the decision we made was that the interim report should focus on the NAIF, uh, partly because um, it is the only funding mechanism that is within the portfolio of Northern Australia partly because it, has, it, is an, it is a body that has, in my view, attracted quite a lot of deserved attention and, and in some quarters, criticism. And also, it, uh, the government was itself conducting a review of the NAIF over the last few months, and we thought it was important that the committee did bring down an interim report to provide some recommendations to government, which they can hopefully listen to and act on uh, when it comes time to legislating some changes to the NAIF. Uh, I do want to recognise th uh, that the Northern Australia Minister, uh, Mr Pitt, uh, has already announced that there will be a number of changes made to the NAIF, which is very welcome from both the opposition's point of view and I think the committee as a whole, um, given the recommendations that we've made. Uh, we obviously haven't seen the legislation yet, uh, but certainly what I've seen from the minister does look encouraging. And it, it does seem that the government recognises there are some pretty significant changes that need to be made to the NAIF so that it does work effectively, so that it does get money out the door uh, and so that it does build the projects and create the jobs that it was intended to. Uh, I think it's well known that I've been a very strong critic of the NAIF up until now. Uh, and as I made clear at the Northern Australia conference in uh, Rockhampton last week, my criticism is not of the officials of the NAIF or its board members. I think it has lacked political direction and political leadership, uh, and I am pleased to see some of these changes that the minister is now flagging. Um, as I have said before, I just don't think it's acceptable that five years after this uh, uh, body was first announced um, that we see only $218 million of its $5 billion budget having actually been released to fund projects. That's less than five cents in the dollar released five years after this body was first announced. Now, we of course hear from the government on a regular basis that the NAIF has approved funding of over $2 billion for projects, and that's very good. Um, but what they would never want to accept and acknowledge is that the amount of money that's actually flowing out the door is considerably less than that, $218 million. Uh, and what that really means is not just in numerical terms, uh, but it really means that we've got billions of dollars of lost opportunities for Northern Australia, which is particularly important now as we are in recession and as we're starting to recover from COVID. Um, again, as I made clear in my speech to the Northern Australia conference last week, um, there are some incredible opportunities in Northern Australia as we recover from COVID. Uh, there's renewed interest in decentralisation, in people moving out of big cities, particularly in the southern states, which have uh, ha uh, borne the burden of COVID-19 and its lockdowns. 
Uh, I was in Darwin a couple of weeks ago, and people are really excited about the fact that the population there is increasing for the first time in some time. Uh, and you can actually feel a bit more energy in places like Darwin uh, and optimism than we have seen for some time. So it is important that the government takes this opportunity uh, that we've been given through COVID, uh, where people are thinking about things differently, to really drive this Northern Australia agenda home and actually deliver on its expectations. Um, what this report does is make a number of recommendations for how the NAIF can be improved. And these recommendations go beyond the changes that the government has already flagged. Uh, the report does acknowledge the changes to the NAIF that the government has flagged and co congratulates them on doing so. But we do think, and when I say we, the committee as a whole uh, does think that there are some other amendments and changes to the NAIF that could be made. Uh, just briefly running through those recommendations, First of all, uh, it's to broaden the eligibility of the NAIF to allow uh, for funding of smaller projects and broader, a broader range of industries. One of the main pieces of feedback that I've received, both through the inquiry and on separate work as the Shadow Minister, is that um, one of the problems with the NAIF is that up until now it has really focused on the funding of large projects in the tens of millions of dollars and hundreds of millions of dollars. Uh, and while there, while there are some projects of that scale uh, kicking around in Northern Australia and seeking financing, there's a lot more projects that are much smaller in nature uh, but do need finance uh, through, through this government facility and have found it very difficult to access that fun funding through the NAIF. Um, so we are recommending in this report that the NAIF uh, have, a, have a good look at its eligibility and its focus to make sure that it is paying enough attention and providing enough support to those smaller projects. Um, we've also recommended that the government consider converting some of the NAIF's funds to grants, equity stakes and guarantees. Um, that, of course, would have fiscal implications for the government, and that's why we have uh, simply recommended that they consider doing so rather than outright recommending it. Um, but again, uh, the evidence that the committee has received does suggest that uh, converting some of these funds to grants, equity stakes and guarantees would provide a better funding vehicle for those small-scale projects that I was talking about, but also, in particular, projects that are being led by First Nations communities. Um, I've said before that uh, the, given the proportion of uh, the Northern Australian community who are from First Nations communities, given the high levels of disadvantage we continue to see in First Nations communities, given the fact that in the Northern Territory alone 50 per cent of the land is Aboriginal owned, um, we have to make sure that uh, the interests of First Nations people are at the centre of the Northern Australia agenda, and the NAIF has got a role to play in delivering that as well. Um, there are other recommendations we've made in this report, such as ensuring that NAIF-funded NAIF projects do a better job of buying locally, sourcing labour locally, so that we do really see that local spin-off out of NAIF projects. Um, and we have continued to recommend that there be greater transparency and accountability from the NAIF in relation to things like its bonuses that it pays. Um, all in all, what we're saying in this report is the NAIF is a worthwhile institution that needs to get moving. We hope this will happen, and I seek leave to continue my remarks. Uh, thank you, Senator Watt. Uh, leave is granted before I get to you, Minister. Time has expired for consideration of items 15 being tabled in the committee report, 16 documents and 17 further consideration reports. We will now move to ministerial statements, but before I do that, I understand the minister has a government response to table. I do. Thank you. Uh, I present the government's response to the report of the Parliamentary Joint Committee on the Australian Commission for Law Enforcement Integrity on its inquiry into the examination of the annual report of the Integrity Commissioner 2018-19 and seek leave to have the document incorporated into Hansard. Uh, leave is granted. Uh, thank you. Uh, are there any ministerial statements? Minister. Uh, thank you. I table documents relating to orders for the production of documents concerning Australian Sport Commission and Sport Australia Legal Advice and Australia's sovereign naval shipbuilding capacity. Senator Farrell. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. I seek to take note uh, on the uh, response there um, to the interim uh, report of the Select Committee on the Administration of uh, Sports Grants. You don't, you don't need to seek leave. So. No, thank you. Um, then uh, um, I've just received the uh, a copy of the, uh, uh, the minister's uh, response um, 
through Mr Monaghetti, who's the acting chair. Uh, and um, <clears throat> despite a decision of the uh, Senate earlier this week, when the report was uh, handed, uh, the interim report, I should say, was handed to the uh, Senate on the um, um, shocking circumstances of what is now known as the sports rorts affair, um, the government continues to um, refuse to come clean or act transparently in respect of this matter, despite the fact that they've had ample opportunity to do so and despite the fact that the clear, uh, unequivocal will of the Senate is that they do so. Now, I think it's important to go back in time a little bit and have a look at uh, what, um, what's transpired here. Um, it started out with the Australian uh, National Audit Office conducting uh, a very thorough audit into the government's handling of the so-called Community Sports Infrastructure Grants Program, what we know as the Sports Rorts Program. Uh, the Auditor uh, General told the Senate inquiry that his office had spent more than uh, 3,800 hours of work on this inquiry. And importantly, um, he found, uh, and I quote from uh, the report, uh, there was no legal authority evident to the ANAO under which the minister was able to approve uh, the CSIG program grants. Now, I'll repeat that, no legal authority. Um, <clears throat> now, this uh, inquiry has been going for some time now. The government all along has thought that um, under the cover of the pandemic they would uh, escape scrutiny for what they did uh, with this uh, sports rorts uh, uh, program. <clears throat> but um, can I tell you this, Mr Acting Deputy President, they're not going to es escape that inquiry. The Australian people want to know some answers about what went on here. More, more particularly, uh, the sports community wants to know what's gone on here. Uh, more particularly um, still, all of those um, sporting organisations, all of those volunteers uh, who originally looked at the, the uh, criteria for the granting of these applications, heaps and heaps and heaps of money uh, that was supposed to go to sporting clubs, all of those um, uh, volunteers who toiled away night after night thinking, thinking that they were entering a legitimate process, thinking that, they, that this, this uh, process the government had set up to distribute the sporting grants, uh, and we've of course got no problem with sporting organisations getting money, but the government misled the Australian people, misled all of these volunteers in these uh, sporting clubs into thinking that there was going to be a legitimate process for the distribu distribution of these funds. That if you had a good project and that you scored well with Sports Australia, uh, you were going to be rewarded with one of these grants. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's what they thought, uh, Senator uh, Ciccone. But what did we find out? Nothing of the sort occurred. In fact, as each tranche of money was, uh, was um, uh, handed out by the then Minister Mackenzie, the situation got worse and worse and worse. Fewer clubs with high scores were rewarded uh, and the government handed this money over to their own marginal seats, their own marginal seats or seats that they were trying to win. The whole process was a fraud right from the start. At no stage, at no stage was there any legitimacy to this process. And all of those hardworking volunteers now know that that's what happened here. And <clears throat> you know, why are we here today discussing this? Well, um, earlier in the year, when Sport Australia uh, gave some evidence, they came along. They said to us, look, you tell us what documents you want and we'll hand, hand them over. We've got nothing to hide. The government's got nothing to hide about this. We want to explain what we've done. They said that at the hearing, one of the first hearings into this matter. But what's happened? We haven't got the documents. Despite 
the inquiry now going for nine months or so, uh, despite a decision earlier this week of the Senate making it very clear that um, the Senate wants to see these documents, uh, we still haven't got the document. And, and this response by the government today, uh, Orderly Sports Australia today, make it clear we're still not going to get it. We're still not going to get it. Now, as I said before, the government thinks that they can hide from scrutiny over the pandemic, that somehow um, what they did throughout this process to um, uh, disrespect sporting clubs in this country in the way that they can handed out the uh, funds, they think the issue is going to go away. Well, let me tell you, the issue is not going to go away. Somebody is going to have to take responsibility for this. Uh, now, I know Senator McKenzie has gone, but it's very clear from what we have found out <clears throat> about her role in this process uh, that she was just doing the bidding of the, uh, the Prime Minister. The Prime Minister was giving the instructions as to exactly where these funds had to go so as to maximise the chances of the government being re-elected. That's what it was all about. That was a, nothing to do with a fair distribution of sporting funds to <coughs> Uh, Australian sporting clubs. It had everything to do, everything to do <coughs> Mr Acting Deputy President, uh, with the re-election of this government. Now, <coughs> we're not going to leave it here. <coughs> we're not going to leave it here. The government might think that they can hide uh, from scrutiny by sending in letters uh, like the one that they've uh, given uh, late on a Thursday afternoon uh, to the Senate. Uh, but we're not going to le leave it there, and we've got two very fine senators on the job, Senator uh, Chisholm uh, and Senator Green, uh, and they've got their teeth. They've got their teeth into this, uh, and they, you know, I can see, I can see Senator Cash smiling because she knows, she knows that what I'm saying is true. Even Senator Brockman is smiling. I can see he's, look, he's got his head down for a change. They know, they know. They know that the Australian people are going to find out what went on here. Now, I think I know what went on here. I think poor old Senator Mackenzie simply did, simply did what she was instructed to do by the Prime Minister and the Prime Minister's office to win the last election. Uh, there was no accountability, no transparency, and they. They, like most, most other people, thought they were going to lose the election, so it didn't really matter. Uh, they were never going to have to be held responsible for the ir irresponsible way in which they distributed these funds. Uh, but those two senators I mentioned, Senator Chisholm, fine senators. Uh, fi fine, very fine senators, senators from Queensland, they're on the job and they've got their teeth into this issue. And if the government thinks that somehow, by delaying this process, they will escape scrutiny, then they've got another think coming. Because day by day, week by week, month by month, we will continue to pursue uh, this government uh, to get the truth out of what's gone on here. Uh, because <clears throat> at the end of the day, um, the government will have to explain why they so abused this grants process. Public. Yeah, it's public money. They thought, <coughs> well, well, they thought it was their own money. That's, right. that's, that's what happened, that's Senator right. Ciccone. They thought this money was theirs. They thought they could. Yes, that's right, Senator Pratt. They thought they could hand this money out uh, in such a way. Uh, no, no, it wasn't. Wasn't their money? No, they treated it like it was a. Yes, that's. I couldn't have said it better, Senator Ciccone. Thank you. Um, I hope you're going to make a contribution to this debate. <coughs> Um, they, they knew that this money was not theirs. They're trying to hide, but let me tell you, there is no place to hide. We're going to track, track down what went on here, and the Australian people are going to find out one day exactly what went on. Thank you, yeah, Senator well Farrell. Uh, Senator Green. Thank you. Uh, I just want to um, rise and make a contribution to um, this uh, debate in regards to the ministerial um, statement, uh, but particularly the letter that's been tabled today uh, by the minister in regards to um, the 
the refusal um, of um, the government uh, via Sports Australia to comply with a request from the Senate uh, to provide documents requested by the Senate uh, inquiry into the sports grants um, saga. Uh, if I can make clear to the Senate, this is a, a document um, that uh, relates to the legal authority that the minister had to make decisions about these grants. Uh, we have always questioned whether the minister even had the legal authority to make these decisions. Uh, and it is a concern. It is a concern that many legal uh, submissions have been made to the committee that have questioned the legal authority that the minister had. The only basis that the public has for believing that the minister had legal authority to make these decisions is a piece of legal advice that the Attorney General is, has a hold of but will not make public. That is the only information that we have. Now, I note, I note that in the letter, the uh, chair, uh, the acting chair of Sports Australia notes that there's a current legal proceeding on foot. But I want to make clear to the Senate that the, the members of this committee have gone about this in a very deliberate way, understanding, understanding that legal professional privilege isn't always grounds for a public interest immunity claim, but when there's legal proceedings on foot, we do need to be careful in those respects. We have asked for this evidence in camera so we can at least understand what advice Sports Australia had, what, what understanding they had about the minister's legal authority. We have asked for that in camera. It has not been provided. That's why the interim report put a recommendation to the Senate, and the Senate supported that recommendation. The Senate supported a recommendation to request this information because it is crucial for the public to understand how badly the government mismanaged their taxpayer funds when it came to making decisions about who received this money. Because we know there are so many circumstances in this, in this saga that the government is refusing to make public. There are numerous, numerous documents that the government has refused to make public. Not just to our inquiry, there's the Gaitchens report. Everyone is familiar with the Gaitchens report. That's the report that the Prime Minister, well, he wasn't happy with the Auditor General report, he wasn't happy with what that said, so he went to get his own report from um, uh, Mr. Gaitchens. That report uh, was completed, and what do you know? It said nothing, nothing's wrong here, nothing's been done. Um, to untoward. Uh, we don't need to worry about this matter anymore. But that report has not been made public. Not a single member of the public or, indeed, a single member of the Senate or anyone on this committee has had the opportunity to read that report so we can understand what questions were asked, what witnesses were questioned, what documents that report had access to. And without that information, the only thing that this committee or the, or the Senate and the members of the public will have to determine is that the government is covering this up. Because otherwise, you would release the information and make it public. And why, does it, why is it a concern? Well, we know that the government ran a parallel process the minister, in conjunction with the Prime Minister's office, there were 136 emails, ran a parallel process to make recommendations about where this, the, these funds should go. Sports Australia had a merit assessment process. They scored applications. People who have experience with sport, understanding where these funds should go and assessing them on their merit. They were the ones that made the decision. And when the list made its way over to the minister's office, well, the prime minister intervened and said, no, 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 we've got an election coming up. We need to make sure that there's enough announcements in our marginal seats so we can go stand, get a photo, stand next to a big check and, and make sure that this money is going to the people for their votes. Not the people who might need the money, not the sporting clubs that have done the hard work 
to make sure that they had a really good application, but, the, but they made sure that this money only went to the people whose votes they needed. And that is not how the government should be handing out taxpayer funds. There's another reason why the government doesn't want to let anyone know what the truth of this scandal was. And, I, and, and um, Senator Farrell is right. We are not letting this go. We are not letting this go because when we finally get these, uh, these documents, they will show that the Prime Minister was intimately involved in this scandal. 136 emails went back and forth between the Prime Minister's office and the Minister's office. They included several examples of the colour-coded spreadsheet and changes were requested by the Prime Minister's office multiple times to that spreadsheet because they were working with CHQ, their campaign headquarters, to make these changes. It was a politicised process. It shouldn't have been because nobody in the public, none of these sporting clubs were told, don't bother applying unless you live in one of our marginal seats. That is what people need to know. How is this process allowed to occur? And I just want to draw the Senate's attention to one of the documents that we have received, because I think it shines a light on why we know that this government is not going to provide any other documents. Why this why this government is going to ignore a resolution of the Senate. This is an email from the Executive Director of Sports Partnerships in Sports Australia. It's an email on the 5th of December 2018, and it's one of the documents that we have actually managed to get through the process of estimates, through the process of this inquiry. And it goes to show that when we actually do get the documents, they paint a very grim picture for this government. This email sent to the minister's office and CCing, the CEO of Sports Australia, refers to the changes that the minister has made to the decisions in this program. And it says, we also recognise your comments that in making changes to the approved list that the Minister's Office used, a rating scale provided by Sports Australia as a re reference, but the Minister is advised that as the delegate she may need to defend the decisions at Senate estimates, i.e. if changes were made she could not state that she approved the recommended decisions in the industry panel that followed due process where a rigorous, transparent and defensible process took place. Sports Australia tried to warn the minister that she shouldn't go down this road because she would end up having to answer questions about not following the recommendations of Sports Australia. We know that the government was warned. We know that people in Sports Australia, good people in Sports Australia, had very grave concerns about this process and they raised those concerns with the minister. They said to the minister, hey, wait a second, you might not want to go down this track because if you do, you'll be doing the wrong thing. But they didn't care. All they had in their sights was the election. All they had in their sights was getting themselves re-elected. It was all about protecting their own jobs, getting themselves back into the cushy jobs that they have and not doing the right thing by the sporting clubs and the people who made these applications and the people in the public who expect better from this government. So this letter today is not unexpected, but it is unacceptable. It is unacceptable that a committee of the Senate, that the Senate itself is not being given the information it needs to understand what has gone wrong here. And we know the reason that we, we are not being given this information. It's because the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, was at the head of this scandal. And the more documents that we receive, because we're not giving up, that the more that it will show that the Prime Minister led the sports rorts scandal. And he let Minister Mackenzie take the fall, and we're not going to stop until we've found it. Uh, thank you, Senator Green. I think Senator Chisholm, sorry, Senator Rennick, uh, did have, was, was first up. So, Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr. Acting Deputy President. Uh, and what we know is that whilst Minister Colbeck wasn't responsible for administering sports rorts, 
Uh, what we've learnt today is he is an accomplice in the cover-up. Uh, and the minister has had uh, 12 months to be honest with the Australian people, honest with this parliament, and actually come in and explain what has gone on and provide answers to those people, those volunteers, those mums and dads, those people who give up so much of their time in good faith uh, to apply through the, the, the process, the guidelines that were put forward by Sports Australia, um, put in the volunteer hours. and We've heard from so many clubs this year about how many hours they dedicated to putting in a submission, and then they were dotted by this government all for political decisions. But yet they don't have the actual good grace to come in and be up front with those people who volunteer their time and tell them what's gone on and admit that this was all about their re-election. That was what their focus was on the whole time. So it is absolutely outrageous that their political decision making uh, was paramount uh, through this program and the fact that they treat this Senate with contempt by not actually providing the legal advice today, uh, and I will come to that in more detail shortly. But they absolutely need to level with the Australian people. They need to fund those clubs that they dudded. So we know those clubs that received a high score, uh, the ones that were judged as deserving by Sports Australia, that this government dudded. We know who they are, and the government should do the right thing and fund those clubs. Uh, we've had a budget since this. They still failed to do it in the budget, but it's not too late. So many of those clubs that came evidence uh, that came and gave evidence to us, uh, they are still desperate to have these upgrades uh, and the work that they do, uh, the work that they have done putting forward their submissions uh, need to be rewarded as a result. Uh, and it's the groups, it's the councils, uh, it's the uh, indigenous councils that we've heard from. Uh, so many worthy places about encouraging young people to get involved in sport, about giving uh, Indigenous people an opportunity in a place like Wurrubunda to play uh, at a football ground with club rooms and appropriate facilities. We know that there's so much growth in women's sport in particular uh, that is being uh, neglected as a result. So we've heard the stories about uh, the women who have to change in the car or out the back of the club rooms. Clearly not appropriate. Uh, and it is this government that's responsible for those things. Uh, by not answering questions on this, by not providing legal advice, uh, it's just a pattern of behaviour that we've seen as they try and cover up what, true, what really went on in this. Uh, they won't answer questions about what was the involvement of the Prime Minister in his office. We know that there was 136 emails between uh, the Minister's office and the Prime Minister's office about this program. We know that they won't even release to us the spreadsheets. So we actually, the committee has not seen the spreadsheets uh, that the minister made their decision making on. Uh, we haven't seen any of those. They won't release them to us. Uh, we haven't seen the Gations report. Uh, we haven't seen uh, the talking points that were prepared for Minister Mackenzie's meeting with the Prime Minister and his office about extending this program. Uh, as it got closer to the election, as Senator Farrell said in his uh, speech, the de political decision making got worse. So in round one, it was 40 per cent ignored. Uh, in round two, it was 70 per cent ignored. By round three, as the election was imminent, it was 73 per cent ignored. That's how political the decision making got the closer the election got. Uh, and we also have no idea who authorised the five additional projects that was granted funding after Caretaker kicked in. So Caretaker applied and they still, they still gave out five more grants in Caretaker period and we are none the wiser about who was responsible for that. So that is just outrageous that Caretaker was in place, five grants were approved and we are none the wiser about who was responsible for granting those. But let's get to the substance of today's legal advice. Uh, and it was against the request of the Senate on the authority of the then Minister Mackenzie to authorise grants as part of sports rorts. It's just another example in a long saga of the LNP's government, lack of transparency and accountability. The letter from Sports Australia today claims that due to legal proceedings commencing on the 23rd of July this year, that they are concerned that 
ASCs, the Australian Sports Commissions, interested may be adversely affected if the legal professional privilege applicable to the advice is prejudiced by the requirement to table this advice summary. The ASC's claim, however, doesn't explain why the minister made a PII claim on the 16th of July, before any legal proceedings had been commenced. And there was a failure of the minister to obviously come in here and address that issue specifically. And this is even though the Beechworth Lawn Tennis Club, a high-scoring club with 78 over 100, so well above the identified threshold by the audit office of being eligible, who asked for a $500,000 grant. They requested that Sports Australia review their decision on the 4th of March this year. Sports Australia was still prepared to provide a confidential briefing of legal advice in May to the committee. Sports Australia again makes the claim that on the basis of legal professional privilege, they should not be required to table the legal advice. However, legal professional privilege has not been accepted in the Senate as grounds for refusing to provide information or documents. The Senate has rejected government claims that there is a long-standing practice of not disclosing legal advice. Legal advice to the federal government is often disclosed by the government itself. As in the letter uh, and the PII claim itself, the disclosure of the information may materially affect the Commonwealth's position in pending legal proceedings. The committee recognised this at the time uh, and said that we may we said it was accepted grounds. Uh, um, sorry, we, the committee was not satisfied with that and that the correspondent ex explains the specific harm to the public interest that would result. Again, there has been no explanation as to the risk of providing a confidential briefing to the committee in camera, as the committee said we were happy to accept. And further, it needs to be stated we consider this information, vi information as vital evidence for the inquiry, as it goes to the very legal foundations of the program and whether then Minister Mackenzie even had the legal authority to be authorising these grants. The legal experts the committee has heard from have all cast doubt. Uh, all have been unable to find the suggested legal authority, uh, and then Minister Mackenzie claims to have had to make these grants. Uh, and I went through some of these issues with the legal authority. Uh, we heard from Professor Lindell, we heard from Professor Toomey, uh, experts in constitutional law, about they could not identify the legal authority. Uh, that the minister had to be the decision maker in this process. So it's not enough that it was in the guidelines. That is irrelevant. They had to identify the legal authority and they were unable to do it. So this is why we have pursued this. Uh, Sports Australia were originally happy to give us the summary in camera, which we had agreed to, but then it was Minister Colbeck, the one who claimed PII, which is why we brought it to the Senate and why the Senate voted for that in the interim report uh, on Tuesday night. So we will continue to pursue it, but it's across a whole range of issues that we will continue to pursue, and that's why the sports rights inquiry will be going on into next year when we had an aim to finish it this year. But the fact that the government won't cooperate makes it all the more necessary that we continue to pursue it. So what are the 136 emails between the minister's office and the prime minister's office discussing this scheme? What is the content of those? Give us access to the spreadsheets so we can see which clubs missed out, what scores they received, uh, so that we can actually talk to them and let them tell their story. Because some of the compelling evidence we've seen this year, the most compelling evidence we've seen this year, are those volunteers, those mums and dads that I talked about, that put in the work that have been dotted by this government. They deserve the opportunity to be heard. They also deserve the opportunity for this government to do the right thing and fund those clubs that received the high score. The legal authority, we will continue to pursue that because it puts the very basis of this program in doubt and the government haven't been able to provide assurances. The Gations report, again, another one that the government haven't released that actually goes to the very heart of why Minister Mackenzie lost her job. The talking points that were prepared for then Minister Mackenzie for her meeting with the Prime Minister as they discussed future rounds of this program. So what was in those talking points? You know, what led to the political decision making that we saw? And who approved those five projects after Caretaker had been put in? A fundamental element of democracy that this government have not provided any answers for at all. And there's five projects out there that were, that were given granted permission to with no authority. The Senate will now
The question is that the Senate take note. Those of the question say aye. Against no, the ayes have it. The Senate will now proceed to the consideration of general business. Clark. General business debate on the motion circulated by Pauline Hanson's One Nation. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. The motion I moved is the opening paragraph in Robert Gottliebson's newspaper article yesterday. And I'll quote it again. When China declared that Australia had been evil, it suddenly became clear that the dispute between the two nations is more deep-seated than a trade spat involving wine, coal, timber, etc. Now, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, who is involved in the governance of Australia, I want to focus on Gottliebson's meaty fourth paragraph. Quote, from President Xi down, there has been little respect for Australia for a long time, and many in China believe we are a foolish country that makes mistakes at almost every turn, led by defence." He then details serious flaws in governance in three defence projects, the submarine Shamozel, as he calls it, F-35 Joint Strike Fighter and Hunter frigates. We are a foolish country, obviously, from this, and the obvious point of his article is shoddy governments, shoddy governments over many decades, both Liberal, National and Labor. People in this country are feeling concerned about the seriously deteriorating state of our country. We have lost our economic sovereignty. We're losing our national sovereignty. We're plunging towards catastrophe economically and dependence with a complete loss of security. People are fed up and across many communities and industries are feeling dispirited, hopeless, confused, aimless, wary and concerned, even fearful because most can sense our country's destruction, and I mean right, ar right around the country. Yet, 100 years ago, Australia was number one in the world in income per person and had the highest GDP, gross domestic product per person. There's a worse aspect beyond economic demise, though. Bullies, like China, prey on those perceived as being weak. Gottliebson rightly says that due to poor and even stupid decisions, we're rightly perceived as being weak in defence. Yet he barely scratches the full extent of the deterioration of our security because our productive capacity has been dismantled and our economic security smashed, destroyed, and we are vulnerable. Now, as a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, that is what I will discuss because, like bullies in a schoolyard or in a workplace, China preys on those it perceives as weak or foolish. And by the way, when I raise China, I refer to the Chinese Communist Party, and not the millions of Australians of Chinese descent now in our country, descendants of those who came during the gold rushes almost two centuries ago, to those who immigrated recently. The Chinese Communist Party not only assesses other nations against China's values and standards, the Chinese Communist Party assesses our country against our values. And from that, it finds out, does our government have courage? Does our government have integrity? Do the politicians in this country and this parliament have the strength of character needed to lead a country? Now, Australian values, I've been thinking about this for some years now. I've made a list of Australian values, mateship, fair go, support, loyalty, being fair dinkum, telling the truth, honesty, fairness, Freedom. Freedom to live. Freedom of speech. Freedom of thought. Freedom of belief. Freedom of religion. Freedom of faith. Freedom of interaction. Freedom of exchange. Democracy. Our flag. Our nation. Family. Care. Respect for people. Respect for community. Respect for the law. Respect for the environment. Making sure government fulfills its three primary roles. Protecting life protecting property and protecting freedom, and stays out of everything else. Our constitution. We value our constitution, especially competitive federalism, and we value human progress, and Australia has led that improvement and progress in the last 150 years. Amazing progress in, right across the world. So let's assess governments against these values and their impact on our productive capacity. 
Productive capacity depends on many things, but particularly energy costs, the primacy of energy. Ever decreasing cost of energy has led to 150 years of human progress. But Australia has gone from the lowest electricity prices to the world's highest. And yet we're now the world's largest exporter of energy, gas and coal. Chinese import a lot of our coal. But their production of coal in their own country is eight times our total production. Not just our exports, our total production. Eight times. They make us look like small producers of coal. They have the largest coal reserves in the world, along with the United States. They use our coal, and they're building steel power plants out of our coal, and they're building hundreds of coal-fired power stations. We legislate to use their wind, wind turbines, their solar panels. We subsidise them. It drives up the cost of our electricity, and we pay them for their unreliables, their solar and wind generators. We pay, pay them for the components for electric vehicles that we also subsidise. And then we have Chinese companies affiliated with the Chinese Communist Party owning electricity networks in our major cities. Then we have the Queensland Labor government stealing one and a half billion dollars a year through the generators. All of this destroys jobs, destroys competitiveness. And then taxpayers pay, pay people, quite often foreigners, to come in and squat on the land just to get carbon dioxide credits. It's called carbon dioxide farming. But it takes good farmland and destroys it with noxious weeds and feral animals, pests. And then that has to be reclaimed at some later date, who knows when. Then we have Angus Taylor, the Minister for Energy, a farmer. He knows that the EPBCA Act is hurting him. And even though I've had conversations with him, he just smiles, rolls his eyes, and just puts up with it. He is a skeptic on climate change. He is a skeptic that we're affecting the climate. Yet he's being slammed, and he's now coming back into Parliament and driving up electricity prices. Matt Canavan, Barnaby Joyce, strong skeptics in their beliefs. Barnaby Joyce was the deputy prime minister. The Chinese know that. They watch him. They saw him come into cabinet, and they saw him go for election in, in New England when he moved out of the Senate into the lower house. And Malcolm Turnbull showered $400 million of taxpayer funds on unreliable wind power to get Mr Joyce elected. And then Matt Canavan and Barnaby Joyce were both in the cabinet, and they suddenly became alarmists, spouting the, the alarm due to our carbon dioxide. So I've asked Matt, Matt Canavan in the Senate one day, where's his evidence? And he just slid away from me. And now that he's out of cabinet and, Barnab and, Senate and Mr Joyce is out of cabinet, all of a sudden they're becoming a little bit skeptical again in their, their actions, in, in their words. But the Chinese Communist Party sees this, and that tells them a lot about the lack of leadership in this country. The Paris Agreement, the Chinese have their agreement with the Paris Agreement. It says we will continue doing whatever we want, continue growing our economy, continue constructing our, 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 gov our country and developing our country and putting in place the infrastructure. And then in 2030, we may consider something. Meanwhile, this parliament, this building has legislated to destroy our economy to comply with Kyoto. That's not an agreement. That is stupidity and economic suicide. And then the Chinese watch us, the Chinese Communist Party watches us pay academics to tell lies about climate and to misrepresent the climate science. We even put some of them in charge in senior places in the CSIRO and pay them $800,000 a year to destroy our country. Dr Andrew Johnson went from head of the Climate Research Agency uh, Department in the CSIRO to become head of Bureau of Meteorology. And, un and under him and his predecessors, the Bureau of Meteorology has been shown to be concocting the data, misrepresenting uh, the temperatures. We pay people like Ove Goldberg, Ian Chubb, past chief scientists. We pay them to destroy the science, misrepresent the science. Then we sign agreements in 1975 by Whitlam that says we'll, we'll comply with the Lima Declaration to shut down our manufacturing and export it. 
And then the following year, the Liberal Prime Minister Fraser ratified the deal. Then in 1992, Paul Keating's Labor government signed the Rio Declaration, which is about 21st century global governance. Then we had the Kyoto Protocol, destroying our country, stealing our farmers' property rights, and now the Paris Agreement, exporting jobs, shutting manufacturing. And then the current Prime Minister has the temerity to say, we will fiddle with the industrial relations system to bring back manufacturing. How the hell can you bring back manufacturing with the highest electricity costs in the world and manufacturing, big component of manufacturing now, the largest component usually is electricity? How the hell can you do it with a tax system that favours multinational companies and lets them off scot-free? How the hell can you do it with over-regulation? How the hell can you do it with a lack of water? How the hell can you do it with a lack of infrastructure? The Chinese are watching this. And they're helping us destroy our electricity sector and export even more jobs. Because our prices for electricity are going up, businesses are shutting, and the jobs start up in, in China. We are now reversing the last 170 years of human progress. Reversing it. Because the key to human progress is decreasing prices of energy, which raises productivity, raises wealth, raises the standard of living. Ended in this country 20 years ago. 24 years ago. We have ceded governance to the UN, Lima, Kyoto, Rio, Paris and many other agreements. How does this comply with Aussie values? How does it comply with being fair dinkum? And then worse, the granddaddy who concocted this climate change rubbish is Morris Strong, or was Morris Strong. He concocted it when he took over, when he created and then took over as head of the United Nations Environmental Program. He pushed that starting in the 1970s. And in the 1980s, ramped it up. In, in 1988, formed the United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a fraudulent organisation. And Liberal, Labor, Nationals and the Greens have fallen for it all. Maurice Strong was a crook. He was wanted by the police in America and died in exile in China. And who's the beneficiary of all this destruction of Western civilization? The Chinese government. That's what the people in this chamber, the people in the chamber across the hall there, that's what they've done to this country by blindly following the UN dictates. How does that comply with our values? It doesn't. It breaks our values. What about water ownership? Destroyed. Separated water ownership from, from property ownership. What about the Murray-Darling Basin and the corruption that is rife? What about the, the farms, family farms shutting down? What about water projects? What water projects? That's it. There aren't any. And yet look at what amazing water projects the Chinese Communist Party has put together to develop its country. What about infrastructure? Hardly anything built. No plan. The North is exposed. The Bradfield scheme, we see floods destroying Townsville destruction and waste of water flowing out to sea. We see the state governments joining in, Labor Party in Queensland, reef regulations, shutting down agriculture, vegetation protection legislation, destroying agriculture, fire breaks not being allowed, destroying it when farms, farms are, are under fire. We put animals and fungus ahead of humans. Then the Queensland Labor government puts the, communist China, the Chinese uh, company in charge of the electoral role. Then we've got the Queensland Local Council corruption linked to the Labor state government. It extends well beyond Ipswich and Paul Pasali. It is systemic. It is widespread. We've got foreign banks that were deregulated under John Howard, and we saw, we saw the result of that through the Hain Royal Commission. We see Adani frustrated by both the Liberal national government and the Labor government in Queensland and the federal government that was weak, and one man from India, a booming economy, a growing economy wanted to spend $17 billion in our country, and he was thwarted for eight years. That's a blight on us that not even the Chinese can miss, that no one in the world can miss. We go on and on and on. And Senator Rex Patrick, I give him credit for, push, for moving a motion to get an inquiry into the relationship between China and Australia. Five times, sorry, six times. And I support him every time. And both the Labor Party and the Liberal Nationals squashed it. This is what the Chinese are seeing. And yet Australians are wanting far more. Australians 
are wanting leadership. Australians are wanting security, reassurance, confidence, leadership, trust, pride and a freedom. A restoration so we can be number one in the world again. And what does it need? It needs principled leadership based on values. It needs disciplined leadership based on data and facts instead of ideology, paying off donors. It needs honest leadership and needs strength of character. The simple ability to say, I'm wrong, I'm sorry, can you help me, please explain. We need visionary policies and that is what will take us back to being number one. Thank Senator you. Brockman. Thank you, Mr. Acting Deputy Chair. I, uh, I, I rise to speak uh, to this debate, but I do note the time, so I'll keep my contribution very short to give others, albeit a very short opportunity. Now, I think it perhaps would be the understatement uh, of the year, and, and this is a year we've had many serious issues to consider, but it would be the understatement of the year to say that we are seeing a much more assertive uh, and aggressively assertive China in the way it is dealing with the rest of the world. But I think it is very important to make this point that Australia, Australia's position, Australia's uh, standing up for its own position in the world, its own sovereignty, uh, making Australia's decisions based on our national interest has not changed. We are a trading nation. We are a nation that supports the free flow of trades and goods according to international rules and norms, and uh, that is something that we expect to benefit all nations, and we, we certainly hope that all nations commit to as well, including China. Uh, it is for China to explain itself and its actions. We have always welcomed China's economic growth, and trade has lifted many people out of poverty right across the world, right across the region. We need to make sure that all nations in this world engage with each other in a way that is respectable to each country's sovereignty. We support the peaceful development and prosperity of our region. Now, clearly Australia is facing a number of trade issues uh, in our relationship with China, some of them very recent, some of them dating back a number of years. Clearly, the rhetoric has escalated in the last few weeks and months. Now, the cumulative impact of these issues means that the perception is growing, uh, particularly following Ambassador Chung's remarks in April that there are other factors driving China's trade actions against Australia. But Australia has not descended into a tit-for-tat. We have been calm. The Morrison government has been calm. We have been consistent and we have been measured. It is a matter for the Chinese authorities to explain plainly and clearly what is driving these concerning actions which are disrupting our bilateral trade. Now, as I said, this is a very important matter. We are, uh, the clock is ticking down. I'm sure we'll have many more opportunities over the, uh, the week ahead and certainly into next year to discuss these matters further, but I will leave my contribution there for now. Senator Ayres. Thanks, um, thanks, Mr Acting Deputy President. I appreciate being given a few minutes at this juncture just to make some comments on uh, behalf of the Labor Party. And um, uh, I'll try to, to finish in time to give uh, Senator Patrick a few, a few minutes. On the face of it, Senator Roberts' uh, notice of motion is pretty anodyne, really, and Labor will be supporting uh, the proposition. I did have some misgivings, though, that it would be the vehicle for the kind of um, bellicose language that, uh, that Senator Roberts is prone to giving, and, um, and uh, those misgivings proved to be well-founded. He did cite an article um, by Mr Gottliebson yesterday that talked about uh, people regarding uh, Australia as foolish, and while I don't accept that characterisation, uh, Senator Roberts has made no small contribution himself uh, to um, the view that many countries across the region have about some of the darker recesses of Australian thinking uh, in relation to the region. Uh, and while he's free to speak his mind, uh, words have consequences. Uh, and it didn't take too long there to move from uh, views about uh, the government of China to uh, an alleged one world government and uh, across to the Bradfield scheme and the usual sort of rhetorical flourishes that. Um, that uh, Senator Roberts uh, has about things that uh, move from the real to the world of conspiracy theories very, very quickly. 
This is, um, as the resolution says, uh, a more deep-seated problem than a trade spat. The language trade spat, I think, does uh, an effort to diminish the seriousness of the uh, economic issues and trade issues that confront the country. Uh, Peabody Coal just announced today that uh, it would be standing workers down at its, at its Helensborough mine for eight weeks. Uh, very high quality uh, metallurgical coal exported around the world. Uh, that is a very serious issue in the Hunter Valley, coal and wine. Uh, the resolution touches on timber, wine and coal, Thank you, Mr. but lobsters, sugar, copper, beef, wheat and barley, uh, all of these important regional industries and important regional uh, employers. Uh, many, many tens of thousands of jobs uh, rest upon uh, those industries. And what I want to see is a more thorough, thoughtful, careful, strategic debate within this parliament over the course of 2021. And I want to see a more thoughtful, strategic approach and a plan, indeed, from the Morrison government uh, about how we're going to deal with not just the trade questions, but about Australia's relationships across the region, uh, including uh, our relationship uh, with China. The problem is that the Morrison government has failed to prepare Australia for the new realities in the region. Mr Morrison has no plan to diversify Australia's export markets and no plan to deepen our relationships with the other countries in the region. Just today, the Morrison government has put a bill through the Senate that confirms it's solely responsible for foreign relations. That means Mr Morrison and the minister need to show leadership and actually take responsibility instead of just using foreign policy as another vehicle for slogans and splashy headlines. As a result, uh, Mr Morrison has made a bad situation worse. Uh, their foreign policy and strategy is not just about events. When significant events have occurred, the Labor Party, our leader, Mr Albanese, the leader here, Senator Wong, and our spokesperson on foreign policy have supported the government in a bipartisan way. Whether it's events like the disgraceful tweet from earlier this week, the Labor Party has provided bipartisan support. But of course, strategy isn't about events. Strategy is about having a clear view of what the national interest is, a clear construction of what is in the interests of Australia and Australians, and then prosecuting a strategy that delivers a good outcome for the country in terms of our economy, in terms of regional peace, stability and economic growth across the region, and of course a strategy that's consistent with Australia's values. And the problem is that there has been a clear articulation of those positions across previous governments, but there has been a sense of strategic drift and a lack of a policy approach from this government over the course of the last seven years. I'll leave my remarks there, Mr President. Senator, well, it is 5.30, so I propose the Senate now adjourn. Sorry? Do we need to put this motion? I'll call the, look, look at the clerk. Um, it being 5.30, we will move on, but beforehand I'll put the motion because the debate has concluded. So those in support of the motion say aye. aye. The contrary, no. Aye. The ayes have it. No, no. All right. Division will be deferred until Monday when the Senate next sits. Now, before the Senate it moves to adjournment, I understand that Senator McMahon was going to seek leave to make a short statement. Senator McMahon. Yeah, thank you, um, Mr President. I seek leave to withdraw a question I asked um, during cross-chamber cross banter. Um, interjections are always disorderly, so I would like to seek leave to withdraw that. You don't need to seek leave. We'll take oh. the comment as having been withdrawn, not being here at the time. Um, I will now propose that the Senate do now adjourn. Senator Scar.
Mr. President, I uh, rise in this adjournment speech to make uh, a few short remarks in relation to a delightful event I attended on 26 November 2020, which was the opening of the Bertram Shawcross Bridge uh, at, uh, within uh, the jurisdiction of Somerset Regional Council. The Australian government had com contributed over $600,000 to the uh, rebuilding of this bridge, the demolition of the existing bridge, construction of a new two-lane bridge and minor changes to road alignment. And that funding of $606,574 under round three of the bridge's renewal program was matched by the Somerset Regional Council, who contributed the sum of $618,469. Now, the major benefit of the uh, renewal, the rebuilding, replacement of this bridge was that it will reduce trips by 6.5 kilometres uh, compared to the state highway in the local area, improving safety and increasing flood immunity. And vehicle traffic has been increasing on the route since the bridge was completed. And in fact, during the opening process, uh, my speech, my opening, my speech uh, contributed to the event to open the bridge was drowned out, drowned out, Mr. President. Uh, from time to time by the great uh, uh, traffic that was uh, going across the bridge, the newly constructed bridge. So I'd like to convey the remarks or the substance of the remarks I made at the bridge opening, and that included uh, my congratulations to the Somerset Regional Council, led by the indefatigable mayor, Councillor Graham Lehman, who's one of the longest serving, he might in fact be the longest serving mayor, uh, current mayor in Queensland, or at least he's one of them. And he's provided outstanding, outstanding representation to the Somerset region in conjunction with all of the councillors. And what I said on the day, uh, when I wasn't being drowned out by the increased traffic uh, arising from the construction of this great bridge, was that the federal government knows, the federal government knows that any infrastructure which is uh, which it contributes to the cost of, which is undertaken and executed by Somerset Regional Council. The federal government knows that the Somerset Regional Council will make sure it's well costed, well costed, well planned and well executed. And that was certainly the case with respect to this bridge. And I'd like to pay tribute to all those Somerset Regional Council workers who worked on the bridge, also to the SES volunteers from the local area who assisted with the opening ceremony. Now, I should say I did not open the bridge. I was delighted to witness the opening of the bridge by Mrs Carmel Shawcross, who was, is the widow of Mr Bertram Shawcross. And I must say that uh, she did a wonderful job in terms of opening the bridge, and uh, I, uh, it was a great honour to be in her presence and also in the presence of some of her family members. And I'd like to quote to you from an email I received from Jeff Shawcross, the son of Carmel, who gave, some, uh, gave an overview with respect to the contribution made by the Shawcross family in that region. And I quote, the Shawcross family has been within the district for a very long time. We moved from the Mount Mee area in the 1890s to Highwood Lane, Kilcoy, then selected the property Deerhurst on New Country Creek in 1916. As part of the selection, scrub had to be cleared and farming started. The family of Bertram's, Bertram Shawcross's Cross, wife, Carmel, who opened the bridge, the Ruckers, owned Wattle Glen next door, and this property was bought by Bert before they were married. They then together bought further properties in this area, including Windy Valley. So the family has long been associated with this area and this bridge. And Jeff Shawcross described it as, I'm sure even the Roman road builders would be proud of this one, end quote, and I absolutely agree. And he, he told me a great anecdote about what happened before this two-lane bridge was constructed. When it was a one-lane bridge, the protocol was if you were coming from the town, you were given right away because it was a big deal to go to the town. So if you're coming from the town when it was a one-way bridge, you were given right of way. That was the protocol. But Jeff did tell me, did tell me that perhaps the real reason was if you're coming from town, maybe you'd gone to the local pub. And, uh, and maybe it was the wise thing to be given way to. Just one of the many greatest stories of Australia which makes this country so great. Senator Seward. Mr President, 
In the wake of the year marked by bushfires and coronavirus, the impact of the climate emergency on our health has never been more critical or in our face. The World Health Organisation has declared that climate change is the greatest threat to human health this century. The Bureau of Meteorology has confirmed that under current global pledges, Australia will experience warming effects of 3.4 to 4.4 degrees of warming by the turn of the century. This would fundamentally alter our very way of life. The risks that climate change poses to our health are getting worse every year as global temperatures rise, extreme weather events like bushfires, droughts, cyclones and floods are becoming more frequent and severe. This is putting lives, health and the well-being of the entire world population at risk. We are already seeing the increasing effects of air pollution and the threats to food and water supply and security. Climate change is contributing to, contribute to, sorry, contributing to an increased risk of infectious diseases, uh, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, asthma, allergies, mental ill health, psycho, uh, psychosocial impacts, violence, poor nutrition, injury, poisoning and mortality. Climate change is also worsening the conditions that led to the COVID-19 pandemic, with environmental degradation and habitat loss responsible for the increased risks of uh, zoonotic diseases like coronavirus. In the absence of action, climate change is predicted to lead to 85 deaths per 100,000 people globally per year by the end of the century, more than are, are currently killed by all infectious diseases across the globe. The MJA Lancet Countdown report released today highlighted that the 2019-20 bushfires resulted in, a, in about 450 deaths due to direct injury and air pollution exposure. The air pollution was so severe that it made the New South Wales annual average PM 2.5 concentration by high the far highest in the past 20 years. Climate change also poses serious risks to disruption of our healthcare supply chain, damage to our health infrastructure and threats to the safety and quality of healthcare provided. In our current trajectory, um, if it continues unchecked, we face ex existent, exist, exist, we, we face threats to humanity. Sorry, I'll abandon the attempt. Basically, it's just threats to humanity. While we have devoted much of 2020 to solving the COVID-19 pandemic, climate change continues. We need to apply the same level of focus and intervention and concentration on climate change as we have rightly on the coronavirus. Australia's peak body of climate and health, the Climate and Health Alliance, recently released a policy roadmap for a healthy, regenerative and just future. This roadmap has been endorsed by 29 leading health groups so far, including the Public Health Association of Australia, Consumers Health Forum of Australia and the Australian College of Nursing. Health organisations are recognising this climate emergency. They are doing the work and, quite frankly, the government should be doing much more in this space. We need a comprehensive, nationally coordinated response to climate change that also includes health and, in fact, puts it at its core. Right now, we have the opportunity to protect our health from the devastating impacts of climate change. But we don't have any time to waste. We need to adjust our climate targets to net zero emissions by 2035 at the very latest. Otherwise, it is going to be too late and we are going to suffer these consequences. We need to end fossil fuel use for good. This includes no new coal or oil or gas. We need massive investment in renewables in this country so that we can run on 100 per cent renewable energy. It's time to apply the same level of urgency to tackling this crisis as we have done to the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to make sure that we are integrating climate in across, our, across portfolio areas. We need to make sure that we are addressing climate change fr from a health lens Order. as well. Senator Molan. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, as we all know, and as a number of speakers have spoken about uh, this evening, 2020 has been an incredibly difficult and trying year for we Australians. Uh, we've contended with drought, fires, floods, and now COVID-19. It's been the year of the Aussie battler, without doubt, where our strong values of hard work, perseverance and steadfastness in the face of adversity have certainly been put to the test. It's also been a year in which Australians have stepped up to the plate and given generously with their time, their money and volunteer hours to help out others in their community. A year in which charitable organisations have been working tirelessly to support those in need. So today, I rise, Mr President, to speak about the Australian Red Cross, an organisation whose work at times goes largely underreported but which has a profound impact on the lives of many Australians. Not since World War II has there been so much demand for Red Cross services. Staff and volunteers have been involved in three significant back-to-back long-term emergencies, drought, bushfires and now COVID-19. From the 1st of July 2019 to the 30th of June this year, the Australian Red Cross Emergency Services activated 4,789 volunteers and staff. They helped 83,715 people across 63 events, including the summer bushfires, drought and COVID-19, in one single year. The drought that has afflicted many areas around Australia has seen our farmers and regional communities face incredible adversity. But they've not faced it alone. The Red Cross and other charitable organisations have stepped up and helped out those in need. In 2018, uh, 2019, Red Cross launched an appeal for Aussie farmers who were battling severe drought, and Australians stepped up and donated $11.5 million, a total of 7,452 grants of up to $3,000 were distributed with the support of partners like the CWA and Rural Financial Councillors, and they've helped farmers and, and, and their families relieve financial stress caused by the drought. And then came the Black Summer bushfires, fires that were on a scale never seen before in Australia. Tens of millions of hectares burnt, 33 lives lost, 3,000 houses burnt down, and millions of animals killed or displaced. The Red Cross and other charities faced public pressure on several fronts, public demands to get money to people quickly and claims that they were holding on to money. A key part of disaster support and recovery is getting funds to those affected as quickly as possible, but that comes with the responsibility of ensuring the funds are managed properly and the money goes where it is supposed to go. Another key aspect of disaster recovery is ensuring that there are funds remaining to support people weeks and months after the disaster. In the case of the Black Summer bushfires since June, the Red Cross has had more than 1,739 people come forward seeking financial assistance for the first time months after the last fires were extinguished. When it comes to providing grants in a disaster, there are several phases immediate emergency grants, rebuilding and long-term recovery. The Red Cross is one of the few emergency management organisations that operates in all three stages, in preparedness, in response and in recovery. This is why funds should not be spent all at once during an emergency, and this is why the Red Cross is still able to be out there helping people in the community now. However, just as many communities were starting to recover, along came COVID-19, and many Australians were plunged into economic hardship. Once again, organisations like the Red Cross came to the fore. Since April this year, federal government funding of $13 million has been provided to Red Cross under the government's $200 million community support package. So today, I would like to thank the Australian Red Cross for everything they've done this year supporting those in need. There are thousands of Australians, Mr President, around our great country who have a roof over their head and food on the table thanks to the work of the Red Cross. So I would ask all Australians during Christmas, during this time of giving, to remember the Red Cross, to be generous and to make a donation. Senator Thank you. Green.
Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, as the Morrison government continues to congratulate itself on a job well done and use slogans and advertising to try to convince Australians that they are on top of our economic recovery. The truth about our economy right now is that people are hurting and they are worried about the future. The latest wage data shows that wages grew slower in the past 12 months than ever before. Now, it has been a tough year, but this data is off the back of years and years of stagnant wage growth under this government before the pandemic even hit. On top of low wage growth, we know that we have an insecure work crisis in this country. This pandemic highlighted this crisis and it has made it worse. We've got used to insecure work. We've almost come to accept it. And the workers that we needed to get us through the pandemic were some of the worst insecure work examples that we have seen. And that has impacted our health response. We've heard on many occasions of aged care workers and security guards who had to have a second job because their first job was too insecure and didn't provide the security that they needed of a full-time job. It's also impacted our economic response because it will take longer for our economy to recover if more jobs are insecure. The government chose to exclude casual workers from JobKeeper, and yet so many of the workers that were directly impacted by the shutdowns needed to get us through uh, this pandemic were in highly casualised workforces. People in the arts and entertainment sector, hospitality workers, retail workers, all of these workers were already in casual and insecure work, and yet the government chose to exclude casual workers from the JobKeeper scheme. Our economy cannot recover if Australians don't have good, secure jobs. And maybe some of those opposite don't understand what it's like to have a casual, insecure job. But can I tell you, not knowing when your next shift is going to be impacts your entire life. And inversely, we know that a good, secure job gives you the confidence to spend money in your local uh, businesses, in local shops, in your community. It gives you the confidence to pay for extra health appointments, to get checkups that you might need, to plan for the future, to save for a house, to make sure that you've got a good, dignified retirement. You can't do those things if you don't know when your next shift is coming. Workers around the country this Christmas won't be having a very good Christmas. They are not out there high-fiving about this government's so-called comeback. It won't be a great Christmas this year for workers in the mining industry who are facing the prospect of becoming permanent casuals. We know that casualisation has been rife in the mining industry for years, and this government has stood up and said they would do something about it. They don't say it here while they're standing in the chamber, but they say it when they're standing on the ground in central Queensland. The member for Dawson, Senator Canavan, often tells people from the mining industry that they will do something to fix casualisation. But when given the chance to do something about this, the government is actually intervening in a High Court case that would overturn a decision that stops mining companies from making workers permanent casuals. That is what the government is doing, and we need to judge the government on its actions, not what it says when it's standing in central Queensland. It won't be a great Christmas for workers who work for BHB under their OS Services Enterprise Agreement. They have had a win. They had the EBA overturned, and thank goodness, because this was a shoddy agreement to start with. It was agreed with a couple of people in Western Australia, nine people, decided what sort of EBA would apply to thousands of workers in central Queensland. But this government has done nothing, nothing to step in 
and stop that sort of thing from happening, to stop casualisation in the industry or to make sure that people have more secure work in these uh, industries. It won't be a very good Christmas this year for workers in the meat and food processing industry. They have been incredibly hard hit by this pandemic. I had the chance to meet many of them in Brisbane last week, and I thank the AMIEU for, for giving me the opportunity to listen directly to those workers and to understand what they're going through in their workplaces. Most recently, at JBS Dinmore, they announced that 600, 600 Australian workers have lost their jobs. 600 workers who won't have a job this Christmas. And when the government had the chance to extend JobKeeper to industries like the meat workers industry, to businesses like JBS, they didn't take that chance. Josh Frydenberg refused to sign. Those jobs could have been saved if this government had stepped in. And we know that Qantas workers will not be having a very good Christmas this year because this week we found out that 2,000 ground crew jobs will be outsourced, and that includes 50 jobs in Cairns in regional Queensland, where I live. That doesn't mean outsourcing doesn't mean that the work doesn't need to be done. I mean, we've, we know that now. It doesn't mean that the, the job doesn't need to be done. It just means that Qantas is saying that we would prefer for that job to be done by someone who has a less secure job a less secure job. And this government has turned its back on aviation workers. They've had plenty of subsidies and grants and even JobKeeper paid to Qantas. The business itself has said that it will be back in the black next year. But these workers won't have a job. They're having to bid for their jobs and they're having to compete for jobs with people on labour hire contracts, casual employment, insecure work. That this is, from the pandemic, we need to learn the lessons that this pandemic has taught us. And one of the things that the pandemic has shown us is that insecure work is damaging to the economy, it's da damaging to the community, and we need to make sure people have secure jobs because it's good for our economy. All we have got from this government, from its leadership, right down to its backbench, is more attacks on working people and more pushes to make sure that people have less secure work. Next week, they'll be bringing IR legislation out publicly for the first time. And we hear a lot from this government about everyone playing their part in this so-called Team Australia recovery. And they'll probably say things along the lines of, you know, what our economy and labour market needs is more flexibility. But can I tell you that flexibility is often a vehicle for increasing insecurity? It is the word that is used instead of insecurity. But when the government says flexibility, what they mean is insecurity. I was shocked today, shocked, to hear Senator Stoker, a Queenslander, actually blame Qantas workers for not accepting more flexible working conditions leading to their own redundancies. She blamed them for their own redundancies because they hadn't accepted more flexible working conditions. Every time the government says flexible, what they mean is insecure. And insecure work is bad for workers, it is bad for families, but it is also bad for our economy. We have an opportunity at the end of this pandemic to make sure that more people are in secure jobs. But this government has shown through this pandemic that they are not willing to stand up for workers. They are not willing to do the hard work to make sure that people have good working conditions and good secure jobs. And that is very concerning because what it means is that our, our economy and our recovery will take longer under this government and people will not have the jobs that they need this Christmas to feel secure, to take care of their families and to plan for the future. Thank you, Senator Green. The Senate stands adjourned and will meet at 10am.
on Monday the 7th of December. Home time.